Today I want to tell you about one of the most infamous works ever written about the historical pronunciation of languages. And that is The Error of Erasmus by Christos Karangounis. The author Karangounis seeks to convince the reader that the pronunciation of ancient Greek, certainly in the Koine period, but also Attic Greek, classical Attic Greek, is virtually identical to the pronunciation of modern Greek. Now, if you've watched all of the several videos I've made about this topic, where I've cited the just the incredible resources that are available to us, including grammarians in the past, but also, and even more importantly, the statistical evidence of the spelling errors, which are such a great guide. That's not the picture that is painted for us. And yet, Mr. Karangounis takes bits of the information that we've already seen in several videos I've done on this channel, of course, Polymathy Plus, as well as on the main channel, and twists them in a way that is really fascinating. I'm pretty sure Mr. Karangounis, as well as others who purport these ideas, really believe them, but you can only successfully believe in them with really significant gaps in knowledge. And we're going to talk about those today. The title of this video is actually borrowed from someone else, from Will Annis, who uh, at least used to run this wonderful website uh, called uh, Aoi Doi, The Singers. And Will Annis uh, wrote this article um, that he, many years ago back in uh, Await, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote the article, The Era of Karangounis. By the way, I want to say right away that it is absolutely fine to use the modern Greek pronunciation when learning ancient Greek, when teaching ancient Greek. That's a completely acceptable choice, and it's been a part of tradition, obviously, in the teaching of ancient Greek in Greece for a long time. There's nothing wrong with that. It is wrong to insist that the modern Greek pronunciation is identical or extremely similar to the ancient Greek pronunciation when we have all of these facts that tell us that idea is completely bogus. It's completely wrong. But it is absolutely okay to use all kinds of conventions for ancient languages. And in general, I embrace all of them as acceptable ways to, to teach and to work with the language. You know that I work with different kinds of pronunciation reconstructions that I've been developing and trying to suggest myself. And exactly which one is right or wrong isn't exactly clear. But they are all meant to be acceptable historical reconstructions. So what we're going to do is we are going in this video to look at this entire article, uh, The Era of Erasmus and the and Un-Greek Pronunciations of Greek. We're going to look at this uh, whole thing. Uh, and we're also going to look at Will Annis's article, which is an excellent uh, article uh, but brief. So what I'd like to do, articles like uh, this one, like uh, Karangounis's uh, original article wrote, uh, that he wrote in 1995, are so completely wrong as they don't really merit this kind of response. This is the equivalent of flat eartherism. Now, if you have any Greeks watching, uh, welcome. Glad to have uh, Greeks here. Now, I know so many Greeks who have studied this in detail. Probably the most famous of them is Ioannis Stratakis, whose wonderful Podium Arts channel uses the reconstructed pronunciation of classical Attic to do wonderful recordings in the ancient Greek language. And they're a, a wonderful model for a lot to learn from. And what's most significant is Stratakis, being a professional musician, has a great ear, so he's really, really good. He also happens, of course, to be Greek. Um, and that is to say, even though so many Greeks seem to want to believe that the pronunciation of their language has remained unchanged for thousands of years, in spite of the evidence, there are so many Greeks out there who have, just like anybody else who's learned ancient languages like Latin, ancient Greek, ancient Egyptian, ancient Hebrew, you know, we, we study these things, and we want to know how they were pronounced. Stratakis is this great example of someone who isn't caught up in the dogma that Garangunis, for example, has related here. Here, of course, is the Podium Arts channel, and he has 73 beautiful videos. And in some of his earlier ones, he actually explains in Greek, speaking modern Greek, uh, to a Greek audience with English subtitles, how all this stuff works. And it's great, because it's wonderful to have someone of this distinction, and with such an excellent capacity to do this, to explain this to Greeks. Uh, which is great. Unfortunately, there are other Greeks, like Karangounis, who have successfully, I think, for a long time, convinced the majority of Greeks who have any interest in this subject, uh, which obviously isn't all of them. You know, not everybody, the English speakers, an interest in Old English. There's no reason for them to have to uh, be so, uh, so curious about this or even to have an opinion. But there are many Greek teachers in some kind of professional capacity who continue to insist that a document like this is giving us 
an actual picture of the ancient language. When it's not, when it's, I don't know, it's not mendacious because I don't believe this person is actually lying. In fact, what I want to do now, above all, is to mention that Christos Karangunis, he's a professor emeritus, as far as I know, he's still living in Sweden, where I used to teach at university, uh, 83 years young, and I only saw a brief clip of him speaking in, in Swedish and YouTube. That was all I was able to find. Seems like a really nice guy. I'm sure that Professor Karangunis has inspired generations of people to love the ancient Greek language, the, uh, the literature, and to be really fascinated by it, such as I am, such as you may be. And that's a wonderful thing. So this is not an on, ad hominem attack on Karangunis himself, but this will be a very harsh critique of this essay in particular, and these deeply mistaken ideas which Professor Karangunis, among others, have brought well, to the English-speaking world. And a lot of people have started to believe them. In fact, like this video is another step in something that I'm leading up to. And let me just make the view larger here a second. Um, in the future, I'm going to talk about this. I want to talk about this book by uh, Philemon Zachariou. And it's, uh, it's, I think this is interesting because uh, it's comparable to... Uh, the work done by Karangunis, but it's written by someone who understands linguistic terms better. However, which is very interesting, it makes him in some ways more convincing, but also he repeats a lot of the incredibly wrong ideas about the uh, pronunciation of ancient Greek as Karangunis. In fact, he references Karangunis so much that I thought, well, I, I want to talk about this, but we have to talk about the infamous Karangunis article first before we get into Zachariou's book here. Again, he's, he it's interesting, doesn't, you know, the historical pronunciation versus Erasmian. I thought someone recommended this to me. I thought, oh, this is going to be about uh, uh, maybe the Boothian pronunciation, something like that. So I want to get to this and to really dissect it. It's going to be a long video. But before that, I wanted to also address, as I have done now a couple of times, the pronunciation of classical Attic in its reality and totality. Now, I did this recently in this, the real pronunciation of classical Attic Greek. The, you know, the vul or the vulgar Attic pronunciation. And this is essentially just a 12-minute version in Latin, which I had a little bit of fun doing, of what I already talked about on this channel, which is the vulgar Attic pronunciation. It's talking about Teodorson's works from the 1970s, which demonstrate that there instead was, of course, the classical reconstructed pronunciation of Attic, but there was a whole other subsystem of pronunciation that we might call vulgar Attic, for example, that was radically different. And that subsystem is responsible for a lot of the things that people like Karagunis are using to try to insist that the pronunciation of ancient Greek was indeed that of modern Greek, because there are some things that happen, some kinds of ioticism, but also some things that we can see happened in the sub-dialect that never happened in modern Greek. For example, that epsilon is pronounced as e. Crazy stuff is going on in that. In some ways, it's similar to the modern Greek pronunciation but actually in most ways not. Neither. Neither the restored classical pronunciation nor this vulgar Attic pronunciation. Here is a brief summary of Theodorson. So Theodorson, who wrote his books in 1974 and 1978, came to the conclusion that there are indeed two systems, or rather subsystems, of phonology in classical Attic. This is the text that I used in that Scorpio Martianus video, if you haven't already seen or heard it, but I do recommend seeing it, because it'll give you a good idea of what these sound like. The incredible find of Theodorson is that in the innovative subsystem, there are some incredible changes in pronunciation, and he has determined this from the statistical analysis of spelling errors, specifically the letters of epsilon in conservative pronunciation e, had become e. That's the weirdest one. And also y had become e, and even eta had become e. And this creates spelling errors that could be construed as being similar to the modern Greek pronunciation, leading people like Karagounis to incorrectly assume that the modern Greek pronunciation was already in effect in the 5th century BC. According to Theodorson, that point of view is completely wrong. So I had to do that first just to demonstrate, hey, look, yeah, the classical Attic reconstructed pronunciation is not an explanation of everyone was speaking in Attica. Today, we're going to talk about Kanagunis, and then in the future, we're going to talk about Zachariou's book and dissect them in great detail. So the era of Erasmus and un-Greek pronunciations of Greek. Now, this is very interesting. Un-Greek? What would that mean? Well, most of us outside of Greece understand implicitly that ancient Greek civilization and language are pretty separate from the modern one, just as one can go to Rome, one can understand that, oh yeah, this is where Roman civilization came from, but 
this is also modern Italy. It's not the same thing. One of the problems, of course, is that Italian is not called Latin. It's called Italian. It has a different name. It's like saying un-Italian pronunciations of Latin. It's like, oh, well, Italian doesn't have to be the same thing. Unfortunately, ancient Greek and modern Greek share the same name, thus making this kind of logical error of saying that on modern Greek pronunciations of ancient Greek, that's what he really means, but because they have the same name, it allows one to come to these inevitable wrong conclusions. It does not appear to be generally known what factors and circumstances led to the so-called scientific pronunciation of Greek, all started with a practical joke played on Erasmus by the Swiss scholar Loritus of Glarus. Later, however, Erasmus found out the trick played on him, so he desisted from using the pronunciation he proposed, but his error finally succeeded in ousting the Greek pronunciation of Greek. The article exposes thoroughly the evolution of the pronunciation of Greek since the origins of the language. Um, it's just so comical. Uh, it's just like, so you have ungreek pronunciation of Greek. It's already just, it's like saying un-English pronunciations of Old English, or un-Anglo-Saxon pronunciations of Anglo-Saxon. The first Anglo-Saxon, a phrase like that, means modern English, and the second Anglo-Saxon means that of of Old English. They're different languages. They have completely different phonologies. One grew out of the other, but insisting that one has to sound like the other, just because they have the same name, because they existed in the same territory, it's it's bonkers. So already this is coming off, not like a scientific paper, but like, I don't know, a comment on an internet forum that's long and has lots of examples, but isn't actually scientific. And we'll talk about that. In fact, to summarize that, someone who talks about this extremely well is Will Annis and his uh, article here about the era of Karaguni. So, of course, as I said, gave the name to this video. In the text kit days, we actually had a couple of uh, exchanges that were incredibly useful to me. So, should he ever see this, I extend to him my warmest thanks, especially for all the great materials he has on his website. So, since Will Anna summarizes this so well, first we're going to look at Will Annis's brief response article. It's not very long uh, to the error of Erasmus. And then we'll go through every bit of the error of Erasmus. The problem, writes Will Annis. From time to time, the paper The Era of Erasmus and Un-Greek Pronunciations of Greek by Chris Karangunis is cited to argue for the remarkable notion that ancient and modern Greek are pronounced essentially the same. The article is flawed in many ways, but keeps popping up. It does still today in 2023, many years after Will wrote this. It is not my goal to explain the Erasmian or reconstructed pronunciations here. For that, you should read Alan. And oh, wait, that's Wokes Latina. There you go. Wokes Graika. By the way, you kind of need to read both of these, and on Karagunis didn't do that, clearly. You got this one, Wokes Graika, and then he also mentions Horex. Here it is. Here's the Horex book. Wonderful stuff. And I might also recommend Sturdivant, who goes into even more detail than Alan in some areas. It's, it's really good. Alan or Horex. Nor am I claiming that it's illegitimate to pronounce ancient Greek in the modern Greek way. I don't worry myself about how others pr pronounce their Homer or Plato. I do, however, get cranky when people assert that ancient and modern Greek are pronounced the same, and that I must pronounce the ibukus like gavafis. This is an ancient poet, and that's a, a modern one, modern Greek one. The notion is completely unsupportable, and that's true. That's sort of the part of this. Uh, this is the, the crankiness of having people that the author here, Will Annis, or in my case, uh, interact with. I interact, for example, internet comments on YouTube videos and so forth, where people try to put forth ideas like those of Karagounis, without realizing how completely bat insane they are. So this is to address that because it's a shame for modern Greeks who are actually passionate about this to have such a wrong idea about the pronunciation of the ancient language. There's a lot to be gained from understanding the ancient phonology when it comes to the morphology, the linguistics, and of course, the poetry. The poetry is incomprehensible without understanding the ancient phonology, which should be obvious, but... Uh, even Karangunis talks about that, which is, we'll get there. So I really hope, as we have been seeing, more speakers of modern Greek, more native Greeks, embracing the ancient pronunciation of the language and understanding how it works on a linguistic level, which authors like Karangunis, again, seems like a lovely guy, really doesn't. So, apodon proton, from the beginning. The fundamental error of Karangunis is his evident belief in the exceptionalism of the Greek language. It is, we are expected to believe, completely unlike any other language in human history known to us, and that it alone has been immune to sound change for nearly two and a half millennia. Why this should be so is never explained. He freely admits that the lexicon and grammar have changed over time, and further posits a great many sound changes in vowels between the 6th and the 3rd centuries BC. That's very interesting. And he shows some of them. We've talked about epsilon iota quite a bit. And here's something that Kanagunis insists on, which is incorrect, that that upsilon iota just merges with e. Um, that's 
except in the vulgar subdialect of Attic, no. And of course, interchanges with the Omicron, the Omicron Upsilon, and with Omega. So the, this is the quote from Karangunis. That continues Will Ennis. The mechanism by which a language that experienced a massive reconfiguration of its sound system in a brief 300-year span should suddenly seize up and remain essentially static needs to be explained. He is prepared to make impressionistic judgments in view of argumentation. The impossibility of pronouncing the diphthongs in diuresis, this is, um, this is Karagouni says quoting, that is, each vowel distinctly, becomes obvious also from a word such as eubaoyoi. Now, I, my friends, ofiroi. I just pronounce that in the way that most people reconstruct ancient Greek, uh, the way that most Aleutian pronunciation variants work, as well as classical Attic, eubaoyoi. But something like eubaoyoi, is an impossibility of the mind of Karangunis, because he writes, this word, which consists of seven vowels pronounced in the Erasmian way, would give the comical sound e as if it were an exercise in vowel mnemonics. What I'm trying to decide, and we're going to see this passage in the paper itself, I just, uh, like I said, I wanted to do this summary um, by Will Annis first. What this seems to demonstrate, I don't know if it's true ignorance willful ignorance if he really knows that he's being false in what he's presenting or not because it's so hard to me to believe the man who speaks more than one language he clearly um Karaguni says english he makes one grammatical error that i noticed in in this paper um he writes better in english than i probably that i probably can in most languages maybe i can do equally well in latin but you know <laughs> he's anyway he he has a command of more than one language. He understands certain concepts, and yet he doesn't understand that ewaoyoi is, of course, a fine way for a language to pronounce a word like that. That's all filled with vowels. Ganagunis, of course, insists that it must be pronounced evai, because evai is pronounceable and ewaoyoi is not. Or rather, this nonsense, ewaoyoi. Yeah, that's unpronounceable because you're just, you're not using any of the diphthongs. It has four syllables, eo, a, oi, oi, eo, a, oi, oi. So that's why I'm like wondering, is, can he, this uh, Christos really believe what he's saying? Because it's so ignorant of how so many languages work. So it's, it's, that's what's really baffling. What Karangunis, or anyone else for that matter, writes Annis, finds comical is quite irrelevant to the question, nor does it matter what he finds difficult to pronounce. And Kanagunis writes, Here one should bear in mind that Greek, basically a polysyllabic, vowel-loving language, avoids the concentration of unnecessary, difficult-to-pronounce consonants so characteristic of German. Confer, for example, Nietzsche, and other words with six or seven consecutive consonants. Why is this unpronounceable? This is ch, Nietzsche, and the consonants in front aren't rendered impronounceable. They're assimilated into the following consonants. It's just... Ch, Nietzsche. You don't, ha- you don't have to say Nietzsche. That's not how it's said in German, much less English or other languages. Uh, so what are you talking about? Greek pronunciation cannot be determined by what is possible or acceptable in other languages. And he says, we'll read it, because reading the original article is, is just fascinating, as psychologically, and I'm saying, wow, how could you possibly get into these ideas? And the idea is that, and he will say this, it's really amazing, and keep watching the video uh, to to see where we get to that part because it's so amazing to see him essentially say that the only people who can be an authority of the pronunciation of ancient Greek are modern Greeks. He says that almost explicitly. But this is what the idea is, that the pronunciation of Greek cannot be determined what is possible except in other languages. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> that's completely nonsense. In order to understand how any language can work, we have to understand how other languages work. If we were exclusively to use modern English as a way to understand old English, we would miss things like phonemic vowel length, among others. This is a nonsense idea. He doesn't support it with anything either. He's just, he says this as if it's obviously true, and it's not. Continues Annis. The entire science of linguistics rests on comparison between languages. There is simply no reason to exempt Greek. I will leave it to Germans to come on their unnecessary and difficult consonant clusters. German's great. Uh, I think the consonant clusters in uh, Slavic languages, like say Russian or Ukrainian, present more of a, a challenge than even the German. 
and th those are beautiful languages. There's so many amazing languages out there with all these cool consonant combinations, as well as vowel sequences. So there's no reason that a language can't have something you know, beyond what's possible. You know, it shows an incredible lack of depth in the subject area, Kiria Garaguni, <laughs> that you're actually writing about to address the man directly. But we'll address him indirectly. Again, he's a nice, seems like a nice old man, although I don't want to be um, too ad hominem to to him, but it just I'm more responding to his argument. Hope that comes through because, um, you know, he wrote this with love, as wrong as it is. Confusions. Kanagunis consistently conflates the Erasmian and reconstructed pronunciations. This is a big deal. So now uh, you should all know this uh, by now because I'm not particularly fond of Erasmian myself. And for the casual Greek that may have stumbled in, you may wonder, but aren't you, Luke Ranieri, constantly talking about constantly promoting Erasmian pronunciation? No. No, I've frequently railed against it in several uh, videos. But the reason why is a bit more subtle because what you think Erasmian is may not be what it actually is. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. This is quite misleading, continues Annis. The standard academic pronunciation in common use these days is called Erasmian, but isn't necessarily much like the proposals Erasmus published in De Recta Latini Graeci Que Sermonis Pronunciatione. Or if you want to use the ecclesiastical pronunciation, which is just fine, De Recta Latini Graeci Que Sermonis Pronunciatione. Actually, it should be Pronunciatione. It's a little typo, that's okay. Nor is it anything at all like the reconstructed pronunciation found in Allen's Vox Graeca? Here are some examples with the academic Erasmian pronunciation as practiced in the U.S., the reconstructed pronunciation and modern Greek pronunciation. It is somewhat confusing here that the international phonetic alphabet draws so much of its inventory from modern Greek. That's, that's fine. We just have to learn what the international phonetic symbols are and do. That's also a huge problem with Kanungunis. Never does he use the international phonetic alphabet. So you can only really understand what he intends if you know the modern Greek pronunciation, as I do, and you understand what he's trying to convey. Because otherwise, it's kind of nonsensical and it's super unclear. The International Phonetic Alphabet IPA, learn it. I have videos about it. Here they are. I think these two videos are a great way to get familiar with the International Phonetic Alphabet, or you can just go to Wikipedia and listen to the sounds there, which is actually what I tell you in the video. I tell you in, in these videos, Go listen to the sounds of Wikipedia. This is how it works. This is what these basic symbols mean. And from there, you can learn everything you need to know about all these languages. So why is Erasmian pronunciation different from the reconstructed pronunciation? So the idea that most Greeks have, from my understanding, is that Erasmian simply means not the modern Greek pronunciation of ancient Greek. Of course, this is irrespective of the fact that Erasmus also spoke about Latin pronunciation. And the restored classical pronunciation of Latin is directly derived from Erasmus's work, just as the reconstructed pronunciations of classical Greek are also derived from Erasmus's studies. So when modern Greeks think of any un-Greek, that is, not modern Greek pronunciations of ancient Greek, what they mean is the things that we call Erasmian, as well as any form of reconstruction. So even though Lucian pronunciation, which Raphael Torrijano and I developed together, is very much anti-Erasmian, and I'll explain that momentarily, it would be considered Erasmian, in fact, has been accused of that <laughs> by Greeks, um, be simply through just utter ignorance about what these things are and what they mean. So, Erasmus, in his wonderful Latin uh, dialogue, which is this about the correct pronunciation of Latin and Greek, meaning ancient Greek, of course, not modern Greek, has the two characters, the lion and the bear, and they end up talking about these things. Now, Erasmus, I wanted to look at this here, Erasmus was just following in the footsteps of some other scholars here that started in the late 15th century. What these scholars noticed as the study of ancient Greek became more popular in the Renaissance was that, hey, the descriptions handed down by the ancient grammarians, like the ancient Greeks themselves, described the pronunciation of the language differently than that of modern Greek. How can this be? What's going on? And so Erasmus ends up taking that information as well as all the other information we have based on spelling, based on transliterations in the Latin and so forth, all this great evidence and comes up with reconstructed pronunciations of, uh, of course, of ancient Greek as well as Latin. And they're very sensible. The only thing that's really off about Erasmus's reconstruction is the pronunciation of epsilon iota as ei. That is the thing that I, that is the thing that truly is Erasmian that Erasmus came up with and is also wrong. It's also one of the most common 
spelled things in the ancient Greek language, epsilon followed by iota. So the sound of a a a a a a a a all the time in an ancient Greek recitation really stands out, and it's incredibly wrong, as I've said in so many videos. So I'll let you find those. Um, so that's the only th that's the th that's the thing that is most defining as Erasmian. Everything else that's done technically an Erasmian is for the most part a reasonable reconstruction. Now he goes into this here. So bug uh, the instead of va ra va. So Erasmian and, and the indeed the reconstructed Attic pronunciation have that in common. Uh, pronunciation of zeta. Now in modern Greek it's za. It's retracted here. Uh, Will Annis may not even have thought about this. I didn't even know about this idea of retracted s, retracted z, until uh, Raphael Torrijano can be into it. So thanks, Raffi. Um, so z, it's, it's retracted in modern Greek. And Rasmian tends to do z. So what, where would you hear a Rasmian? Academic places often. So most universities, I'm especially acquainted with the sound of it as spoken by Italians. They speak when professors or students in university, for example, deal with ancient Greek, they'll pronounce, of course, the zeta as z. And there's a pretty good reason. In Italian, the letter z can have the two sounds, z, as in pizza, or it can have the sound of z, as in zona. It's going to be voice. In this case, uh, the reconstruction or the Erasmian version that Italians use, it's always z, which is also in theory true outside of Italy as well. So in, in Germany and uh, the US and England and France and so forth, this sounds z for zeta. And the Allen's reconstruction has z. And I've talked about zeta in a video. And what I found is that pretty much all three of these may actually be the pronunciation in the classical Attic period. This definitely has to be true, at least in some moments. There's a pretty strong evidence for it, but there's also evidence for z, and there's also evidence for this one, for all three. Um, and I think probably all three were occurring in Athens in the classical period, being the 5th and early 4th century BC. Um, uh, but this is the reconstruction that Alan gives, and it's supported well enough to say that's an absolutely acceptable pronunciation uh, for it. But this too, the z, I mean, we have so much evidence of z being used certainly in places outside of Attica, such that the pronunciation of the letter z in Italy, as well as other places, came to be an affricate z, or tsa, depending on the language, for this reason, because some Greeks in different dialects spoke many different you know, languages, different dialects of ancient Greek, right? Not There isn't just Attic and Koine, those are just two versions. So this... Um, so anyway, that's, that's a little bit on Zeta. But see my Zeta video. That's on the main Polymathy channel. So as for Theta, Phi, and Chi, of course, Tha, Fa, Cha in the modern pronunciation, but also in Erasmian, right? Well, the reconstructed pronunciation, well, this is actually what Erasmus seems to have proposed in his original dialogue, Tha, Pa, Cha, the aspirated letter. So in fact, the Erasmian reconstruction, the reconstruction that's associated with Erasmus, is actually not what he seems to have proposed. Hello, this is Future Luke, and I wanted to confirm this because I hadn't read the dialogue in a little while. And indeed, just searching for uh, Aspir, to get the Aspiratio name, Aspiratio, Erasmus clearly says that the Pataka pronunciations are the right ones for Phi, Theta, Chi, respectively, for ancient Greek. He makes that quite clear, and he uses all these examples, examples which we still use today, in fact. Um, and it's something that I really admired about this when I saw it just now, especially comparing it with the drivel that Karagunis expresses himself with, that is the non-linguistic terminology that he uses. But here's Erasmus in the 1500s, and he talks about, well, how, you know, how do we uh, pronounce this? Like, qua ratione possunt auribus discerni? How can, ask the line, the pair says, in p magis stringuntur labia. Uh, the lips are tightly pressed together. Priusquam erumpat spiritus, before the air gets blown out, right? So there's no teeth involved, it's just lips. Puh. He describes that with pretty good terminology. In F lanius tentibus paine, pene, coiuntibus et inferiore udictunst labrus superioribus tentibus affixo. So you put the lower lip against the upper teeth. The precision with which he describes the sound of a labiodental fricative. He explains it very well. And <laughs> what's shocking is how badly 
how embarrassingly badly Karigunis explains the same sound in his article, which we'll see later. It's like, look, this guy didn't have any modern linguistic terminology, but simply described things with enormous clarity. I just find the contrast very stark and fascinating. So uh, you'll, of course, notice more of that as we go through the entire article written by Christos Karagunis a bit later. The error of Erasmus, the only significant one he made was, of course, the A that I already talked about. The problem, of course, is that Erasmians say in Italy, well, they don't have th or ch in Italian, so they usually just do th and k. Very lazy. But also understandable. The problem is, is not that there are these divergences, per se. They're inevitable when these people don't learn enough about linguistics, that is, the professors who actually teach ancient Greek, which is pretty much all of them. Clearly, even Garagunis doesn't know very much about linguistics himself, uh, as we will see. The problem isn't that they're pronouncing it according to the limitations of the native language phonology, Italian. You know, Germans, for example, they can do fa and ha, but they can't do tha, so they'll use that as ta. So you have these weird mixes. And of course, English speakers, we can do tha and fa, but we can't do ha, so we use ka, or they will. English speakers will often do that. Whereas, of course, modern Greeks have no problem doing them because they're native sounds in the modern Greek language. So the problem isn't, well, it is a problem. Okay, so here's what Erasmian means. It's certainly what I mean by Erasmian. The modern academic conventions, outside of true attempts at reconstruction, that have been traditional for a few hundred years, that are, der again, derived from Erasmus's ideas, but have been lazily altered, <laughs> shall I say? And the pronunciation of these three letters, of the aspirates, pata ka, phi theta kai, are especially demonstrative of this. Those are extremely frequent and essential in the language, so pronouncing them differently causes a big effect, just like the ai nonsense that is indeed Erasmian is, of course, uh, awful and very noticeable. The reality is that the Erasmian pronunciations diverge dramatically, and the Wikipedia page on this shows you that, hey, look, these are pronounced in all kinds of different ways in Germany, in France, in Italy, you know, they do all these, in Spain, all these kinds of accommodations to the native languages. Now, that is probably inevitable to some extent, so I don't necessarily have a problem with that occurring. The problem that I have is that these instructors are simply ignorant, whether they're German or French or Italian or Spanish or English or American, etc., um, English speakers. They're completely ignorant of what they're doing wrong. And so they will tell you that eta is pronounced a, like um, in classical Attic, o pile, o uh, beloved or female friend, pile, and they'll say, they'll either say pilei, or they'll say filei or something. And, but it's letter eta. Eta is not a diphthong. They'll pronounce that as a too, because English doesn't have a long e sound, much less a long e sound. We don't have those in most uh, English language dialects. There are some, but say standard American or British English, we don't have that. We thus end up pronouncing that as a, o filei. O file. We can't can do O either. We have to do O. So these are the limitations of the language. That's just an example. So what I find especially irritating is that the people who use these, these academic pronunciations, which are derived from Erasmus but, are, but differ from it, they make all of these uh, not ridiculous mistakes. They're understandable from the point of view of their phonotactics, their linguistic limitations as native speakers of these languages without having actually done any linguistic training, it's that they say that their pronunciation, which is th wrong from the theory, is the pronunciation of ancient Greek. They make no comment on being wrong. Sometimes they do, but um, that's the part that I find irritating. That's why I rail against Erasmian. Okay, so if Erasmian really isn't the reconstruction of ancient Greek, it's just some traditional thing, well, that's nonsense. Let's use Sidney Allen's reconstruction or something else, you know, something that's actually faithful to the history of the language. Anyway, so this is something that actually Karen Gunis and I will have in common as we read his article. So the academic Erasmian, then, is a sort of hybrid of modern Greek and Latin. No one argues this is ac correct or accurate. Uh, the problem is, actually, there are Be people who don't know anything, which is most professors of the ancient Greek language in the countries we just mentioned, probably don't know that or aren't even aware because unless they've really learned another language to fluency 
really well, like without and with, you know, of course they can have some accent, but with, with um, some attempt to limit their own native accent, they won't understand. Um, so that, no one argues this is, a, yeah, no one argues this is correct or accurate. Yeah, few do. In a document from his website, Erasmian in a new garb, the chimera of the reconstructed pronunciation of Greek, he badly misrepresents the work that has gone into the reconstructed pronunciation. Here's this article. He just repeats most of the nonsense that he has in the main article. He badly misrepresents the work that has gone into the reconstructed pronunciation. Those who make the preposterous claim of being able to tell us exactly how Greek was pronounced at a particular place and at a particular time in the face of other lack of evidence for such reconstructions simply cannot be taken seriously. Their concoction is a chimera, it is self-illusion, and it leads to other and it leads others astray. Astray is what I think it means. Okay, I make a couple errors in your non-native language. He communicates reasonably well in English with very few errors, so I'm, I don't want to uh, pick on his, his English for sure. However, he's obviously super wrong about all of this. If anyone working on the reconstructed pronunciation actually claimed to know exactly how ancient Greek was pronounced, I would agree with Karangunis. But of course, no one makes such a claim. Yeah, I, and if anything, I'll... Um, uh, I have used the word exactly as a kind of emphatic thing because we know exactly in the sense, same sense that we know about Julius Caesar's life. We know about his deeds. We know those things as facts. There's no doubt that Caesar crossed the Rubicon and took Rome. You know, we know that. We don't know the exact number of troops to a man with whom he entered or what time exactly of day. They didn't even have precise clocks back then. So um, there's some things that remain slightly foggy. <laughs> but that's the comparison. So we know exactly about those events in history. Well, actually, there's the little things that we don't know. Of. We know enough about them to realize that Caesar really did do that. Even though we don't have every detail at hand, there's no reason to claim that history is somehow false. But no one makes such a claim. To say the Earth is flat is false. To say the Earth is a sphere is also false. It is slightly deformed by rotation. Nonetheless, it is a lot less false to say the Earth is a sphere than it is to say it is flat. In the same way, using modern Greek as a good representation of, say, Homer is false. The reconstructed pronunciation is doubtless incorrect in some details, but it's a lot less wrong. And that's sort of uh, the, the point here. And in fact, I think he's even being too humble about this, this notion. Just as we understand, what facts of history would you like to explore? Alexander the Great's conquests. We know so much about them. But how precise is our information? Well, we have fog in certain details, all kinds of things that aren't exactly certain, maybe some exaggerations in the numbers. Do we then say that Alexander the Great didn't exist? No. That's so it's a lot less wrong to report Alexander the Great's deeds as conquests through Persia and India than to say, no, he never really did that because we don't have perfect information. You know, that's the equivalent of, of Kanagunis. This notion ought to be troublesome to any scholar. It is further completely untrue that there is an utter lack of evidence for the reconstructions. There's all sorts of evidence. The phonotactics of the language itself, inscriptions, especially spelling variations, foreign borrowings into Greek, and Greek borrowings into other languages. Descriptions by ancient Greek grammarians and historical linguistics permits comparison to sister languages. Now, all these things, as we'll read in Kanagunis' article, Kanagunis says all these things are illegitimate. He doesn't say why. He just says that none of these things can be used. Only You can only use the things internal to the Greek language, by which he means the different language, which is called modern Greek. In the era of Erasmus, he claims that more recent Erasmians avoid the inscriptions, particularly the earlier ones. This is also false. It's super false. In Volksgereike, Allen constantly references inscriptional evidence, as well as Sturdivant, as well as Horrocks. It's, it's, it's like the guy just found segments of it and ignored whatever went against his ideas. We'll see this in detail. Nor does he seem to fully understand what exactly the reconstructed pronunciation is. Here he is on the circumflex accent. Oh, yeah, this is amazing. However, the form of the circumflex only indicated that it was the result of the contraction of two vowels. One, oxynomenon, or oxynomenon, for the minor Greek pronunciation, and the other one, barionomenon, or varionomenon. But it had no rising and falling tone in pronunciation, an impossibility in actual speech... For once the contraction had taken place, there was but one position in the mouth and one dominant accent, the acute. I trust he does not mean that pitch doesn't change during speech and that people speak in monotone. But that means he has somehow come to the stunning idea that the reconstructed pronunciation posits a simultaneous rising and falling of pitch for the circumflex, like rising and falling at the same time, which of course would be impossible. But the circumflex marks pitch contour, up then down. 
not Tuvan throat singing. It's so interesting that, you know, Karangunis, he writes so seriously with such derision, such caustic derision for reconstructive pronunciation, what he calls Erasmian, because obviously this is an impossibility. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Those idiots. It's like seeing the town fool claim the earth is flat. You know, it's like, like you idiots, of course the earth is flat. And, and um, that's uh, somewhat of a, a harsh characterization for, again, a man I'm clearly passionate about the language. But it's so shockingly, shockingly wrong. It's like, how can you... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Karanguri, <laughs> you're writing about this in detail. You're critiquing the universal consensus virtually, of the reconstructed pronunciation, which says how, well, ancient Greek is obviously a pitch accent language. But you didn't actually study any pitch accent languages? I mean, I know it was the 90s when you wrote this, but you had no access to Japanese speakers or to tapes, which works discussing it, helping you to understand how pitch accent works. So it's, um, you know, you have to be incredibly ignorant of your field to write something like, uh, like this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake. Or I've written a few things, more than a few things in, in my life. I'm like, oh, no, I was totally wrong. Totally off on, on plenty of things. Even videos. Um, happens all the time. I have retracted things. I've done that several times, with uh, even with um, Greek stuff, as you've probably seen if you've been watching all the videos. But this article of his is written recently in 07, and he just maintains the same nonsense. So given that, I feel that he probably still to this day in 2023 believes these things. And so I will ridicule his ideas as if they are uh, being delivered in the present. I trust he does not mean that pitch doesn't... Ch oh, I know. Going back to the Ewaoyoi example... Neither the academic Erasmian nor the reconstructed pronunciation match his seven-syllable rendition. E -u -a -o -i -o -i. The reconstructed version of this is e -wa -o -i -o -i. Exactly. You know, it's like, how, how can he make such a ridiculous claim? Um, it's, uh, it almost seems like a deliberate attempt to deceive his audience, assuming they're going to be sympathetic, because he's, he simply must know better. If he doesn't, then he has no business at all talking about this or anything. Like, I'm amazed he can write English so incredibly well, because English has these sounds in it. Oh, except Ao, but it has oi, like oi oi. Like, that's pretty, oi oi, that's pretty common. And we have wa, so wa, wa oi oi, wa oi oi. I'm just putting an in front of that, e wa oi oi. Those are pretty close to sounds we have in English. Factual errors. Throughout his article, Kanangunis makes basic errors of fact when talking about linguistics. The word impossible, adunaton, comes up rather too often, or certainly uh, adinaton. Uh, one, one example of which we have already encountered in his discussion of the circumflex, in discussing aspirates. Finally, the fact that the preposition ek does not change before katapa, uh, kapitao, and pi, before theta phi and chi, it actually often becomes ech in inscriptions. Absolutely. So, for example, uh, I'm saying ech, that's how you might say really ech, or uh, ech, reconstructed, right? So, you constructed attic. So, uh, we have this word, so tetalias, tetalias, aspirated, right? So, the reconstructed classical attic pronunciation, ech tetalias, ech tetalias, ech tetalias. Ectetalias. Or in, say, the Pompeian Lusian pronunciation, ectetalias, right? Which is actually pretty much identical to modern Greek, except modern Greek doesn't do geminated consonants, so it would just be ectetalias. And then we have teton, so ekteton, ekteton. Um, or, or Pompeian Lusian, ekteton. Then we have pules, ekpules, ekpules. And then we have kalkidos. Ekalkidos. And here, of course, this represents the gemination of the initial part of the aspirate, which is the occlusive ka. It's ka with ha on top of it, so it's ekalidos, ekalidos. So it's not like it's ekalidos. There's no need to do that. It's not what it represents. And he, but he says, which would be impossible to pronounce as 
ekkalidos. That's like that's exactly what I explained. That's not what that means. It is not, in fact, impossible to produce clusters of aspirated stops with aspiration articulated for both consonants. Several Indic languages do so, for example, as do Georgian and Armenian. You can hear sound samples of it at the UCLA Phonetics Lab archive. The Armenian corpus has an example right away. Well, let's listen to that example. This recording was made on November 17, 1972, as an illustration for a 103 term paper. She is the speaker of Western Armenian from Kesab, Syria. Pupil. Peep. Need. Betk. Duck. Pat. Uh, and so that, that word right there, the bet, the betk. Pupil. Peep. Need. Betk. 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 Tk. There's a living language right there. Betk. Beautiful. What a cool language. Phonology, the central concern of his article, has an extensive vocabulary which allows one to describe vocal sounds with considerable precision. Yet nowhere does Karangunis use this technical vocabulary to describe the sounds under discussion, favoring instead idiosyncratic terms without precise meaning. Iota, E, is a high front unrounded vowel. And that's what it looks like in the International Phonetic Alphabet, in IPA. It is described by Karangunis as thin, and the development of an iota-like pronunciation of y, y, a high front rounded vowel, and that's what it looks like in IPA, as thinning down. Now, this terminology is actually reflective of what ancient grammarians use because they didn't have the technical vocabulary. They just you know, they did their best. So it's this weird intermix of using the ancient vocabulary for these things, of using the ancient terminology, when it's completely imprecise and very unhelpful. It just shows his lack of understanding of linguistics. It's not clear if this thinning down represents the change of u to u fronting or of u to e unrounding, or the complete u to e development. He describes the development of au and eo, so alpha upsilon and epsilon upsilon, to modern Greek af and f as labialization, the pronunciation with the lips, as in consonants, what, of these diphthongs. Labialization in normal linguistic terms refers to the quality of consonants. The term for the process he's describing is fricativization. Further, the diphthongs in question match his own definition of labialization, pronunciation with the lips, while still vowels. So, a labialized consonant, a great example, is the Latin QU. QU is not the sequence of w in Latin, classical Latin, obviously. Um, and say a word like aqua, aqua, what you do is you round your lips as you're making the k sound, not after. A, qua. Or so I start with qua, qua. So instead of qua, 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 qua. They're simultaneous. This is very important for the scansion of Latin because Italians, uh, for example, ended up deassociating uh, de the two sounds into two separate consonants. So the word for water from aqua in Italian is aqua, spelled A C Q U A. And because not only is it disassociated, but it, they even geminated um, the initial components of those two consonants in sequence. So, aqua. And they do this normally with other words like aquila, the word for an eagle in Italian. But in Latin, it's aquila, aquila. That's the labialization of consonants, making your lips round around a consonant. It's qua. That's an example of that. So, he doesn't, Categories, when it comes to these terms, doesn't know what he's talking about. Or rather, he's using the terms in a way that is uh, not helpful, because it's not technical. There exists terminology for this in his field. There's, he has no excuse. He claims that all Indo-European languages are based on stress accent. <laughs> what? Even trivial research will show this to be false. We have every reason to believe Vedic Sanskrit used a pitch accent, and several Slavic and Baltic languages have such accent systems today, Lithuanian, Croatian, Serbian... Further, he does not understand what pitch accent means. It is commonly assumed that ancient Greek accent was musical pitch accent, not stress accent, as though the Greeks always sung... Wait, let me do this in, um, in the, uh, the character I used in that debate between Ecclesiastes and the Classical. As though the Greeks always sung and never used ordinary speech. 
That's what this sounds like, this pompous nonsense of someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. Continuing, the pitch accent system is no more musical than is the total system of a language like Chinese or Yoruba, or the pitch accent lang- uh, the pitch accent system of Japanese. Most languages use tone contours to indicate something, such as emphasis or a type of statement. No one imagines that the rising pitch of a question in English is singing, and similarly, there is no reason to compare pitch accent to music. So, I mean, just... Like it's really shocking for Kanagoris kind of to be that, that um, arrogantly ignorant. The circumflex accent is the cause of numerous difficulties. Each syllable of a Greek word is accented. However, polysyllabic words stress one and only one of the syllables above all others. This dominant accent stress was called acute oxia oxia, and was indicated by the mark as we well kind of. <laughs> While all other syllables received the mark of the grave, there you go, baria or baria. So he has here katakshiotentes. It's kind of hard to read here, but the idea is that there are graves on all of them except the one that carries the acute or a circumflex. Indeed, Alan discusses this also in Wokskaraika. The third mark to come into being was the circumflex bidispomene or bidispomeni placed on contracted vowels and explained as the combination of the acute with the grave, that is, the percussion or stress, in its absence on two adjoining vowels prior to their contraction. Nos, nous. What is, why is it spelled like this? <laughs> Let's get rid of the first omicron, uh, for one. So this is simply high, low. No, os, nos, 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 nos. It's not described in pitch accent language terms as rising and falling. The rising characteristic is perceived because there is a fall that follows it and because of the natural rising and the prosy of a sentence, Japanese is just like this. Um, it's really high mora, low mora. And that creates the contour of falling. So, nos, nos. And then, of course, the o closes to u later. Nos, nos. But these nonsensical things like the percussion of stress and its absence, he has no idea what he's talking about. Any long vowel or diphthong may receive the circumflex accent according to the rules of Greek accentuation, not just contracted vowels, as he appears to be saying here. For example, this is right. Tes, doron. So like tes, doron, pneuma, kaitolipa, etc. He later says that in the rules governing accentuation, the circumflex functions exactly like the acute. So, ektes ges estin, with aletes estin. So, uh, and of course, the modern Greek pronunciation, ektes yis estin, and adithis estin. This is not true, of course. For in clitics, when the accent of the previous word is on the penultimate syllable, the behavior with circumflex and acute is different. By desmu versus filosmu, or pilosmu, or, uh, of course, um, pedesmu in modern Greek. By desmu. And the uh, reconstructed Attic pronunciation. And there, of course, are the two lovely books referenced here, and I have them right here to show you once again. Horrocks, wonderful tome, beautiful. And, of course, the very famous Walks Graika. Great books, you should read every page of them to learn quite a lot about ancient Greek, to say nothing of its phonology. Uh, and I also recommend, as I said before, oop, excuse me, Sturdivant. Now, we have Thus far, only covered a brief commentary about this article. I know I took a lot of time because I wanted to do this. I don't, so don't know how much um, my uh, wonderful viewers will actually watch of uh, this video, which of course will be another, another long one. And that's the intent. That's why it's one of the reasons I uh, made the secondary channel, Polymathy Plus, in order to talk long form about these things and have everything presented so someone can go through and click through and, and see the arguments and understand uh, all this, because this can be distilled into a somewhat more entertaining um, uh, condensed video on the main channel, but, you know, two-hour video talking about this stuff is going to be a little much for most people. It's kind of like a podcast with visual aids, I suppose, <laughs> in, in that sense. And I wanted to cover the era of Karagunis by Will Annis first in order to give a summary, unless you want to see every single way that Karagounis gets this thing wrong. He gets a few things right, too. So now what we're going to do is to talk about the original, infamous, the era of Erasmus and Ungreek pronunciations of Greek by Christos Karagounis. 
The problem. On being taught how to pronounce Greek words, the student of New Testament Greek is told that he is learning to pronounce the language not in the modern Greek fashion, which is a late development, but in the way in which ancient Greeks used to pronounce it. A dichotomy is thus made between modern pronunciation of Greek and the student is often given the impression that his pronunciation of Greek would be identical, or almost identical, with the way the great objects of his study, Paul, Luke, John, pronounced it. And to all intents and purposes, identical or very similar to the way Greek, such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle sounded it in 5th and 4th century Athens. This pronunciation is presented as the scientific pronunciation of Greek in uh, contradistinction to the modern Greek pronunciation, which is considered to be a departure from it. Presented as the scientific pronunciation of Greek, I've, not, I've never heard this term outside of Greeks like Karagounis who criticize Erasmian, I think rightly in many respects, or the Allen reconstruction. Should we call it Alenian? Alenian? The, uh, this. Um, they could call that like scientific. Well, it's, it's interesting that, of course, this article will be rarely lacking in science, but fair enough. Which is considered a departure from it. Of course, it is. This is well established. An inevitable consequence of the above situation has been certain widespread but inaccurate views with regard to the pronunciation of ancient and modern Greek, as well as the relation of modern Greek to the Greek of the New Testament. This may be conveniently illustrated by quoting three scholars. One scholar thought that what he called the modern Greek pronunciation was the pronunciation of the Greeks applied to the Dimotiki. The truth is that pronunciation is related to the letters, not the form of the words or the syntax. Another teacher of Greek thought that the Greeks had changed the pronunciation of certain letters, as, for example, they pronounced uh, P as F and cited uh, as instance the word epta, which he thought modern Greeks pronounced as epta. Well, of course they do. That's a, a natural transformation in the motiki. Um, but, of course, epta, taken in part from katarevusa, is considered an acceptable variant. Epta, epta, also okto, instead of okto. Those are both pronunciations of the number eight. As a matter of fact, in modern Greek, the word for seven occurs in two forms, epta and epta. Interesting, he uses, of course, the uh, a way to connect the written modern Greek language, the ancient one, to show that things haven't changed. Um, it's an interesting choice. It's obviously deliberate, and each of them is pronounced, and each of them is pronounced according to its particular spelling. Finally, a third scholar thought that the relation of modern Greek to the Greek of the New Testament was approximately that of Swedish or Norwegian to the runic. Runic. Do you mean Old Norse? <laughs> he means Old Norse, runic. Um, also, this is demonstrative of a very frequent error that many people make today in the past and in ancient times. And the error is, the error is that written words be, should be, this is, I'm use, let me use the subjunctive, that written words be <laughs> the same as spoken words, and they're not. That letters are the same as sounds, and they're not. This is very frequently seen in ancient grammarians that say this letter sounds like this, and this letter sounds like that. Um, and there is a lot of confusion that's built into that. It's, again, not really an ancient thing, but also a thing that modern people do too. They associate spelling with sounds. Now, it's not unheard of. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense. We have writing systems to reflect sounds the way we speak, but naturally, as pronunciations change, uh, the letters uh, themselves, well, letters are just really this really economical representation of an incredibly complicated phenomenon. In fact, if we think of the actual reconstructed pronunciation of classical Attic Greek with all the, when we, of course, we have the pitch accent system, um, uh, and obviously that was added later, but let's, let's just merge those all together as a this, you know, some in, an ancient Greek thing written that way. It's very economical, and it gets a lot across, especially with the intonational patterns, which are phonemic. That's why they're there. That's why they're written in there. Whereas some languages, like Serbo-Croatian, they have phonemic pitch and stress accent, and they're not always on the same syllables, and uh, they aren't accounted for in uh, most written forms, which is um, confusing. <laughs> uh, Japanese also doesn't mark pitch in its writing system, which is unfortunate. But ancient Greek does, which is cool. Anyway, we'll talk more about that. In any case, the difference between Swedish, Norwegian, and Old Norse, uh, yeah, it's pretty comparable to the difference between the Motiki, which is the natural evolution of ancient Greek through medieval Greek into modern Greek of the people, of the Dimos, of the Damos, of the people. So that's why it's called the Motiki. Um, and Katarevusa, you know, is it's Katarevusa, it's just created so many um, linguistic problems. 
it's fascinating. I, I have nothing against it as a the beautiful conlang that it is. Um, but Katharevosa has been used in modern times, but it's not exactly what we would consider to be modern Greek. And this is this is part and parcel to the endless confusion that is created deliberately and passed down from generation um, to generation between Greeks that the, of a sense of continuity, where it certainly exists in some areas, but doesn't in others uh, between the ancient and modern languages. It does not appear to be generally known what factors and circumstances led to this so-called scientific pronunciation of Greek. Who's calling it that? <laughs> who's, called, so who's called it scientific? I haven't read anything like that. Uh, those scholars who have worked with the very complex and technical evidence bearing on Greek pronunciation are extremely few. Uh, extremely few? Just because it's a niche subject? I mean, what do you mean extremely few? Lots of people have talked about this. I mean, you, one need only um, look at the references here, Horrocks, Sturdivant. I mean, actually, I found out about these other people. I found out about Theodor Son and Sturdivant and um, who's another one? Uh, and uh, Horrocks because they kept referencing these are the things. So I, I've been able to expand my knowledge. And then each one of those books has an incredible bibliography of things where you have, I don't know, extremely few when they're counted in the dozens to hundreds. I don't know. doesn't sound like extremely few to me. But what is the reverence for that? And sort of the truth is there's no truth in this statement. Um, uh, these things stand out at me as like, what's your reference for this? Now, he does have references, and we'll look at some of them. Uh, some of them are good. Others are... So, the subject demands not only a thorough knowledge of Greek, preferably in all its periods. This is a way to insist that you cannot, you, you may not, um, attempt to understand the ancient Greek language without understanding the modern Greek language too. An acquaintance with the inscriptions and the papyri, which bear witness to the spelling in ancient times. I agree with this, of course. A good grasp of the historical developments in ancient times with regard to the change of alphabet, the adoption of the Phoenician alphabet, and its consequent accommodations as well as uh, with the spelling variation under uh, Efklidis, to give the modern pronunciation, Euclides, in the uh, Attic pronunciation of his day. But what is not least, also mastery of the Greek rules regarding phonology, the study of the evolution of sounds, and even phonopathy, the pathology of sounds under various grammatical conditions and reasons for euphony, avoidance of hiatus, etc. Now, as we'll see, he means all of this only from the perspective of modern Greek. That is, modern Greek is the only arbiter of these things. <laughs> um, period. <laughs> Two, the error of Erasmus. Ah, the title. From the introduction of Greek learning to the West in the 13th to 14th century, and until the beginning of the 16th century, Greek was universally pronounced in the same manner in which Greeks pronounce it today, indeed. In 1528, the humanist scholar Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, who for a time happened to live in Leuven, in the Low Countries, the Netherlands, <laughs> composed a dialogue, with a capital D, in Latin, uh, between a bear and a lion, in which he set forth the novel way of pronouncing Greek, which has since come to be called the Erasmian pronunciation of Greek, or Atacism, because the pronunciation of the letter eta, see my eta video, in modern Greek is, of course, ita, and the ancient pronunciation was eta in classical Attic. It went from eta to eta to eventually eta, 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 like modern Greek. And to be regarded by its proponents as the scientific pronunciation of Greek. He keeps repeating this with a sense of irony. He reminds me of a lawyer... The incentive to write this book came from a practical joke that was played on Erasmus by the Swiss scholar Henricus, uh, <laughs> who had arrived from Paris, met Erasmus, who, being inordinately fond of novelties and credulous, Erasmus was credulous, was eager to learn uh, what was latest in the City of Lights. He told him that certain Greek scholars had arrived in Paris to pronounce Greek in a different fashion than the one received in Europe, and proceeded to give him an account of the new pronunciation. There was a verisimilitude in the new suggestions, inasmuch as the Greeks gave on several letters the sound of E. All right, start describing esoticism. Not easy to believe, especially given the actual context, which we saw earlier. The fact that people already for decades were trying to reconstruct the sound of ancient Greek based on what the ancient Greek grammarians were saying. And realize that there's, uh, there's a problem here, and the pronunciation of modern Greek clearly isn't matching with the ancient one. Therefore, maybe we should really look into this. And that was then that caused the idea that wow languages can change 
you know, no one had really thought about that before. If you go and read Dante just a couple centuries prior, he's talking about an ancient Roman world where Virgil spoke in 13th century or 14th century Manchuan, you know, native northern Italian dialect of, you know, hundreds of years after. Because the idea that languages should change had never really occurred to people. And that's why this was such an interesting and fundamental discovery. Indeed, this was the era of science, of discovery, of putting of taking tradition and looking at it, looking at it really carefully, really examining what's good and what's not good about it, what's wrong about it. And so interesting is how all of this, that's why I compare this kind of stuff to flat eartherism. It's like really um, an attempt to use sophistry and call it science in order to justify a traditional value. And that's the thing. You can have traditional values um, of any kind. And that one, in this case, might be you like to pronounce ancient Greek with the modern pronunciation of the letters. That's a convention. That's your convention. I'm not going to say that's wrong to do. It's, it's obviously a legitimate traditional thing. It's demonstrated its utility. I think there's greater utility in reconstructive pronunciations for reasons I've explained elsewhere in countless times. But the problem is then to think that your own modern way of doing things was actually traditional, but more recently traditional, is somehow justified by its past. It's very interesting. There's a desire to justify current things in ancient traditions. If they did it this way tens of centuries ago, then it has value today. It's an interesting um, perspective, but ultimately it's unfounded. Moreover, Latin transliterated, for example, the eta and the second syllable of ecclesia with the letter e. So Latin, of course, is uh, ecclesia rather than with an i. Ecclesia, of course, being the modern Greek. Ecclesia, of course, being the modern Greek pronunciation. As the eta is pronounced by the Greeks, well, not in ancient Roman times. <laughs> in writing this dialogue, Erasmus was motivated by the obvious interest in factual truth and he initiated his novel pronunciation and the belief that it was actually used by Greeks in the present day? I mean, I have to, I should probably go reread the whole tale of the lion and the bear, the, uh, the dialogue by Erasmus, of uh, the uh, De Recta Pronunciazione. But he doesn't say it like that. He talks about how it's done today is different from they must have done in the past. There's frequently a, a, a notion of that, not that it's a modern thing, but that it was different in the ancient language. Not wishing to be anticipated, he immediately composed his dialogues. Later, however, he found out the trick uh, played on him, so he desisted from using the pronunciation he had concocted, abiding by the received pronunciation, and enjoined his closest friends to do the same. And also his opponent, uh, Ioannis, uh, Ioannis, uh, Johannes Reuchlin, and the latter's nephew, Philip, uh, oh, what a beautiful name, um, uh, Malachthon, as well as uh, Martin Luther. But the news spread like wildfire, and after centuries of struggle with the traditional pronunciation, Erasmus' era finally succeeded in ousting the Greek pronunciation of Greek and establishing itself in all countries outside of Greece, apart from a few exceptions. Okay. Speculation along similar lines have been made earlier, uh, but right, we already saw these. Spe right, exactly. It wasn't Erasmus' error or his credulosity. This was a study that was going on for decades, and Erasmus is just... He was, he was super famous, and for good reason, or at least he's super famous to us um, today, for sure, for sure. So, yeah, people were curious, and he was one in the chain, early in the chain, of people investigating this. The story of the fraud, frauda, uh, to which Erasmus fell victim, is related in an account dated 27 October 1569 and cited in one of the fervent supporters of Erasmianism. In uh, Aristarchus, um, see with the Arte Grammatica Libri Septem, etc. Hello, it's Future Luke again. So, the original reference for this anecdote is actually cited in the end notes of the Caragonis paper. And he has the original Latin here, which will be found here. We're going to look at it in a second. But I wanted to get the original book by Vossius. Uh, Gerhard Vos, I believe uh, we might pronounce his name, and the, uh, the more or less the Dutch manner, though I don't speak Dutch. Uh, he was a Dutch a scholar, and he lived for a century or so after Erasmus, and he writes all kinds of things here. So in this chapter here, what you see is chapter 28, he talks about the corrupted pronunciations of uh, certain letters. Indeed, he talks about how the fact that 
uh, spiso setiam errores, there's this common error that today in front of the letter, the letter C in front of uh, e, i, u, i, o, of course they probably pronounce e, e, e um, for a lot of those people, uh, they would pronounce gela as sella, gilikem as silikem, uh, and so forth, you know, the, these sorts of things, or tsilitsem, uh, however it might be in this uh, Germanic type of pronunciation. So the point here is that, of course, this author is well acquainted with the reconstructed pronunciation of both languages, kikoro spelled with a kappa in Greek, uh, kikoro, kikoro, you know, and so forth. So he's quite aware that the reconstructed pronunciation of both Latin and ancient Greek is, of course, valid, and he keeps quoting all of the ancient grammarians, just like Erasmus and just like the guys who came before Erasmus. Thus, we also say, instead of say, thus we say uh, Scopus and Scorpius instead of Scopus and Scorpius, which is what we should say because, you know, the, the which is an interesting little Germanic tendency, and uh, Partium instead of uh, Parti, Partibus, we should be saying Partium. You know, he, he makes it clear and that the sound of V should be a, a W and not sound like an F but voiced, you know, he, he makes it all clear. Now, here's the anecdote. Here he says, Comitimus sedalios non nullos errores, quos referre super sedio, qui hancre minutrius que linguae pronunciatione accurate per secuntur cum. The following people, uh, and including, of course, Erasmus. That is, the mistakes in, pronunci in pronunciation of Latin and ancient Greek that have been very common uh, have rightly been corrected by these folks, and Erasmus is here, listed here as the last one, which is of course appropriate because he wasn't the first one, and no one claims that he invented uh, this thing. However, uh, he says here, Ac Erasmus quidem qua occasione adscribendum de recta pronunciatione furit impulsus, paucis cognitum arbitror. But the occasion for which Erasmus ended up wanting to, he was impelled to write about this, uh, he guesses that isn't, he guesses that it's known to few. So he says, well, all right, let's look at this letter written by this Henricus, uh, which was, uh, and he wrote this in the, and he wrote this in 1569. This anecdote is from someone else from someone else. This is not a first person account, but it's still uh, interesting. And essentially it says that <laughs> uh, Erasmus was told by somebody that Greeks living abroad in Paris, that they actually pronounced Greek in a different way, that they pronounced it in this the reconstructed way, and that Erasmus wanted to be the first to publish this uh, idea, and thus he hurried off to the printer to get it published as quickly as possible, his the dialogus that, of course, we're, we've always been talking about. But then afterwards, once Erasmus found out that he had been fooled that it was, I guess, a practical joke that, that uh, they were playing on him, that he then decided never again to use that pronunciation system and dissuaded people from using the reconstructed pronunciation of ancient Greek or an Erasmian type pronunciation. Uh, that's what's written here. This is uh, written in the this letter, if it is reported correctly here by the author. Uh, no reason to doubt that. This, is re this is book that we're looking at here was written in the 1600s about a letter written 30 years after the death of Erasmus. Now, Erasmus had enemies. <laughs> so, And also, this doesn't ring true at all, because there were so many people, including Erasmus, who were simply reading the ancient grammarians and were able to see, well, hey, the ancient grammarians are saying very specific things that don't match the pronunciation system of Latin or Greek in common use. Now, the next part, uh, again, the only part that uh, Cargouni cites is the part that seems to aid his argument, which starts at the ac erasmus quidem and ends at the end of the letter. But he doesn't go on to see this part, which is instructive, which we'll look at in a moment. And I found other articles discussing the notion that, okay, this was just some kind of a practical joke being played on Erasmus, and uh, this uh, Barnard also uh, talks about this. And the, the idea that this was some kind of practical joke and he just um, made this mistake and he rushed out to do it is completely contrary to the character of Erasmus and also to what this very book says. Like this is, this taken at face value out of context has led to the mistaken conclusion that, of course, Cargunis reports. Says Bernard, I argue that the dialogue was intended as a sincere popularization of an ongoing academic inquiry, but that the hypothetical Greek pronunciation therein has been misunderstood as a cue to replace traditional native pronunciation. Right, that's the thing. So in the dialogue, the name of ancient Greek is simply called Sermo Graecus, right? It's just called the Greek language. And the notion that modern Greek and ancient Greek 
or of language evolution. Those aren't really clearly defined concepts. Instead, Erasmus is simply talking about, well, if we're using the ancient Greek literature, then the way that Greeks pronounce today is corrupted. Thus, he calls those pronunciation, when applied to the ancient words, incorrect, and that, for example, the pronunciation of beta as vita, well, that's clearly incorrect because it doesn't work for these ancient authors. What Erasmus is doing in his dialogue is attempting to establish the pronunciation for the ancient language. But for people not reading super well the dialogue, it probably came across as Erasmus is telling Greeks how to speak modern Greek, that they shouldn't say uh, vrisco, but they should say, I guess, uh, bresco or something for uh, find, right? Uh, so that's the error, not of Erasmus, except for the Epsonagota, but the error here <laughs> is misunderstanding that Erasmus was trying to correct modern pronunciation. And that's the idea, like, oh, well, he was tricked that, oh, some modern Greeks actually pronounce Greek. Uh, I don't think this anecdote is true. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's not consistent with anything of Erasmus or the academic inquiries that were ongoing in that whole time period. Did Erasmus use his own Erasmian pronunciation? Well, he talks about this here. Obviously, the modern Greek pronunciation isn't changed. That's the way that they pronounce it. So they're not going to obviously start pronouncing things the way Erasmus said things should be pronounced in the ancient Greek language. There's no question about that. He says that he doesn't believe that Erasmus actually regretted publishing the book. Of course, it is a ridiculous notion. And moreover, that, and that Erasmus probably didn't discourage people from using some kind of reconstructed pronunciation. As for the man himself, as for the man himself, he says, although he approved of the more correct pronunciation of the ancient Greek, he nevertheless followed uh, a uh, the worse uh, example, that is to say the uh, modern Greek example, but he had a good reason. For one, that's how he learned to pronounce the language since he was a kid. And he also didn't want to do something so different from everybody else in order to thus encourage them to follow his example. He felt embarrassed about doing such a thing with uh, pronunciation. And I understand that too. I don't really feel inclined to pronounce things differently in front of people because I like people and I want people to be able to uh, understand me for sure. And moreover, not to feel like I'm trying to uh, you know, talk down at them uh, despite all of my videos, which um, may be construed in that way, but that's not my intention, of course. And moreover, so the point here is that the very book that Karagunis has cited contradicts this anecdote. And moreover, the most likely reason that Wosius was citing this anecdote is that an anecdote of this nature, if not this precise description, had been circulating in order to discredit reconstructed pronunciations. But it's an absolutely ridiculous story that is so easily contradicted by obvious facts that he seems to cite it just to point out at how ridiculous the opposition is to a reconstructed pronunciation. This anecdote, as reported, does not ring true with Erasmus or with the science of it. But even if this were true, it doesn't matter. Because even if Erasmus's dialogue weren't the well-constructed piece of philology and historical linguistics that it really is, especially for his century, it doesn't matter because ipsa facta locuntur. But let's go ahead and take it at face value. Erasmus was fooled, and he felt like he was fooled, and he had no interest in some kind of reconstructed pronunciation. I never used it. Let's just imagine that to be the case. So what? <laughs> he was right about most of it, so what's the difference? Uh, this Erasmian pronunciation claims to represent a united system of pronunciation. Aha, look, I'm about to agree a lot with Karangunis. But this is only theoretically. In actual practice, Greek is pronounced in conformity to German, English, French, and so on, according to the mother tongue of the speaker. Or said in uh, somewhat more linguistic terms, the phonotactic limitations of the native speech of a German or an Englishman or a Frenchman, an Italian, end up altering the theoretical pronunciation to something that the speaker imagines they're doing. We all do this. It's difficult to, to train oneself not to do it and creating something that is not right. And one of those phonotactic limitations are the three native fricatives of modern Greek, cha, tha, fa. Well, cha, we don't have that in English. Tha and fa, we do. So we usually pronounce theta and phi in the Erasmian type pronunciations, that is in the uh, regular academic university type pronunciations. 
Uh, but ch, seldom. Some people do. It's not that hard. English speakers tend to be able to figure that out pretty easily. And Italians, they can do fa, but they can't do ch or tha, so they make those ka and ta, respectively, uh, and so forth and so on. So this is a legitimate complaint and one that I share with the author, with Karangunis. Hence, in our international New Testament conferences, we are often conscious of a Babel-like experience when trying to figure out which Greek word the speaker was trying to pronounce. Indeed, this is a big problem. That's why I've sought to, um, I don't know, help people a little bit with my uh, proposals. Although a Finnish New Testament scholar once assured me that his pronunciation of Greek was identical to that of Socrates and Plato. Well, listen, Kiria Karaguni. Probably, because Finnish has phonemic vowel length. Ancient Greek has phonemic vowel length. And this moraic nature to the languages makes them far more similar. So Finnish phonotactics are definitely going to work in favor. Now, intonation, other characteristics that are super, super segmental, they're not going to be transferred necessarily into modern Greek voices, or maybe they are. Um, I like pronouncing Latin with an Italian flair, shall we say. Um, very few Italians would ever say I actually sound Italian because I don't when I speak Latin. Because the way that Italians pronounce Latin is um, omnissa, ominessa, sese, studente. You know, they, they do those, those, those things. And of course, I'm exaggerating a bit of the uh, melodic intonation. But um, uh, I don't. I, I, I'd still, however, try to mask certain characteristics that are inherently English-like and make them more Italian or Spanish-like wherever possible. But that's just an aesthetic preference. I do think it's the better choice. Uh, someone like Ioannis Stratakis, who is Greek, he sounds like a modern Greek speaker who has mastered reconstructed pronunciation of classical Attic Greek. So he sounds modern Greek, which is a nice feature, um, without using any of the modern Greek rules but using all the ancient Greek rules. So it's a, it's a nice aesthetic combination. And this is often confusing to people. And I see this as a significant problem. It's part of why I do what I do, why I record so many uh, audiobooks. Thanks, patrons, by the way. Getting to the theoretical of, say, Latin or ancient Greek, whichever system you are using, ought to happen and not permit something like the long A in Latin or, or Greek, like the long letter E with the line on it <clears throat> in Latin, or the eta is pronounced like in the word they. Oh, what a horrible thing. Um, it's horrible because it ends up creating lots of confusion and merger. So this, this, the scene he's describing here is absolutely right, and it is um, a problem. Get to your theoretical version as best you can. After that, consider adopting some kind of intonational pattern that is similar to your goal. goal. You know, if, This is the first thing you have to do. You have to get to the theoretical. Uh, then if you want to, you know, my like Italian flair that I'm, I, I attempt to uh, employ in my Latin, or even uh, to a lesser extent, a uh, modern Greek flair, it's harder because the intonation is part of the, the musical pitch accent uh, in ancient Greek. But there are certain things I, I definitely do, which I've taken deliberately from modern Greek to try to, to do them more like that than like Italian or different from my uh, native English. So I, I do very much sympathize with this view. The problem, too, is the difference between the, the theoretical, not getting to the theoretical, and then also just sounding foreign because of oral posture, because of intonation, because of these other things that aren't in the theory and really can't be because of the, their nature. So in the end, yeah, the Finnish guy probably actually did pronounce ancient Greek better if he was observing the phonemic vowel length better than you, uh, in the sense that it was more like the ancient speakers of the language. Absolutely. The state of affairs naturally robs the Erasmian pronunciation of the right to being called scientific. I mean, you, you keep repeating it, but you're doing an opposite of Mark Antony and Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Instead of trying to bring out some kind of irony, this irony is just reflecting back on you, Mr. Author. Hence, the so-called scientific pronunciation of Greek is, to paraphrase Hirsch's phrase, nothing but a chaotic democracy of un-Greek pronunciations of Greek, each uh, conceived according to what is deemed natural to the speaker's own tongue. So the whole chaotic thing, democratic, which is interesting to be anti-democracy, whatever, uh, but the chaotic thing I get and I deeply empathize with, and I have sought to encourage people to do some things I've tried to do uh, my, myself, so I totally get that. But to say that then the right answer is to speak in ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation or the modern Greek pronunciation of ancient Greek, I mean, that's an answer. But if you speak ecclesiastical pronunciation, like arma virumque cano, troie, qui primus saboris, italium, fato profugus, lavinia que 
uh, venit litera. You know, that's a more, that's a, with a strong, pretty strong American accent, right? Now, technically, I'm doing the right, I'm getting towards a theory in this fictional version of myself that doesn't understand um, the actual phonemes. I'm using English language equivalents. It's still ecclesiastical. I said Troye, not Troyai, right? But my opinion um, that I think I've supported well in other videos and, and commentary is that saying Troye and Troyai is both, they're both wrong. If you want to sound like an Italian, then it would be, uh, you know, Troye. Uh, if you want to sound like an ancient Roman, it'd be Troyai. You know, so that's the kind of thing. It, saying tra, for example, where the R, which is in form to the palate primarily in English, er, cool sound, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but it causes the T, which is dental, to be retracted also towards the palate. So you get ch, post uh, alveolar affricate, ch. And so you get uh, the sound of troyai instead of troyai. No, it says troyai, troyai. It's difficult. Unless they say a ra, trilled r, like say some speakers of um, Scotland. Historical circumstances. One may wonder how was the practical joke on Erasmus possible? Indeed. Um, it's, this sounds more like, because Erasmus had enemies, it sounds more like an er, enemy of Erasmus just just trying to say something about him or taking a version of events as he reported to put him in disrepute. Why could not the proponents of the new pronunciation check this novelty with the Greeks? I think you're assuming that Erasmus believed that modern Greeks or Greeks of his day of the 16th century actually spoke in the ancient Greek reconstruction. No evidence of that. Uh, from what I recall in the dialogue. Why did the Greeks not protest? <laughs> I'm, I'm chuckling because Greeks protesting about things that goes against um, their uh, traditional ways of doing things is a meme. Hence, of course, my Big Fat Greek Wedding and other uh, things which uh, lampoon this uh, stereotype. What is the explanation for the rise and success of this novelty in pronouncing Greek? Well, because it's actually derived from the evidence. That's the reason why. There is an historical circumstances which, as far as I can see, has not been taken into account. Following its move of its capital from Rome to Constantinople under Constantine, the Roman Empire of New Testament times gradually was transformed into a new Greek empire, the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire has a lifespan of some 1,100 years till, of course, the, oh yes, the day of living inf infamy. Uh, 1453, when Constantinople was finally taken by the Turks. Although many Greek scholars at the advance of the Muslims, took their libraries and fled to Italy, helping to initiate their, the Renaissance, absolutely, there was now no longer a Greek state which could watch over the fate of the Greek language and its pronunciation. The Greeks were engaged in a life and death struggle with the Turks, indeed, a struggle that went on for more than 200 years after the fall of Constantinople. Naturally then, not only did they lack means of resisting the new pronunciation, <laughs> but they were, for the most part, unaware of what was going on in Central Europe. Western Europe, okay. The Western Europeans on their side, having preached their funeral sermon over Greece, felt now free to dispose of her legacy as seemed fit to them. Like, this is a scientific paper. This is an academic paper, people. And he's saying these in this incredibly emotional version of events. And But I, th I think this is very revealing. This is how Greeks perceive the situation. They say, oh, they, they stole our language, they stole our culture, and they're pronouncing it badly. That's what it seems to them. Because in the Greek conscious is this memory that their mortal enemy from the East came and uh, destroyed the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Greek Empire. Exactly. Now, I don't disagree with that characterization at all. I very much uh, think that Greeks have passed down this, this memory of having been... Um, having their land be violated like this and their, their culture and, and so forth. So I get it. That's not even an unreasonable thing to dwell upon, much as other dark events in history are worthy of remembering uh, and discussion. However, this is not the reason that the pronunciation is different, what you're calling the scientific pronunciation. Um, I'm putting scare quotes around your scare quotes, by the way, just so you know, Mr. Author here, uh, Kyrie Karaguni. The advent of the Greeks in Italy marked the beginning of the new Western school of classical studies, which, following the death of its founders, passed on into non-Greek hands. The historical grammarian, oh, Yanadis, 
Man. I, I learned about that guy reading this. Oh, man. Well, hi there, future Luke. Just one more time. I wanted to open up Yanaris's book here, An Historical Greek Grammar. This is written in the late 1800s by Antonios Yanaris. And I just turned to a random page. The aspiratai, using the Latin term. Cool, I approve of that. The aspiratai, kai theta phi, are sounded according to the Erasmians like two separate elements, kaha, taha, paha, sometimes symbolized like this. Now, already this is wrong. For one, it's uh, it's not wrong per se, but of course Erasmus himself did recommend the aspirate pronunciation pataka. That is clear. The funny thing is that Erasmian pronunciations, such as they are, almost never observe <laughs> this important element of Erasmus's recommendations. But more than that, they are not two separate elements. It's not kaha, taha, paha, it's katapha. We have aspiration that is occurring at the same time as the enunciation of the base consonant letter. In the International Phonetic Alphabet, this is represented by, in this case, letter K with a superscript H, not K plus H, because that would, de that would indeed be two separate elements or a sequence of two consonants. That's not what they are. So Yanadis already demonstrates himself not to understand a very basic linguistic fact that he should have known. He says the traditionalists pronounce them as simple khatafa. Okay, sure. The Erasmian view, which by the way is not unanimous, rests on two considerations. The existence of katapa in Sanskrit, whose pronunciation, however, is still more hypothetical. Number one, no. Sanskrit's pronunciation, of course, becomes Hindi's pronunciation, and Hindi also has these sounds. However, the voiceless katapa of Greek come from Proto-Indo-European gdaba, voiced aspirates, and those are the ones that are correlated with Sanskrit. So, uh, this is very wrong. And the transliteration of Latin by chthph of the letters. But such arguments cannot be seriously entertained in the face of the following data. The Latin digraphs are reminiscence, are reminiscence of the original Greek digraphs that were written with the uh, kappa heta and so forth, uh, which in Greece were subsequently given up in favor of their monoliteral substitutes. To my knowledge, the ancient Romans had no idea about spellings like, like this. They may have but it doesn't matter because they weren't exposed to it <laughs> because Greek was using these letters by the time the Romans came into contact with them. The monoliteral substitutes, indeed, undoubtedly coined for the special purpose because of their, their predecessors were felt as simple sounds and the aspiration of H had long become extinct. If H was heard in the monoliteral representatives of primordial katapa, it is unaccountable why these should not form metrical length. This is this is shocking, because they're aspirates, you fool. I mean, really? So, um, I get why Karagounis is coming off as so ignorant because he's sourcing from things that are just wrong, and are awful linguistic. So, uh, this is why I I laugh at the mention of Yanadis as if he's some kind of authority <laughs> on uh, phonetics. He's not. Uh, the history of the language and the grammar is a different thing. Oh, the historical grammarian. Uh, Yanaris uh, puts the matter pertinently when he says, The first act of this school, still in its infancy, was to do away with the traditional pronunciation, which reflects perhaps the least changed part of the language, and then to declare Greek a dead tongue. This is all opinion. You, This person, this is Yanaris, believed that the pronunciation was the least changed part of the language. No, <laughs> it's the most changed part of the language. And then declare Greek a dead tongue. Uh, this is the problem. Is with terminology, and the, the problem doesn't necessarily lie with um, the Greeks, who uh, have to deal with the fact that a very different language called modern Greek, which I'm specifying as essentially at least modern standard Greek, if not just pure demotiki, and ancient Greek, Koine, classical Attic, all those dialects, they're so different. They're so different, but they all have the same name. That's a failure of terminology. Um, and that's a real problem, unfortunately, because the idea that Greek is the dead tongue, if someone did say that, it's obvious they mean the ancient Greek language, which was already obviously, you know, uh, once they realized it through careful study from Erasmus time, there's, oh yeah, ancient Greek is so different. Now that's, people don't speak that way anymore. People don't naturally write that way without a lot of training. That's what makes the language dead. It lacks native speakers. Ancient Greek is a dead language. Latin is a dead language. There are not native speakers. There's no native community, which actually speaks in that manner anymore. There are lots of learned people who have learned to do so, and it is, of course, very enjoyable and uh, very cool. Um, you can pronounce it however you want. 
free country, as we say, right? But the uh, but yeah, ancient Greek is a dead tongue, and that's the problem. I think. Well, Greek's not dead. We speak it every day. You know, that's that's the problem. It's a terminology issue. Too bad we can't call them the Motiki, Attic, Koine, just by their dialect name, um, in order to sp- clarify that they're different languages. The problem too is that Koine and Attic are so similar that they're two different dialects chronologically separated of the same language, uh, which is grammatically so, so, so different from modern Greek. So anyway, Greeks protest and they say, that oh, it's so similar. It's like, I mean, yeah, there are similarities. You can see where it comes from, but you compare it to almost any other uh, language change from Middle Egyptian to Coptic, from uh, Old English to Modern English, from, um, gosh, from uh, obviously from Latin into the Romance languages from Old Norse into the Nordic languages. You know, this is these are quite comparable, but they haven't studied those other things, so they think that Greek is unique. And it's because of this traditional affection, not unwarranted for the uh, ancient language and its culture. So anyway, this in brief is the historical background which made possible the rise and establishment of the Rasmian pronunciation. Having established it, its advocates proceeded to produce scientific proofs, why the scare quotes, for its correctness. One of its foremost proponents was Friedrich Blas, whose arguments set forth in a writing of 41 pages. Hey, that's how long this document is. Then increased to 109, and again to 140 pages. I guess that means if there's more pages, it's bad. Um, have often been refuted. Many scholars, English, Germans, Americans, and Greeks, wrote against the Erasmian pronunciation. Really? When? And the fight over the pronunciation of Greek, at its hottest in the 19th century, ended in a stalemate. The Greeks continued to pronounce Greek in the modern Greek way, while the other camp considered that they had discovered the authentic pronunciation of classical antiquity. I mean, it's just, this is, I don't know, uh, it's definitely propagandistic, the Greek way, because you've assumed a priori that that's the same as the ancient Greek way. Instead of the modern Greek way, which is the technically correct way to describe this, even if they did end up being the same, and putting authentic in square quotes. I think it's shameful. This is shameful for an academic to write this way. Curiously enough, and self-contradictorily, they went on pronouncing Homer, Plato, and the New Testament, as well as church fathers, all in the same way. Now, that's worth uh, discussing. Obviously, I have very much sought to understand this uh, as well, to tease out the differences. Now, Homer and Homeric pronunciation is difficult because we don't really have stuff spelled in the Homeric way with, say, diagamma, which we'll talk about later. So I very much agree with this sentiment. Homer, Plato... New Testament, Church Fathers, the differences here I've documented quite a bit. Should you pronounce ancient Greek differently for each author, for each century? I would prefer that, personally, but it's also completely acceptable to use a convention of any type. The conclusion that he's making is, well, they should all be different. Well, that's too chaotic. You should just do it the modern Greek way. That's not a logical conclusion. That's just an option. That's it. The historical pronunciation of Greek. So I would describe the historical pronunciation as a dog whistle for this kind of propaganda. It is the mistaken, completely unfounded notion that modern Greek pronunciation is the pronunciation as well as ancient Greek. Again, as I've demonstrated countless videos, and just read these books, you know, and I I guess I'm probably talking to very few people who disagree with the concept. But in case they're there, read this stuff, you know, and uh, and if you don't have... The linguistic um, understanding of it, you could probably get to a basic level with uh, a number of my videos that cover the topic. So I don't know. It's it's just hard because um, so many people are so do- dogmatically insistent upon this this notion. Certainly a minority of people, a lot of them just happen to be Greeks. Anyway, so the historical pronunciation, this term is, like I said, it's a dog whistle um, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's not really Orwellian, because Orwellian suggests something quite dystopic. Uh, it is, however, propaganda, uh, the bad kind, because the historical pronunciation of Greek, meaning the pronunciation of Greek in all of its centuries, which has never changed, according to these people, it's factually wrong, and it's pretty offensive, uh, academically speaking. I was very disappointed to see uh, this term even in the beginning of the uh, uh, Logos book, which is a lovely book. Um... Not, not a perfect book, and I like to talk about it sometime, but it also says the same thing in the very beginning, which it d- describes the Erasmian pronunciation, which is a very flawed version of it, too, <laughs> um, next to the um, Historiki Profera. The Historiki Profera, or Historiki Profera, here. 
very disappointing. Very, very disappointing because the very the mere usage of historical pronunciation, meaning Latin Greek pronunciation, or Roric Linnean pronunciation, is anti-academic. A classics professor once told me that he was aware that the Erasmian pronunciation did not reflect the ancient Greek pronunciation, but he explained it helps to spell Greek correctly. Uh, this is something that also Booth rightly has um, criticized. Helping to spell correctly is not a legitimate reason for pronouncing a language a certain way. I can see the value in it. There's a practicality in it, but it's ultimately at odds with how most languages are and their spelling. It's like as phonetic as people say, uh, Italian is written. That is, uh, you know, kind of one sound, one letter. Well, it's really not. Even a language as well put together as Italian or Super Croatian or, or as far as their spelling systems, they don't describe all the phonetic details. And in fact, it to you know help spelling, uh, you should pronounce Italian differently. Instead of saying gnocchi, you should say gnocchi. Instead of saying pizza, you should say pizza, because. Our English brains, if, that's the, if we're coming from an Anglophone point of view, our English brains interpret those letters differently. So you should, sp you should pronounce Italian according to how it's spelled in an English way. So that doesn't necessarily hold water. Um, but it is true, of course, that the way that ancient Greek is written, that is in the wonderful year 403, he cited it himself, 403 BC, uh, the Attic alphabet, the Ionian adopted into the... Um, Attic alphabet of the mid-classical period forward, that represents accurately the sound of the language in its time. Now, of course, there are variations. That's why we looked at Theodor Son to see that there was, wow, there's a lot of interesting things in this vulgar Latin and the subsystem that were quite different. Nevertheless, it does accurately represent the sound of the language at a point in its history. So yeah, in that way, if you're going for a classical Attic pronunciation based on the spelling system, you're going to get, yeah, that those things correspond, but they don't have to. Look at French, look at English, look at plenty of languages that spell things in a way that um, isn't letter for letter, what they would be in, say, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Indeed, the awareness that the Erasmian pronunciation of Greek is inaccurate is now fairly widespread, and a welcome openness is noted in international scholarship. Now, again, this author identifies Erasmian pronunciation as any reconstructed form, or he conflates them. Sometimes he separates them, but often he conflates them because that's the lawyer-like or propagandistic purpose that he has. I don't know how much of this he's aware of, because again, he looks like a nice old man, uh, clearly a very uh, intelligent uh, professor. And um, But for writing this and continuing to write these things that are so anti-academic does not bring him a good reputation, I think, in academia. That's my perspective. And a welcome openness is noted in international scholarship. As a matter of fact, during its 4,000 year long history, Greek has not been pronounced uniformly. Now, this is great. The concession that, oh yeah, it's there's been changes. But this is not uncommon um, for Greeks to say that the pronunciation of Greek has been the same from Homer to the present. It's so freaking untenable that pretty much none of them do. But the ones that have dipped their toes into this uh, with the chip on their shoulder, uh, they've said, okay, yeah, yeah, it was pronounced differently, but in pre-classical times. Even, of course, the evidence for that isn't isn't there. But let's, because uh, uh, they find the things that Theodorson found and said, oh, look, it's just like modern, modern pronunciation already happened in 5th century BC. But they push back like 6th, 7th, 8th century. That's when it sounded like your reconstruction that Alan uses. But after that, it changed completely. And then no one spoke uh, like that anymore. The purpose of this is to take the thing that's most admired, that 5th century classical attic, um, as well as the, the time period and the culture, and say, hey, we have this unbroken connection to that. It's to identify the modern with the ancient to give the modern more valid validity. And it's a shame. It's actually a rather aristocratic view, if you think about it. The idea of a lineage of kings, you know, this um, man or woman is the legitimate ruler according to God of this country because of, you know, genetic inheritance. Well, here in this country, we <laughs> decided things a bit differently. Not only obviously this country, but many uh, across the world have now taken on um, that opinion that hereditary leadership may not be the best way. That's the idea of what I mean by aristocratic, even uh, regal. Our written records take us back three and one half millennia, mm -hmm. but there's no way of establishing how it was pronounced in the second millennium and in the first part of the first millennium BC. Well, that's not true. While our reconstructions can be much more precise with the better data that we have, we have better data from better inscriptions, epigraphy, papyri, and so forth, when those things came to exist, 
we could still, yeah, do and have reconstructed Mycenaean and all kinds of other really cool things um, as far as they've been written. We can also reconstruct, you know, how it was in a certain century or millennium as we go into the stages of Proto-Greek all the way back into Proto-Indo-European. Like we know how Western Proto-Indo-European sounded more or less before the division started to occur. Um, saying that there's no way of establishing it is wrong. This is factually incorrect. Um, if you mean establishing perfectly, it's like establishing the perfect record of the life of Alexander the Great. We cannot any more than one could establish the perfect record in every detail of anybody's life, even the person living that life. The idea of like, oh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You know. So it's a matter of deciding what's important and to say that some details, since they can't be known, that means the whole thing should be thrown out, is anti-academic. It's certainly anti-scientific. The significant material comes up to us comes to us in the form of inscriptions of the seventh century BC and on papyri a few centuries later. Mm -hmm. A material that evinces not the official historical spelling, often found in public inscriptions, but the popular, often uneducated people spelling that try to reproduce the sounds of the spoken language is the safest guide to the pronunciation of Greek antiquity. Absolutely, this is a very important thing. I first became uh, more intimately appreciative, acquainted with, and appreciative of this concept reading uh, Booth's paper. But it was evidence to me just reading Booth is that he didn't have the same kind of detailed linguistic knowledge as, say, Sidney Allen, for example, or others who have commented on this. So that's why it inspired me. Booth really inspired me like, hey, cool, cool, more developed system, way more, cl way closer to modern Greek. That's that's uh, really interesting. But if you're saying that's in the third century BC, you're way off base, man. That's clearly a, you know, a later um, Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire thing. Uh, the Boothian pronunciation, and it's certainly legitimate to use the convention at all, and maybe some people spoke it uh, exactly as he describes in certain places in certain time periods. Perfect legitimate convention, but that's all of these these folks, but I've been guilty of it too, by the way, are so intent upon pushing or placing their convention in the admired era. Ah, this is the time, uh, this is how it was pronounced when Jesus walk the earth, for example, first century AD, or this is how it was pronounced in the fifth century BC, or this is how Latin sounded in the first century BC. It's this inverted bias. Instead of taking the information, extracting from the thing that we loved and try to actually really scientifically determine it, it's imposing already existing subjective preferences. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having them, but imposing them on um, something where they don't belong. I have, for example, let me just give an example of what I mean by this. I have a pedagogical preference for the fricatives fathacha. And I like it a lot too, because again, I like those, I like, I love those sounds of modern Greek. I think they're really cool sound and having all six of them, it's just so cool to have in one language, especially one as pretty as modern Greek. Beautiful sounding language. So I like those. They're way easier to deal with. The Erasmian, meaning the generic kind of way that people have used an ancient Greek pronunciation in Italy, Germany, Spain, France, uh, UK, and the US, as well as other places for a few centuries, these Erasmian types usually use the fricative, at least some of them, even though most of them can't do it, do every one of them. So it would be great <laughs> to take something that already exists, the traditional Erasmian pronunciation or variants of it, and find something that is as similar to it as possible. So that's a motivation. I'm very open that I've described that as motivation. Does something like that exist at all? Is that legitimate? Booth, of course, de demonstrated that uh, he believes so. And of course, I've saw like, when do we get the first fricatives? And like, ah, we see the first uh, evidence of the uh, fricative pronunciation of phi as an F written as an F in Pompeii. And they're like, okay, that's right in this time period that I especially admire, which are um, is the classical Roman period, uh, first century BC to second century AD, right? So that's you know, it's, it's trying to choose some kind of time period as as uh, the basis, but giving a certain amount of latitude, right? So that's the idea. So, But I sought that out to try to find it. If it were unfindable uh, and thus unfounded <laughs> to use any frickers, which is what I used to say. I have an old video, the uh, the Chayre one or the Chayre one, as well as the, um, uh, there's another one of them, like uh, Carizo. There's a, a few where I, I talk about this and I rail against I didn't understand that Erasmian was a traditional pronunciation, unbeknownst to most people um, who use it. Erasmian is a traditional pronunciation of its of its own, and the pronunciation of epsilon iota as a, for example, instead of e or e. Even though that's an anti-historical thing, it's part of the tradition of Erasmian. So, you know, it's just a convention, and that's why it's the way it is. It's not because people failed and continue to fail reconstructing it, although that's in practice what has occurred and is still occurring. It's 
you have to just accept it as a tradition and its own merits. So anyway, the idea of wanting to push something and find something, you know, find the mistakes. You know, I if I were, for example, and I have gone through a thought experiment stage where I was like, okay, like reading some of my Karagunis, is this really possible? Do you really find these things? We find so much that contradicts these uh, uh, statements that ultimately it's an untenable idea. Although it's convenient for Greeks to pronounce ancient Greek just as modern Greek. It's a convenience. That's why it's a convention. And as far as uneducated people spelling, yeah, that can be helpful and effective. And Theodorson shows that. But I think what Theodorson does so well is he actually shows that there are at least two systems of phonology going on in the same city, in the same region of Greece at the same time. And thanks to all the inscriptional evidence, we have enough data, according to Theodorson, and I agree with his assessment that, yeah, you have two strata going on. They're interacting, they're affecting one another, and ultimately the uneducated one, if you will, or the vulgar one, uh, vulgar attic, is mostly extinguished. Um, but I spoke about that extensively in the other videos I talked about. So careful study of the evidence leads us to the following results. These letters are not in dispute. Well, actually, epsilon is. Theodorson shows us how epsilon was in fact E for a lot of speakers, perhaps the majority pronunciation in Athens during the classical period, while the more erudite, or at least a different group of people, if not more erudite, were pronouncing it as E. And eventually it opens to E in uh, the Koine period. And another one that Theodorson found is that xi, pronounced in the modern Greek way, is actually an artificial preservation because in the common speech of the uh, Attic people, it had already become a double s sound, but that it was retained by some speakers and thus restored. A similar thing happened with the sound of H in English. H was lost by most people, but it was then was restored later through education. Very interesting. There are a few, of course, dialects of English. Cockney is probably the most famous one that retain the loss of the h huh sound, or the h sound, which is natural to, uh, to the language. So they're pronounced by Greeks and Erasmians alike, and, or practically alike. Yep. The disputed letters are the consonants, the fricatives. So va, ra, da, za, tha, cha, and wait, for uh, the oh, the phi. Oh, you're saying the phi is undisputed. Oh, phi is not in is in, not in dispute. Well, that's wrong because of course it's it's one of the aspirates, so it should be pa. Uh, so ba da, ba ga da. Uh, zda is Alan's reconstruction, or dza, which would be most other speakers of Greek outside of Attica, and uh, ta and ka. And then the vowels of uh, eta, hypsilon, and omega. The diphthongs, italicized for some reason, as well as the aspiration and accents. The pronunciation of the disputed letters is as follows. The Greek pronunciation is indicated only approximately. As in all other languages, the sound quality can be learned only from native speakers. No. Two things wrong with that. Number one, sir. The Greek pronunciation ought to be indicated by the International Phonetic Alphabet. If you don't have a keyboard for it, do it by hand. It's the International Phonetic Alphabet to remove the very ambiguities that you're pre-apologizing for. And the other is that you can only, the, the sound quality can only learn from native speakers. What are you talking about? You can only learn the sounds of a language from, modern, from native speakers? That's ridiculous. All kinds of non-native speakers are able to guide people in the pronunciation of sounds. I've done it all the time, uh, specifically in the IPA videos. I might get anything wrong in those videos. I don't know if I did in particular, could have. And I'm sure I get things wrong all the time. So this notion that you can only learn from native speakers is incorrect. And to insist upon it is wrong. And of course, this idea is that ancient Greek, in his mind, is pronounced the same as modern Greek. Thus, you can only learn the ancient Greek pronunciation from modern Greek speakers who are native speakers. Of course, that's wrong, because <laughs> modern Greek speakers are not native speakers of ancient Greek. Here are the letters. Uh, Greek pronunciation, again, I, I highlight this because it's like, geez, it's so, it's not Orwellian. It's propagandistic, the Greek pronunciation, the modern Greek pronunciation. Here, I think it's interesting uh, that, you know, the English uh, as is an English yet, with and without the E sound heard between Y and A, he didn't know what he's talking about. I'm sure he pronounces English fine. But his description of it is so terrible. He makes the ancient grammarians look like linguistic experts. <laughs> this is awful. This is obscenely bad. The gamma has two pronunciations. Ra, and then palatalized in front of front vowels. Ye, ye. It's similar to ya, but it's not. 
it's um, a fricative instead of an approximate. So delta is the, and then he says uh, zebra. Of course, it's retracted. He doesn't mention this. I guess he's not aware of this important fact that Greek is regularly retracted in its siblings, za and sha. But hey, that's super technical. Za or zda, respectively. Now, this is interesting because he calls us Erasmian. Zda is something that Alan popularized um, through his study of inscriptions and epigraphy, which Garangudis claims he didn't do. It's pretty clear that there must be a pronunciation that is close to zda for the letter of, of zid. And I say that because I'm very unwilling to fully accept that in some respects because it's so contrary to the etymology and it's such a weird thing for this metathesis of an African to have occurred. But um, I give the benefit of the doubt, certainly for this discussion, but he calls this Erasmian. It's not. Some people um, have uh, been using lately, the past 10 years or more, pronunciation, a pronunciation that Polis Institute has been using. I love the Polis Institute and Christoph Rieger is just a Wonderful, wonderful guy. He's a great uh, educator. And he came up uh, with a, a variant of Erasmian, which is virtually identical to the usual Erasmian pronunciations. But he liked this zda, which is typical of at least some, if not the majority of the conservative speakers of classical Attic, but puts in a pronunciation where, you know, it's just otherwise the other Erasmian things where, you know, lots of imbalances in the Erasmian system. Uh, and A is still in um, the, the Polis Institute's uh, usual pronunciation. I don't know. I think one can do better than that. So a lot of people who used to be pure Erasmian, even though that's not a thing, who used to use the Erasmian pronunciation of their land have been doing this now because there's been so many wonderful Greek speakers, uh, of ancient Greek, I mean, these days. And they've been, they've learned from Polis, they learned from people who learned at Polis. And so this zda thing has entered in. And it's interesting because this is the least, probably the least important and least, um, it's between the differences of the reconstructed classical Attic pronunciation. There he is and Erasmian, this is the least important thing to get right that's wrong about Erasmian. So it's like, especially since it's the least certain, in my opinion, of the things. I have no problem with it as a reconstruction uh, for classical Attic, but it's the least good. To say that this is Erasmian, I guess, if you want to call the Polis Institute's pronunciation Erasmian, but I don't think that's what he means. I think he means that Erasmian is the same as Alan's reconstruction, which it's not. All right, theta, chi, and Erasmian, he says that Erasmian people do ta and ka. Well, which Erasmians? If they're Italians, yeah. If they're English speakers, no, they'll do tha for theta. And they might they'll probably use ka, but Germans will use the ha. So it's like he he didn't know what he's talking about. He's not spe specifying the Erasmian to these countries. He talked about it as a problem, but then didn't further specify it. So unless he means the aspirated one of ta and ka, but I doubt it because he already said that phi is the fa sound for Erasmians. Um, it is, of course, e, upsilon is e. Uh, so this is a or u or u. Oh, yeah, this one really bothers me. Italians learn this as u. Awful, nauseating ridiculous. Please, Italian, stop pronouncing y or hy as you. So, for example, uh, yukos, wolf. It's not yukos. That's a diphthong of a sort of you. It's not sound you, it's y. It's like French or German. Please learn it. Please fix that. So, is that Erasmian? Or is that just them getting it wrong because they don't know any better? They'll call it Erasmian. I'll call it plain wrong and against the theory. And so forth and so on. You probably know a lot of these differences. Instead of the question of pronunciation, he says some things are important, like the pre-Phoenician alphabet, not necessarily, the alphabet that was ratified and adopted in 403, which is the standard ancient Greek writing system. But he mentions that Greeks continue to be spelled in the pre-Ionic, pre the old Attic alphabet way, which is different in certain characteristics. For example, the epsilon iota e and the eta e and epsilon e were all spelled with the same, what we would call a letter e in English. And that is a problem because those are three different, very different vowel phonemes, and they're pronounced differently. So the uh, he notes correctly that we still see non-ionic like spellings. That is the the non-Euclidean spelling system for a couple centuries until finally the new Attic standard spelling becomes dominant, and in some cases in Byzantine times. So we have two systems being used together: the old official system. And then the, the new one, the new spelling, uh, which better expressed the actual sounds of the language, found mostly in inscriptions of, in a private character, 
but not seldom also in public inscriptions as well as papyri. So what's really happening is starting in the 6th century, due to the prestige of Ionic, in Attica we see Ionic-type spelling. So you'll see um, strange things. You have a word with uh, both the aspiration and an eta in it. And what's a good example? Uh, we'll, we'll definitely see some uh, later, but we'll see the spelling of um, the, the aspiration with what looks like a capital, eta. That is, it's an H sound because the old Attic used the same letter that we use today for H in English, Latin, etc. For ha. And, uh, but then they started using the ionic, ionic way of using that same letter for a long a eh sound. And that's what leads to confusion. That happens. It's not abnormal to use the same letter for two different things. Look at again at the zeta of uh, Italian zeta, which ha can be tsa or za. It's one letter used for two different things. That happens. It's important to bear this in mind constantly. I agree. Uh, but he's going to, of course, use this as a way to justify his proposal. The argumentation here can become quite involved and complex. However, a loose statement will be attempted here, focusing on the spelling of the various sounds, the exchange of one letter for another, uh, etc. Prior to the adoption of the Ionic alphabet, 5th century BC, what well, was adopted officially in the late 5th century, but it was already in aspects of it were in use consistently or not prior to that. The letter epsilon representing the sounds which later later came to be represented as epsilon, eta, and of course the digraph epsilon, iota. While the letter O uh, represents uh, the sounds later represented by omicron, omega, and omicron, epsilon. Absolutely right. So these pr were pronounced respectively O, A, O. This is the closed long version of this O. And that eventually closes to O. With regard to the consonants, the later monograph phi was during the same period represented by the digraph of a letter pi with the letter eta, because eta was, of course, heta. Uh, it's represented the H sound in the Attic alphabet, so pa. And the monograph of chi uh, represented by the digraph of kappa heta, so yeah, k. And the monograph of xi, uh, of psi, it was represented by the digraph of kappa sigma x, absolutely. And also, for frequently, we see the ps and x being represented with the aspirate equivalent of it. it was very interesting it tells us some interesting things about the acoustic interpretation here's the other one of ps. um very very interesting that they would use the aspirate there uh it's uh indicative of um some interesting things that well it doesn't it doesn't cover in this paper so in any case uh we'll talk about it another time and the monograph of theta was apparently represented by the digraph of ta apparently these alternative spellings continued to the third century bc and later absolutely why, it's future Luke here, yet again, from the editing bay. Now, reading that line, where he says that the archaic spelling of T-H, uh, P-H, K-H, uh, respectively, of course, using the, the Greek letters, for the aspirates was something that had continued until the 3rd century BC, I realized, wait a minute, that, that kind of sounds fishy. Let me look into some of my other books. Now, we see here in Sturdivant, the early alphabet of Thera lacked the letters of phi and chi and employed instead uh, the uh, this ph and kh and also the the um, uh, kof plus the h sound symbol. And here are some examples of that. And I thought, oh, well, wait a minute, that's interesting. Let's look then at all of the archaic alphabets. And this page, uh, like all the other things, will be in the description so you can look at it yourself. But here we see that we indeed have Pi, eta, and kappa, eta, though not theta, representing the aspirates for pa and k. And why? Because theta was already ta in the Phoenician alphabet originally, and thus it was ta also in all the Greek alphabets. And here are the broad groups of them. So the southern or green type, this one didn't have pa or k. It didn't have letters for those aspirates, necessitating the representation with pi, eta, and kappa, eta. The ones that are represented, of course, in the Euclidean alphabet by letter phi and letter chi, right? But the old Attic alphabet did have p and k. Indeed, the aspirates p, k, and t were represented like that. Old Attic has those letters. So is Garagunis talking about some mix of alphabets again, and therefore giving us the wrong impression deliberately? Likewise, the clusters of ps and ksa are simply represented as, uh, as these two symbols. And this 
also occurs in the Old Attic alphabet, which we can see here. Indeed, the Old Attic alphabet did something particular, using chi sigma for x and phi sigma for ps. It's a very interesting kind of digraph. Did this mean there was some different pronunciation that these letters are representing for us? Were they more aspirated somehow than in other Greek dialects? Was it more ks and ps? Or was it simply that the sound of the sibling of the s gave a sense that made it feel similar to the, the rough breathing inherent to the aspirates, and that's why they use them? That's not clear, but the point is that these are the characteristics of the old Attic alphabet. Of course, just one letter for um, e, e, and e, o, o, and o. Those are clear to us. But in Karagounis' article, he gets this wrong again, saying that Attic was written with pi, eta, and kappa, eta, and even tau, eta, for the aspirates until the 3rd century BC. Well, the tau, eta, I don't know if that was true. I haven't seen any evidence of that outside of his claim for it. But the first two, pi, eta, and kappa, eta, or eta, are characteristic of the Therian, Cretan, uh, and also in Melos, in these southern or green alphabets. This was reminiscent of something else that he will do, claiming that the old spelling of the diphthong alpha iota was alpha epsilon. It's not true. That was a spelling in Boeotia. It wasn't the spelling in Attica. So in both of these situations, he either deliberately is being false, or I think more likely he's drawing from sources that are giving an incomplete or incorrect picture. For example, a source that he might deem reliable, like Yanaris, that we've already demonstrated to be filled with errors, or he simply misremembers the information. The letter eta originally had been used for aspiration. Eta. The letter was said to have been cloven into two, so left half you get the spiritus asper, you may already know this, and then the right half was for the spiritus lanis, that's the origin of it. Now, the reason, of course, for this is that the Ionic alphabet, which had such prestige, it was psilotic. Um, it didn't have aspiration. It was smooth, psilotic, psilos. For that reason, the Athenians wanted to imitate that alphabet, and it was becoming really popular anyway, and so they went about the, the system that we uh, understand and appreciate. Thus, until the 5th century BC, Attic had only five vowels. A, E, I, O, E? <laughs> How should we pronounce this? Or do you mean U? For the five basic sounds of the Greek language ever since, A, E, I, O, U. Well, this is, of course, wrong, as if you've seen many of my videos, you know that's wrong about ever since. It's also wrong for the time period. And it shows the uh, ancient and even sometimes modern among more ignorant folks that uh, letters and sounds are the same thing. Ignorant in the sense that they just don't know. You know, I'm not trying to, to pick or make fun, but this is wrong. <laughs> this is so clear, really demonstrably, obviously wrong. Um, especially since the sound of U survives into Roman times because Roman grammarians say, oh, Greeks can't pronounce the sound of U without doing it at the digraph Omicron Upsilon. I mean, this is well established. Anyway, and he says, oh, well, oh, there's just five letters for the vowel sounds, therefore there's only five vowel sounds. I mean, same is true of English, right? We have 26 vowel phonemes, and we only have the same basic letters. So, The signs of eta and omega not having taken the place of any other signs, nor representing existing sounds, appear to have been adopted originally in the 5th century C as a mere technical compensatory marks for epsilon and omicron, respectively, in accented and therefore length and position. Lots to unpack here. Okay. So this guy has no idea how a language with phonemic vowel length works at all. He's completely, shockingly ignorant. The most important part of ancient Greek phonology is the phonemic vowel length. It creates the whole structure of the language. It's how, it's how, what makes ancient Greek Greek. It's what, it's what makes the verse work. It makes everything work. Uh, even There's even this wonderful paper by Koromo, and she demonstrates how people in as late as the second century AD, people who speak a better Attic pronunciation of the day, second century Attic, who do all the correct phonemic vowel length, make fun of people who can't, who come from Asia Minor. <laughs> like this is, uh, obviously people were losing phonemic vowel length um, gradually through the, uh, the centuries in different places, but it wasn't a universal thing until later. So 
anyway, it's just so shocking that, that we have all this testimony from ancient peoples about the phonemic vowel length and how important it is. And he just has no clue because he thinks, first of all, that eta and omega do not represent existing native sounds in Attic, which is wrong. Um, and that, they, uh, that they're just a technical compensatory marks for the long version of e and o. How do they get long? Well, they weren't natively long. That, that never existed, ever, <laughs> according to Garangunis, at least in Attic. Um, but that they were accented, and that when you accent a vowel, you make it long. Now, that can happen. Italian does that. Modern Greek even does that to an extent. But not ancient Greek. All, like, there's, how many long vowels are there everywhere? How many unaccented etas and omegas can you think of that are long? If you know Greek at all, you'd be able to find an infinite number. Finally, however, they came to be regarded as long vowels. What? So he's saying phonemic vowel length doesn't exist in Attic of the 5th century. That whatever eta and omega represent is not native to it because the actual native sound was just an o and an e or e or whatever they think it's representing. But they came to be, but they, the language was forcibly changed by the adoption of letters so that people were regarding them as long duration vowels. This length was apparently due to the antectasis, the lengthening of vowel sound because of the dropping of the consonant, which thus disturbs the rhythm. He doesn't really understand this term rhythm, but he's describing compensatory lengthening. That's the linguistic term for this, compensatory lengthening. A good example is something like legusi. Legusi is in more archaic Greek that would eventually become Attic is legonti. Sounds like legunt in Latin, doesn't it? Legonti. Now, this D sound with that little E at the end ends up getting an aspirated like uh, character and eventually becomes palatalized. So, legonti, 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 legonti. It becomes a tsa sound, legonti. This happens in languages all the time. Uh, so, legonti, legonti. Now, because it's becoming this tsa, it then transforms into sa. Legonsi, legon, legonsi, with a nasa, legonsi. Regularly, from uh, archaic Greek into classical Greek, nu plus sigma goes away. It becomes the nasalization of the preceding vowel. So, legonsi, legonsi. It's the same exact thing happens in Latin. Hence, um, confero, with a long o. I don't pronounce the n. Confero, it's confero. Right? This is another example of that exact phenomenon. Or uh, conservo, conservo, not conservo. That would be um, a spelling pronunciation. Conservo instead. With that nasally con sound. Conservo. Um, then uh, we have, uh, so we have legoncy. Then the nasalization eventually vanishes completely. Happens all the time in languages. So just legoncy, legoncy. And it's a long oo sound. And later at some stage, either during classical attic or after. It goes from legusi to legusi. That's an example of what he's talking about. The loss of a consonant leads to the compensatory lengthening of the vowel. Or ictus, the stress placed on the syllable chosen to carry the beat of rhythm in verse. More or less an accurate description. In distinction to the natural accent or stress of a word. But he doesn't understand what it is. Um, no, it's actually, I'm sorry, that's totally wrong. Because he thinks ictus is stress. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. I have so many videos that explain this in detail on the main Polymathy channel. If you don't understand what ictus is, please watch those. I know there's a lot of them. I know they're long, but you're watching this much, so please watch those. You'll understand what ictus actually is. It's not stress. A common mistake made by Erasmians, too, as much as the uh, modern Greek pronunciation fans. The meaning of ictus, in short, which he actually goes on to describe kind of well later, essentially just where you're tapping your foot, like the meter of any song, like... Um, and then while I'm away, I'll ride home every day. That's the ictus that you're hearing. Yotakismus mm. feet io. Right, so that's uh, that's ictus. Often on the first part of the foot, but not necessarily. There are all kinds of different um, variations, not necessarily the first part of a foot. But it is certainly in hexameter, which is one of the most common and easiest to understand ultimately. And this is really crazy. It is natural for Greek to pronounce all vowels isochronously. I think it means isochronically. That's how I would say it. Uh, equally long. This is a linguistic term. Um, isochrony is a term that describes languages that are syllable-timed. Mora-timed, stress-timed, and syllable-timed are three broad groups. Modern Greek 
is a syllable timed language. So is Spanish, Italian to an extent. Stress timed languages include German and modern English, most dialects of them for sure. And Mora timed languages include Finnish, Japanese, Latin, and ancient Greek. They're Mora timed, they're not isochronic. What this means is that what is the sense of the r rhythm, if you will, uh, meaning the sense of repeating patterns in the language? The notion is that. In an arbitrary unit of time, it could be one second, for example, how many syllables do you expect to hear as the native speaker of a syllable-timed language? And it's, it could be one second, five seconds, ten seconds of speech. And this is something that's been measured and studied, and it seems to be a pretty legit, as they say in the biz, theory uh, to describe a rhythmical aspect of language, because languages can be timed in different ways. For example, I'll read a bit of this English language text here, uh, adopted originally 5th century BC as a mere technical compensatory mark. Okay, so that's that's the the sense that English has. Now, what's interesting about stress timed languages? Another one, by the way, would be the Neapolitan language, called a dialect of Italian, but it's a um, a dialect of Latin, uh, more accurately, a different language. Therefore, a Neapolitan, as Stefano Vittori pointed out to me, Neapolitan, differently from standard Italian, is more uh, is definitely stress timed, and we recognize that to be very, very clear in Neapolitan because it shares something in common with English, which is syllables that aren't stressed, or rather vowels that aren't stressed, tend to become schwas. We do the same thing in English. We don't say other vowel signs nor representing existing sounds appear to have been adopted originally or re or region or regionally originally. Uh, we tend to make most of the unstressed vowels become closer to schwa into an uh sound, or we reduce them in some respects. So um, other vowel signs, uh, nor rep, so then we have representing, existing, so existing sounds appear to have been adopted, so not um, adopted, not adopted or adopted or something, but adopted. And not originally, but originally. So we have usually the schwa is the most important vowel in English, and it's not something that's in all languages naturally. So getting it right and in the patterns of native English speakers is difficult. And it's something that characterizes most foreign accents the lack of hearing them where they belong for certain. Um, that's something that makes English uh, rather challenging to master phonetically. Um, no problem with that. It's just sort of a fact. And that's a typical of a stress-timed language, doing this schwa reduction thing. Um, the, since I can kind of do an Italian accent in English to give you an idea. The signs of eta and omega not having taken place of any other, other vowel signs. You know, so that kind of thing. It's just ridiculous sort of stereotypical accent. But they don't have schwa. Um, vowel, they don't have the schwa vowel in Italian, and thus an Italian speaker who hasn't mastered that sound will end up pronouncing the vowels according to the five vowels, excuse me, seven vowel qualities that exist natively in uh, Italian, in stressed syllables at least. So, Moraic languages, or Mora timed languages, like Japanese, Finnish, Croatian, Hungarian, the repeating element that is expected to be heard by the native speaker and as part of their rhythm is the interchange of um, of the units of syllables. Most Moraic languages, Latin and Ancient Greek, Japanese, most Moraic languages, Moray, those are the elements that occupy time. And that is how, because these are timed languages, right? They're all timed languages. They're syllable timed, they're stress timed, or they're Mora timed. And Mora timed languages, it's the regular observance of these lengths. That's what is the building block of the words and of the whole language. And here is the big point you cannot truly, actually understand Latin or ancient Greek without understanding this concept, that um, they are not syllable timed or stress timed, they are mora timed. And if you don't understand that, you're just going to miss something truly the most essential part of the language. You can get a lot out of them. You can learn a lot from the ancient writers. You can even communicate in them. But that is the aspect of phonology which covers everything. It covers ev which covers everything, especially, of course, the morphology, the, morpho the morphology and the grammar, and therefore the poetry. Um, so anyway, he's wrong. Modern Greek is isochronic. 
um, or syllable timed. Ancient Greek is not. Thus, in Attic inscriptions from the early 6th century BC on, epsilon occurs as uh, these variants. We see omega going into those uh, variants. Constant confusion, absolutely. Uh, constant confusion with the E sounds, but hardly ever, he notes, between this omicron upsilon and then the um, uh, the other two uh, O sounds, because the quality is changed. These two are confused, these aren't, and Theodorson shows us how omega with the iota subscript, that becomes a distinct O sound, most likely, whereas omega becomes O, closed, because they are almost never confused. Theodorson's uh, 1978 work is great for that. But you already saw that video, right? Following 403 BC, eta took the place of the epsilon, which appeared as long in verse because of ictus. What nonsense, what utter offensive nonsense, and which in other dialects had been represented by eta. This eta, which was now adopted for technical purposes, was popularly used for uh, the epsilon iota, which at this time was pronounced as e. So he, he's made a series of assumptions which are false. He doesn't know that, apparently. Uh, even though they're obviously false. The first is that there is no phonemic vowel length in Attic Greek. The second is that the adoption of eta, in this case, is merely an artificial thing to make it long for poetry or something. It has nothing to do with the actual Attic language. And because of that, well, we also see interchanges in spelling, this is true, of the epsilon iota sound in the eta. His interpretation, since epsilon iota, he has identified in spelling errors to be the same as iota. Well, that means eta must also have been pronounced as iota. Of course, this is... Um, ridiculous chain of logic, but um, he happens to be right about some speakers doing this. The logic is, is wrong, but some speakers, according to Theodorson, and how they're confusing certain things, some Attic speakers, if not a majority, were pronouncing eta as e, epsilon iota as e, and iota, of course, as e. But that's what we're calling the vulgar subsystem of classical Attic, whereas, of course, the classical Attic, which that is normally restored, like uh, Sidney Allen's reconstruction, so this is E, this is A, and this is E. And that's correct. That's correct for the Classical Attic period, and is also correct for after the Classical Attic period, as demonstrated by Latin transcription. A diphthong consists of two vowels. Yeah, that's pretty much right. It's also worth mentioning that diphthong in the ancient sense is used for any digraph. It's um, phthongos or ptongos in... Greek, ancient Greek, of course, uh, means sound, and the is two, so two sounds. We use it in modern linguistics, as he's saying here. It consists of two vowels. It's worth mentioning that because you'll find ancient grammarians that describe um, omicron upsilon as a diphthong. But they'll also describe, uh, I put together a good example of, of two letters written together, putting any two letters together as being a diphthong even though they have a what we consider in modern linguistics to be a monophthongal pronunciation. A diphthong is a combination, is it's two vowels in the same syllable. And that's really essential. Not two vowels, two vowels in the same syllable. Otherwise, it's not a diphthong. It's just a sequence of vowels. Uh, Japanese, for example, doesn't have diphthongs. Uh, the, it can create the sound of diphthongs or the appearance of diphthongs like um, ikitai, I want to go. For example, ikitai, it's that tai. However, the way that the language works structurally is that actually that tai, even though it sounds like a diphthong, it's morally divided into two parts. Um, and it's, that just, that's how the, the structure of the language works. That doesn't technically have diphthongs. It doesn't consider tai to be in the same um, syllable. This is important because some languages consider certain things to be diphthongs and others not. Eu, for example, that's diphthong in Latin and ancient Greek. Eu. But not in English. We don't have it. We say eu, and it's difficult for us because we don't quite have um, well, either of those sounds in, a, in their pure, if you will, form, and their non-diphthongized form. So diphthong is a, you have a glide, so you have au, eu, ai, oi, for example. Those are diphthongs that are more or less in common between um, Greek, ancient Greek, and English. Owing to the paucity of contraction in the Homeric epics and other early works, such diphthongs, insofar as they were original to that period, ought to have had a pronunciation whereby both vowels were sounded. In classical times, however, when contraction had been fully developed, they were pronounced monophthongally as in one sound. His knowledge of this, of the terminology, and of the subject matter, is so poor that like everything is wrong about this. It's factually wrong. Um, that's not necessarily where diphthongs come from, depends. Uh, and this, insisting that 
by classical times, it wasn't the case anymore. You know, you have evidence for this? That's convincing? He doesn't. This is seen from the many examples uh, in which Iota replaces Epsilon Iota since the 6th century. Absolutely true. Again, this is the, um, well, depends, you know, Delphi Chems and so forth. Boeotian was already doing this. Boeotian is a different dialect of Greek. It's not Attic. Has some things in common with it, but Boeotian ends up developing, if you will, towards something like modern Greek earlier than Attic or Koine. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but Boeotian also does uh, things very differently from the vulgar Attic subdialect. Some things in common, like uh, some Ioticism, this one in particular, but not all of them. I don't believe there's any reason to believe that um, Boeotian Ioticized the epsilon into E, as happened in the vulgar Attic subdialect, according to Theodorson. Uh, so the um, but there is evidence for these kinds of interchanges in plenty uh, during the classical period. Theodorson looked at that in great detail. But of course, if we're talking about after 146 BC, yeah, I mean, the Ioticism of Epsilon Iota, that's why I named like the word for peace, Irene, also a name used uh, in ancient Roman times. I think Pliny mentions that in Irene, spelled with an I, just as it is in the modern, say, Italian language, uh, because it's just a long E sound, as well as, gosh, so many other examples. Posidonia, there's another one, where when a diphthong stands under a long note, a long, long note, it is not dissolved in its constituent parts, but is repeated in whole as if it were a simple vowel. Okay, so here's one of the Delphic hymns. Here is a representation of that. Not crazy about the pronunciation, but the sheet music is right, and the note lengths are, of course, right. So let's hear how she does this. Right, so beautiful, really cool. Again, pronunciation. Um, we can the thing that we can hear very clearly is how I. It's on one note, eu on one note. So the diphthongs are, in fact, treated as long syllables. Very interesting, as are the other long vowels frequently they have that, that character. Now, a lot can be analyzed about phonology, thanks to this. But the key here is that he is saying, because this is ai, a long vowel on one note, that means that it must be a monophthong. I mean, you have to be so willingly ignorant and ignorant of music to believe such a thing. And then while I'm away, I'll write home every day. So welcome to the English language. We have diphthongs. Diphthongs, two vowel sounds, to the pure, if you will, vowel sounds in IPA terms, on one syllable. And each of the syllables here, for the most part, is getting one note in the Beatles song. Um, and then while, that's a diphthong, on one note, while, I'm, one syllable, away, well, that did terribly, but way, again, one note, one syllable, but a diphthong. And then while I'm away, I'll write home, another one, home, on one note, home every day, but day does get two. That's interesting that you have that extended sometimes. Vowels or diphthongs, whatever they are, syllables that end up being longer in spoken language, I think day can qualify here, often can get more than one note, they can get extended. Not necessarily, but it ends up being uh, true more often than it's not. And of course, it's self-evident in the actual sheet music of antiquity and of other languages that do exactly this sort of thing. So in any case, um, like how he knows English so well, but he didn't bother to compare this hypothesis, this notion, this idea, with reality to see if it were the least bit right, and it's wrong. Uh, this is seen from the many examples of the uh, Delphic hymn, uh, where the uh, diphthong stands under a long note. It is not dissolved in its constituent parts, but is separated in a whole as if it were a simple vowel. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I just demonstrated it with a modern song from the 20th century in English. It's also not truly for the sheet music that he's talking about. He's just totally wrong. And when people point to this article as some kind of evidence, it's like, this is why most people who are serious about this don't even bother with this article, because there's so much is wrong about it um, that, you know, it's like dealing with a flat earther, which I've done before. Very interesting experience. You know, if someone is truly convinced of something, no matter how wrong it is, it's difficult to 
I don't know, it's just difficult for me. <laughs> Maybe you have a similar experience. Let me know in the comments. The pronunciation of diphthongs must take account of the accent. The basic rule of trisyllabotony, uh, so tone, trisyllable tone, uh, that is that Greek words receive the accent on any anyone, should be, but that's okay, as English is great, of the last three syllables, had as its effect that the accent was placed either on the first or second vowel of a diphthong. No, that's not why they're there. <laughs> that's just so wrong. It's so stupidly wrong. You can put the accent on a diphthong anywhere you want. Many Western languages have taken to put accents when they do put them on um, diphthongs, which is pretty rare, uh, but it does occasionally occur in, say, Italian and Spanish. Uh, they put them on the first of the two components. Ancient Greek tends to put them on the second. That doesn't prove anything at all. It's just a convention, because since the diphthong is in fact one syllabic unit, and the syllable is the thing that's receiving the accent, or stress, if it's a pitch accent or a stress accent, doesn't matter, it's a syllable thing. It doesn't matter where you put it. In fact, in the actual ancient inscriptions, I was just uh, admiring these in the, uh, the Skolomo paper, we see uh, all kinds of interesting accents and things put it over both of the vowels in a thing. For example, here, this paper is all about how people in these amazing documents were writing the macrons, the long vowels, in ancient Greek. But this wasn't poetry, it's Demosthenes and prose writing. And the reason was to make sure that the people learning this, maybe they were native Greek speakers, but they didn't have the proper Attic accent of the day, the proper Attic accent of the day, including as far as the second century AD retained phonemic vowel length. Native Greek, Greek speakers are probably losing that. Or maybe Latin speakers were using these documents to learn from, we don't know. They were trying to understand the correct phonemic vowel length. But look how they're written over both. This is supposed to be the long AI, or the long diphthong, right? Uh, interesting, even people doing this in letters, private letters. Here's that example. And also accents that are going over. It's difficult to do in the typing, but if you look at them, you can see that they're actually over both letters sometime. And here, for example, we see that the accent of the vowel is put over the following consonant because there wasn't room because of the short mark that was going over the short vowel. So it's a convention. It is just a convention. It doesn't tell you anything about the pronunciation of the diphthongs. In fact, it's more rational, frankly, because since it's one unit, why not put it over the last element of the unit? Uh, so modern Greeks have taken this to prove uh, that their pronunciation is the ancient one, and it's wrong. Those diphthongs that were accented on the first vowel became spurious, meaning not real diphthongs. Uh, and he means the long, the long diphthongs, ai, ai, oi. Uh, originally written ai. Oh yeah, he ta talks about this. I think he's going to talk about it uh, later, but he's, of course, wrong. He says that ai was originally spelled ai. In Boeotian, yes. He's wrong about that otherwise, but I don't know. Is it willful ignorance? Uh, later uh, becoming, later becoming this, or, or later, later became to be spelled this way. They didn't become that. They were, if you will, always like that, at least in the time period in question. With the second vowel losing its sound and being reduced first to the iota ad scriptum, and then later to the uh, subscriptum, the what? The Otis subscript and adscript being reduced to it? It wasn't reduced. It was just written after it. Um, it's not reduction. It was simply the iota, iota being written next to it. And we just saw some examples of it. These are, you know, second century, some of these examples of uh, on papyri. And yeah, look at that. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's adscripted. The subscript thing was, of course, a Byzantine thing, which I believe he mentions here. Those diphthongs that were extended on the second vowel were pronounced monophthongally, meaning the uh, short ai. Uh, ee was, of course, always monophthongal in classical Attic, and I've demonstrated that many times, as was the omicron upsilon as u, and then later as u. Thus, pronunciation of alpha iota tended towards and finally became identical to that of e, and then these all became iotacized towards e. The sound of u can be represented as as this. This is why it's this. Why can't you use IPA? Thankfully, I know what you mean. This process, as the evidence of the inscriptions indicates, was for the most part initiated already in pre classical antiquity in certain dialects of Greek and in the vulgar subdialect, the innovative subdialect, as it's called, as Theodorson demonstrates. Absolutely. That's again why I wanted to see the Theodorson thing first on this channel and show you that, yeah, there was all kinds of interesting. Uh, weird things, maybe even more popular things that were very innovative going on in classical Attic, at least in the period, and in uh, the spoken language 
but there was, of course, always at the same time the restored classical pronunciation. Ah, here it is. Originally, the diphthong alpha iota was written as alpha epsilon. I've never seen this specifically originally was written this way anywhere but here. I believe he makes this assumption without having any evidence mentioned for it, because in Boeotian, it's like that. Here's where this is noted. This is the page Appendix Ancient Greek Dialect Declension. The diphthong ai was spelled I or I in the earliest Boeotian inscriptions, the latter being especially common in the city of Tanagra, which is great, just like from that Star Trek The Next Generation episode. Domoc Angela at Tanagra. It's fantastic. I didn't know Tanagra was a real place before I, I saw this. I should have known, though. It's a, obviously a somewhat famous town in Greece. So the latter, the I, is coming at Tanagra, but became a long open monophthong, and with the introduction of the Anic alphabet, it was regularly spelled E. This is really critical. The Ionic alphabet, we call it, maybe we could call it the new Attic Ionic alphabet, the Euclidean spelling system. That comes into being in 403 BC, and it gets to be um, very popular. Inscriptions of Boeotian in the 4th century use the Neo-Attic spelling system, the Euclidean system, but they spell stuff differently. Every time there's an I, it's represented as this eta letter, as A. Why would they do that? Because in Boeotian, it was pronounced as E. Alpha iota would be the wrong way to spell E. Alpha iota was pronounced I in Attic in the 4th century. But in Boeotian, similar words, for example, here's the dative singular. In Attic, it was I. But in Boeotian, it was spelled I and then E. Also the nominative plural also written as e in Boeotian, by regular sound change. So this is how we understand this about the, the language. Ice was also ice, the letter s in Boeotian. This is great. It just clarifies everything. The Boeotian stands in its inscriptions as undeniable testimony that Alpha Iota's intended pronunciation in Attic of the 4th century is ai. Absolutely. The vulgar subdialect seems to demonstrate monophthongization into e, much as Boeotian. I think uh, Theodorson's evidence is uh, conclusive that there existed such a phonology, but it wasn't the main one. <laughs> it wasn't the standard one. And so, um, anyway, he's, again, wrong about this. This was changed to uh, alpha iota with an, by analogy. Really? Um, did you make that up? Where's your evidence? Not saying you're wrong, but I'd love to see where you got that from. Haven't seen that. I, I thought I'd seen this elsewhere. I looked all through Wolkskadaika and Horrocks and other places, and this originally spelled as Alpha Epsilon instead of Alpha Iota. I've only seen this here, to my knowledge. And also, here, which again, we'll talk about this in the future, but he references Karangunis, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway... However, because of its original composition as a e, it did not acquire the sound of e as did the other diphthongs, but retained its original pronunciation of e. That's nuts. So because, wow, you just have to go through so many hoops of a logical misapprehension um, to get to this conclusion. It's pronounced e in say modern Greek because ai becomes e. Even that tai in Japanese, like ikitai, I want to go. But in the the vulgar language, if you will, in the uh, in the slang or in the in the colloquial language, you can say ikite. I want to go. It's like one instead of want to. It's a simplification of the sound i into e. This happens in languages all the time. Oh yeah, it happened in Latin too. It doesn't have to represent an original sound. It's gosh. The two diphthongs au and eu have fared differently. The original uh, alpha upsilon, he says, in fact, was au, and this was eu. Great. Where the accent was on the first element, thus. Ah, uh, ooh, a, ooh, it's so weird the way he's spelling this. Um, becoming au, a, ooh, gradually led to the consonant, consonantization, uh, consonantization with an n, I think is what he means, of the upsilon. And this finally took the sound of v before a vowel or a sounded consonant. I mean, a voiced consonant, not a sounded consonant, but a voiced consonant. And the sound of f before a hard consonant. The linguistic terms for these are Voiced consonants and voiceless consonants. Hard consonant. What's a, what makes it hard? 
this are, these are terrible non-linguistic terms. The labialization, the pronunciation with the lips, i.e. as consonants of these diphthongs, is what, what he means is a labiodental fricative. A fricative. The fricativization of the vowel sound into ev and av. Or f and af. Gosh. And then eve, of course, for this one. Gosh, so embarrassing. I would be so embarrassed if I had something out like this. Because, well, I... I don't know, I wouldn't write something like this. But he's so clearly wrong and is stuck to his guns, for better or worse, mostly worse because it demonstrates at least as late as 2007 when that other paper, or a short thing he wrote, he still doesn't understand any of this. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Criteria for determining the pronunciation of Greek. To determine the pronunciation of the various letters, evidence has usually been drawn from four areas. A, indirect statements of ancient authors, such as word plays, cries of animals. B, the inscriptions of papyri. C, comparative philology, in particular transcriptions from and to other languages, chiefly Latin, absolutely. And D, modern phonetic theory. Okay, I mean linguistic or phon theory? Okay, phonetic theory, it's fine. Early Erasmians... <laughs> used all four types of evidence, but did not succeed in establishing a credible case because the material proved to be intractable. Well, he's wrong. This is like, it's like archaeology for language, you know? You take bits of evidence and you put it together. And yes, it's credible. It's not credible to you because you, Kyrie Karaguni, believe that the only thing credible is that Greek should sound like modern Greek, even if it's ancient Greek, which is a different language, you know? It's, it's not... It's, it's so bonkers. Um, more recent Erasmians avoid the inscriptions. Not true. I have so much about it, as does Allen, as does Sturdivant, as does Horrocks. They all talk about this in detail, particularly the other ones. No. No. We look at them all the time. The primary evidence for the pronunciation of Greek and, and seek instead to establish the pronunciation of Greek chiefly by phonetic speculation and comparative philology. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. Uh, it's, it's so interesting because he clearly read at least parts of Vox Karaika, but he didn't do it with understanding because he doesn't understand basic linguistics, much less phonology. So he can't, I don't know, it's like trying to s tell someone who s believes the earth is the center of the universe, who has a really rational model for that, such as in the Ptolemaic system, that, th no, the sun's the center, like Copernicus did. But think of all the, um, that was intractable practically for Copernicus and Galileo to say, no, look, we have the evidence. It's right there. No, this goes against, you know, this and that. And here's this other system which explains it better because it's like the traditional way of doing things. I don't know, just nonsense. So all kinds of languages are used in an effort to determine the pronunciation of classical Greek. But strangely enough, Byzantine and Minor Greek are almost completely left out of account. This is not true. In fact, I go out of my way in my videos talking about Greek phonology, usually to start with the modern Greek letter and its pronunciation in modern Greek. Um, there's two reasons I do that. One, because that's eh, a decent place to start. It's certainly where, I'll... <laughs> it's where like he starts, where Alan starts, and Sturdivant starts, and Horrocks. They all, it's where so many of uh, of them start, and they always talk about it too, because it's important to understand the difference. It's legitimate to mention. I also like to mention it because I like to let Greeks know, hey, I understand it's this way in modern Greek. It's not that I'm doing it wrong because I'm ignorant or something. It's, you know, and I hope I've helped to um, engage some uh, speakers of modern Greek a little bit that way so that they understand there's something different going on here. Even though ancient Greek and modern Greek share the same name, they aren't identical. So, and with the exclamation point, this is so unprofessional, and he's wrong. Like, if you read Vox Graica, he's almost completely left out. It's like, this is nonsense. He talks about these all the time. Alan does. They all do. It thus becomes virtually a case of trying to establish the pronunciation of the English of uh, Wycliffe or Tyndale by setting aside modern English and instead making use of all the other European languages. But this is really important to compare English to other languages. For example, if you only use standard forms of modern English, you would resist the notion that Shakespeare used a trilled ra. But it's well established simply by reading the grammarians and also comparing English to other languages that the sound of r was indeed ra just a couple hundred years ago for most speakers. And then it's changed into ra or non rhotic like the ka instead of car, the kar. Those things change. So it's important to, to understand that. Otherwise, we'd have no idea. You know, if we uh, just relied on native modern English evidence, we would never easily come to the conclusion, to the conclusion of a trilled R at all. So again, 
wrong. When modern Greek is mentioned, it is usually to illustrate the presumed distance from the classical Greek, often, and rightly so, when there's distance. Or when it's identical, like iota, right? This strange methodology is here deemed misguided and lacking in scientific stringency. So he, I, a straw man right for this? I don't know the names of all the logical fallacies, but he's created a version of Erasmian, lumped it all together, and it's incorrect. It's not a vision of reality. Is this what lawyers do? Uh, the bad ones. The ones who don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> or when they don't really have a case, but they just feel so emotionally about it, they try to prove it. Well, not the lawyer, but anyway. Of the four areas of evidence... Above, A is of the least little value. So what is A? A is like word plays and cries of animals? No, those are very important. Are you kidding me? That tells us so much. You, have you ever done historical linguistics, Professor Karagounis? Um, because the ancients never teach pronunciation of the various letters. Are you, sh are you kidding me? The ancients never teach the pronunciation of various letters. If you've seen any of my videos about ancient phonology, I quote them, Greek and Latin. Um, and by the way, so does Alan and Sturdivant and Horrocks. Let's just stick with Alan because he keeps mentioning this book. This guy, some kind of boogeyman who's trying out to <laughs> push his Erasmian. <It's> wrong. <laughs> this is not Erasmian. This is the reconstructive pronunciation of classical Greek. Those are different. But he's just constantly quoting, gosh, you turn to any any page practically, and Phi just mentions Dionysus of Halicarnassus or Plato or all, all kinds of people. But the ancients do teach the pronunciation of the various letters. And they do in Latin too. And because of their representations of animal sounds are not faithful to the actual sounds. And down in note 30, he talks about different sounds and how they don't necessarily have to sound like what you expect. One of them might be, say, bow bow, that a dog says. Um, in modern Greek, that would be pronounced as vav vav, vav vav vav. Really, animals can make any kind of onomatopoeic sounds, but they do help. When the sheep says, a sheep says bah, 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 it's kind of a universal onomatopoeic sound. It's an interesting clue, right? So if sheep go bah, bah, in ancient Greek, instead of v, v, that sound of e, the thin sound, as Karagounis would call it, doesn't seem to go as well with a sheep sound, but I, yeah, it's possible. Sometimes those sound effects are traditional, and through time they've been altered because, of course, languages, pronunciations often change through time. So, he, But to say that this is not valuable at all is wrong. Um, then uh, C says that here, the, mainly the question of Latin is of meager value because Greek sounds do not approximate to Latin sounds, transcriptional values being only approximate. Well, that's what's so crazy about this. You can reconstruct the pronunciation of Greek in the first century BC, of Attic Greek in the first century BC, post-classical period, but still Attic. You can do that two ways. You could do that simply by using evidence within Greek inscriptions. And you come up with what I call the Romaic pronunciation, or the Romaic variant of Lucian pronunciation, Romaic Lucian pronunciation, uh, which I've demonstrated, and it's... Uh, uh, you can go in and, and uh, download the audio. It's um, on Patreon, and uh, eventually I'll make a complete video about it. But which is super similar to that of classical Attic, and Theodor Son already explains this exact Hellenistic pronunciation of Attic. Okay, so that's one way you could do it, or you could reconstruct the pronunciation of Attic in the first century BC, same time period, only based on Latin transcription of Greek words, and you get the exact same thing. So, <laughs> I think it's so nuts. So he's saying that Latin is not useful. Latin is very useful because it confirms what the other direct evidence from inscriptions demonstrates. It's not of meager value. It's of terrific value. In fact, it's essential. D can be quite useful. What's D again? D is modern phonetic theory but only when applied to the internal history of the evolution of the sounds of the Greek language, i.e. from ancient to modern Greek. By this he means you can use modern linguistic phonetical theory, but only insofar as you start from modern Greek and only use that. You're not allowed to look at Latin transcriptions or any transcriptions. You can't think, don't use onomatopoeia. That could be anything. And don't use modern linguistics, phonotactics, 
none of that. You can basically only look at the ancient thing through this tiny little pinhole of what modern Greek can do. Well, not a tiny pinhole. It can be instructive in several ways. And it's always worth looking at, which is why I always do. And all the way, these guys, they all do it. They all look at the modern Greek too. So this is, I don't know, insane is a little bit harsh, but it's not rational. And it's wrong. <laughs> the dead letter, he says, of the inscriptions taken by itself cannot tell us anything about how the various signs were pronounced. Um, not exactly. We need a reference point. Uh, the initial index, the value of each letter, and using modern Greek is what he says. The reference point, as was for Erasmus, was the living pronunciation of the Greek language. The pronunciation of the living Greek language is better said, which is modern Greek, different from ancient Greek. Ancient Greek wasn't a spoken language in Erasmus's day, not a living one native to anyone. Hence, how some scholars can discuss ancient Greek pronunciation by ignoring and setting aside modern Greek evidence, which no one does, is difficult to understand. I can imagine that would be difficult to completely ignore it. So who are you talking about? You're not talking about Alan. You're not talking about Sturdivant. You're not talking about Horrocks. It's a straw man argument. Or just he, before like, he talked about <laughs> or Erasmus going off and writing his thing as soon as he heard this practical joke that was played on him, as if Erasmus had a typewriter. That would be funny. Could someone please illustrate Erasmus at a typewriter? Um, I imagine, I don't know, like a Hemingway kind of thing, maybe with like a cigarette or something. I think that would be funny. <laughs> That's a funny image. Maybe an AI generator could make that. That would be cool to see. Please make it. Send that to me. That would be fun. Um, writing this this thing right away without having sufficient evidence to begin with. It's this bizarre anecdote, and it's not illustrative of anything Erasmus really did, much less that dialogue. This is the thing that was done raptin, too quickly, without careful thought, without actually having researched the thing. I know it's 1995 when you wrote this, Katagounis, but you had more books, right? I know I have the internet. I can get so much more information than you possibly could have back then. But still, I just, it's difficult to forgive this kind of um, crime in academia. Uh, it's an exaggeration, but it's just academically um, awful. But to be up to the task, it is not enough to merely quote secondhand a few modern Greek examples. One must be able to speak modern Greek as a Greek if he is to really is really to understand, at least present, Greek phonology, and to appreciate phonetic changes and the reasons for them, and so be in a position to interpret the data correctly. Let me rephrase this. In order to have authority to speak about this topic of the pronunciation of ancient Greek, you must be able to speak modern Greek as a Greek, is what he writes. That is, you must be able to speak modern Greek fluently just to be able to discuss it teach it, talk about it. But he says to speak modern Greek as a Greek. That means natively. And it's evident that's what he means. Only Greeks are people who are so Hellenized in the modern sense that they speak modern Greek just as a Greek today. Only they are, what's his, uh, verb here, to appreciate. The only they are able to appreciate the changes, phonetic changes, which he kind of denies all of them anyway, systematically, and the reasons for them, and so be in a position to interpret the data correctly. Now, I get this a little bit because it's extremely, extremely valuable to have a good understanding of, say, Italian in order to understand certain things that are identical between Italian and Latin, say, the pronunciation of the R, R. But it's not necessary because you can learn in different ways. It's super useful. Um, a good example, many people who speak Latin today, so say English speakers, for example, they learn how to trill an R, R. I talked about this in my RO video, the RO video on the Greek one, because I talked about Latin pronunciation too, and how to trill the R and how to just do the tap and not trill it. A lot of people do that. For example, I will be, ero, in Latin, ero. Many English speakers will say, ero, for I will be. But that's erro means I will make a mistake, or I make a mistake, present tense. I err, right? I err. That is wrong. The single R between vowels in, a, in Latin, as in Italian, like amare, not amare. And so many uh, English speakers do this, not only, they're just uh, ones I have a lot of uh, contact with. They make this mistake, and it's just, it's just shame. It's like, this is easy to fix, but, you know, lack of education about linguistics, which is why I've often recommended, oh, it's so useful to learn something about Italian phonology, especially if you speak it fluently already, and then learn Latin. 
Absolutely. And the case is equally to be made for uh, Greek, because if you learn modern Greek with, you know, minimal foreign accents, then you can do a retracted S shh, without even thinking about it. And that becomes part of your ancient Greek pronunciation. And those happen to be things that are, uh, of course, part of the modern language and are, is easily part of the ancient language as well. So I get that. That's the weak version of this hypothesis. The strong version, which he's presenting here, is nonsense. We are thus left with the inscriptions and the papyri as the most relevant primary material. Theodor Son tends to agree with you. The reference point is the traditional Greek pronunciation constituting the other end of the axis of ancient modern, within which the evolution of sounds can be properly evaluated. Gosh. So incorrect. The pronunciation of each vowel and diphthong in particular becomes apparent from their interchange with one another witnessed in the inscriptions and the papyri. This interchange, this, this writing of one letter instead of another, shows that the two letters or diphthongs in question were sounded identically or similar, similarly, and hence were confused by those not acquainted with historical orthography or etymological spelling. Uh, generally, this can be exactly what's indicated. Yeah, absolutely. But there also can be spelling errors. Someone who's really good at this is Jan Adams, writing social variation in the Latin language, which indicates, hey, not every error that you find is actually an error indicating a pronunciation issue. It's also potentially an error just for inscriptions or you know historical spellings or other kinds of conventions, all kinds of weird things that are fascinating that you find if you really look closely. So you're not guaranteed to assume a phonological change or merger or something like that just because of a spelling error. It can. And that's what Theo Dorson did in his statistics. So, as our interest centers at the beginning rather than at the end of this process, the inscription material is the more pertinent of the two. The pronunciation of the vowels and diphthongs. There is never any question as to the closed thin e sound of iota. So thin again, non-linguistic. This sound must be the reference point for determining the sound of other vowels or diphthongs when they're confused with it. So epsilon iota, be confused with iota, interchanges since the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Absolutely, Theodorson shows all of those for the sub-dialect of, of classical Attic, indicating both that it was sounded ma monophthongally, absolutely true, yes, as in, right, one sound, well, one vowel sound, and that it was sounded as e, or something very similar to it. For certain speakers, yes, but for others, it was e. It was a in Attic for many speakers, and it was e, for many others. And it was even, um, Theodorson shows how it was even perhaps more open in front of vowels and so forth. Anyway, Theodorson, see my Theodorson video because he talks about those details. Uh, the interchange becomes very frequent from the 5th and 4th centuries BC, right? And epsilon iota interchanges also with eta uh, already in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. Now, this is a point of, uh, and he shows a lot of these spelling errors, a lot of the same ones that Theodorson analyzed, uh, which is great. He comes to the wrong conclusion, and I can see why he would make this conclusion. Because the idea that there could be multiple pronunciation types, like Alan really never mentions that. Um, in fact, he probably dismisses most of that. It's like, well, that's, you know, it's probably just all spelling mistakes. Dale Dorsen goes full in and says, hey, I think there's another phonological system, a subsystem that's going on underneath the conservative Attic one that bears the uh, Koine phonology. I think Dale Dorsen's argument is quite convincing, and it explains this so much better. That's why I wanted to see Theodorson with you all first, to know that when we have people like Karagounis insisting that, hey, look, these spelling errors, we get this and this, we'll look at all this ioticism going on, we can say, oh yeah, absolutely, instead of just you know, denying it. Oh yeah, there was ioticism going on in there, but that's the innovative subsystem. Since Epsilon Iota had already in the uh, 4th and 5th century BC, uh, assume 6th and 5th century BC, assumed or tended towards the sound of E, it is obvious that Eta was tending in the same direction. Why? Oh, because there's an interchange of spelling? Um, it did happen, according to Theodorson, for the sub-dialect, the innovative sub-dialect. This interchange becomes frequent around 200 BC. Theodorson mapped that all out. Um... And in some instances, this is totally right, but this isn't true for all, even the majority. Certainly not in classical times. Well, see the Theodorson video, and he goes into that. I go into that. He, meaning I. <laughs> Theodorson went into it, and I talked about it. Seeing Ypsilon becoming uh, Iota. Also, Theodorson confirms this, that there's enough spelling confusion here to show Ioticism with the Ypsilon. 
That's what he believes, and I think that's reasonable for the innovative subdialect, but not for the conservative subdialect or sub uh, system. The uh, so he says originally, "Ooh, then perhaps, u, perhaps." <laughs> Though this is uncertain, really, why? Interchanges with e already in uh, the sixth century. So we see this confusion more from the fifth uh, century onwards. Not really. Actually, that's when it goes away. So I think you're just confusing things. Theodor maps it out very well and shows how the innovative things going on in the classical period actually die out almost entirely, and so they're less frequent statistically. If its sound was not completely technical with that of E uh, at the early stage, it was at least close enough to cause the confusion. That's a reasonable way of hedging one's bets. That's very fair. This is corroborated further by the fact that U interchanges, interchanges with the eta, very rarely, and with the um, Omicron uh, iota, which also began acquiring the sound of E. So he, he makes a conclusion which is wrong based off of uh, data that is, of course, correct, which is factual. <laughs> so this is um, already in the 4th century BC. So Omicron iota becomes U at different points in the history of uh, ancient Greek and in different places. Eventually becomes the dominant pronunciation by Byzantine times, U. Um, so because of that, since this used to represent U, these two sounds get connected together. Not in the vulgar subdialect of Attic. They stay separate there. And again, see the video where it goes and we're going to detail. So he receives, okay, so we're getting Omicron Iota being represented by U. We're getting mixes here. And since there are other mixes here in a different time period and different places, well, that means it must all have been E. So the conclusion is wrong. And it lacks the uh, the nuance of what's really going on. So the upsilon interchanges with the epsilon iota by the fifth century BC. Um, we already talked about that. That's the ioticism of the vulgar sub dialect. The thinning down of the pronunciation, horrible non linguistic term, of upsilon towards iota is also confirmed by the fact that already in classical times, upsilon had lost its original sound of u, which now became to be expressed by omicron upsilon. So he's saying that because u became u. And the old U became U. Well, then U already would have lost its rounding and become E. Why? <laughs> the uh, pronunciation system. So Theodorson goes into detail about this one. This one in the vulgar subdialect should be E, indeed, just like the regular Upsilon. But in the conservative one, we also have a monophonization of this into simply U, probably. Like, uh, what's a good example of this? Like the Uya suffix, Upsilon iota alpha. What's really probably going on here is it's not uya, uya or uya or, so, or it's not uya or something like that. It's instead of this being this, uya, 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 but actually this or even this is the same thing where you have the gemination of a consonantal sound, uya, uya. It's still close enough to being a diphthong to give it that title, uya, as opposed to uya. Uya, so uya, you have the change from uya into uya, but even uya is still a legitimate pronunciation to explain why we see spellings in the Greek of there being no iota. Because if this is u, the first part, then uya, uya is sufficient, it's just a long u sound. It ends up sounding virtually identical. That's what's going on there. Omicron iota as e, not in the vulgar subdialect of Attic, the classical Attic. Uh, confusions here are seen in the, this this year. Um, normally, the these these folks who make these kinds of claims mention the thing about Thucydides between Limos and Loimos. It's obvious in Thucydides he's talking about how people were saying aloud Loimos versus Limos, and that there is a confusion that were they saying Loimos or Limos, and that's the problem because they sounded differently. Uh, obviously, they sounded like two different words. That's why they're spelled differently. But modern Greeks who want to believe that Omicron iota is pronounced E in ancient Greek point to Thucydides and say, hey, look, in Attic, they must pronounce them identical. And it's like, you're missing the passage. It's not what's going on. It's probably more evidence to the fact that educated Greeks, thus knowing something of Katarevusa, where the meanings of many ancient Greek words are different, than the uh, katharevusa words that are imported from ancient Greek, believe they understand something when they don't. I think it's that kind of a case. It's easier when you don't study katharevusa because you're not confused. That's one way to look at it in any case. The impossibility of pronouncing the diphthongs in diaresis, that is, each vowel distinctly, becomes obvious also from words such as ewaoyoi, 
well, I wouldn't read them like that. I wouldn't recite them like that. I'm not going to say eu a oi oi. Evaoyoyi is how that word ought to be pronounced in a reconstructed ancient pronunciation. Evayi is just as pronounceable. This word, which consists of seven vowels, is pronounced the Erasmian way. <laughs> evayi or evayi. It's interesting that he's okay with this u idea and gives credence to the notion that the Boothian pronunciation is a legitimate way to encourage modern Greek speakers to adopt something that's not the uh, the same as modern Greek pronunciation for the ancient language, which is nice because it it does enough to create clarity with a lot of the morphological forms. So the iota as um, or the so the eta as iota seen in the fifth century. Aha. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> contrary to the original intention of the theorists who had adopted it to represent positional epsilon, meaning along a technical length. The frequency of its interchange with the iota increases from the 3rd century BC. Actually, it doesn't. It goes down. That's what the evidence shows, that it goes down. That's something that's in the classical period. Virtually extinguished in the Ptolemaic papyri. Yeah, the, the Ptolemaic uh, stuff show a com different thing. You know, it's interesting. Ah, look at this evidence in this century, in this geography. That means it already occurred everywhere. No, that's not what that means. It could, but in fact, the evidence is very much against that. Theodorson is great for this. The interchange of eta with epsilon iota, before vowels, right, especially, which was pronounced as iota already in the 5th century. So it's a, it's the a equals b equals c, which in math works, but in this case he's not specifying the things in the environment, as Theodorson did very well. These two are the same in front of vowels, often. So, e, eh, or like a, eh, uh, Alexandreia, Alexandria, something like that. And thus the interchange of the, the spelling. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are both E. Being frequent from around 200 BC and leading into the same conclusion. No, it leads to a different conclusion. You just have to look at all the evidence. And the interchanges with Ypsilon and Eta and Iota, those look like they're you know, 5th century Attic ones. Spurious diphthong, the long diphthong. Proper diphthong, 5th century. It's the same thing and again and again. You have to buy into all the things previously, most of which I debunked rather easily uh, and have already debunked in other references. Or you just read the references I keep pulling uh, up here. And that's the only way this works. Otherwise, there's something more interesting and nuanced going on, more complicated. So we see in the third century, the interchange of omega and omicron uh, becoming very frequent. But he mentions not that, of course, omega with the iota subscript, as we, we write it today, that doesn't get interchanged with these. Theodorson comments on it and knows it. So there's all kinds of subtleties and differences that he just ignores or isn't aware of because it doesn't fit his paradigm. The diphthong alpha iota, alpha epsilon, interchanges with epsilon already before 400 BC in Boeotia. Oh, look, he says how it's in Boeotia instead of it being the earlier Attic spelling. Boeotian and Attic had very, very different pronunciations and different ways of spelling things, as we looked at before. Ionic eta had taken the place of uh, the alpha iota, right, in the ocean. We saw that. Revealing the fact that alpha iota was pronounced monophthongly as e eh, in the ocean. Like, it's this was so mind numbingly frustrating about um, ideas like these of Garangunis because alpha iota in 4th century Attic principally represents the sound ai, that diphthong. And because it represents that, Boeotians, who pronounce things differently, use eta, because that represents e, and e is, has the right quality to describe how they actually were saying things, right? They use the alphabet similarly to how the uh, Roman alphabet has been used, borrowed from one language to another, and then using, understanding, oh, well, it's used this way, this letter has this sound, so we use it this way. good example would be vine in German, which means wine. In Latin, it's uh, winum, right? Winum. And in the uh, Proto-Germanic language, it's brought into it. So we get winum, win, win, eventually win, win, win. It becomes vine. It becomes a labiodent that goes from wa to v. That happens in German, actually. It doesn't in English, which is why we, re we retain wine, because in Old English it was pronounced wine and Old English and Modern English both have this retained wa sound. Uh, in this case, from this word, all the way directly from Latin. Oh, that's not cool. That sound of wa has been handed down from classical Latin all the way to the present in the English language. 
explain, even though the vowel changed. And the ending was truncated. Whereas in German, W is now a V sound, instead of using the V that they use usually for a F sound, because of the change uh, in the phonology of the language. So it, it demonstrates how alphabets are used, the intent, usually when they're borrowed from one end to the other, to spell things the way that they they sound in the language that they're borrowed from, sometimes making some innovations, but not always, and making further changes. So um, anyway, the very fact of this existence, like you have to understand these nuances well enough, I don't know, or not have this bizarre propaganda thing in your head to realize that, wait a minute, if the Boeotians are spelling it eta, but the Attic authors are not, that means a fourth century Attic doesn't pronounce this monophonally. The pronunciation of alpha iota as e eh in Athens is proved from the addition of the iota to the diphthong as well as the confusion of alpha iota with epsilon. Um, to the diphthong, complete nonsense, and um, the, the confusion of the two is demonstrated in the innovative subdialect. Okay, so au eo eo, uh, he. <laughs> the diphthongs retain the pronunciation of both letters, but already in the 6th century BC, the U sounded as a consonant, he believes. Why does he believe that? That's an interesting hypothesis. There's no evidence for that in Theodorson. Uh, so what are you talking about? How is this proved? This is proved, proven, beyond possible doubt, pr proved as British, uh, proven as American, uh, beyond possible doubt by the mistake of the stonecutters in substituting digamma, which corresponded to the Phoenician letter wow, and had the sound of V or va, in place of the u. Okay, what's a good example of this? Uh, even Basileus is a great example because you see it written with, uh, uh, instead of the y, with the digamma. The pronunciation of digamma is w, not v, in Phoenician, as well as in, of course, ancient Greek. Homer, for example, the digamma is everywhere. A word like, oh yeah, wine. Well, what's the word for wine in ancient Greek? Well, in Attic, it's Oinos, but in the Proto-Attic, it was, of course, Oinos, as it is naturally in Homeric Greek. Oinos, Oinos, and this W is lost in many positions in Greek. It stands for the sound of W. That's why it's so easy to drop, because it's just a semi-vowel. And semi-vowels like Y and W get drops in many time periods and places in the changing sound of Greek. This is well established, like Elaya becoming Ela, you know, these kinds of things, they're, they're explainable and, and just, um, they're already well explained. So coming up with this completely alternate bat idea is crazy. And the only way that it can work is if you say things that are wrong. Digamma is pronounced as va. No, no, it's pronounced as wa. <laughs> Pronouncing it as va would be a later or different development as it was with German. Proto-Germanic pronounced what is written as W, like the word wine, something closer to ween, as it was uh, in Old English. Ween, 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 something. I don't know what the um, desinensa, the ending, would be. But ween, something, would be the root. And ween, 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 wein, wein, wein in modern German. And in English, the long E sound becomes I as well, but the initial consonant doesn't change. I mean, this is a perfect demonstration of the parallel development with a common origin. It is further confirmed by the transliteration of these diphthongs into Latin, which use, for example, ev for eu. No, no, they don't. Europa is eu, Europa. Are you confusing the fact that Latin written in capitals often uses uh, the shape of a V for what we would call a U in uh, normal naming of the letters in, um, in English? Or the fact that, indeed, this, like, euangelion becomes... Evangelion later because of the change of the pronunciation in both languages. Intervocalic w becomes v <laughs> in, in both languages. In Greek it happens because it's that diphthong eo which becomes ev, and in Latin it happens because it's an intervocalic w which becomes v. That this v cannot be mistaken for u is an eo is rendered beyond all possible doubt by the fact that these words are also spelled with a double v. What? Double v? Accordingly, lawinia becomes launa. Now, here he must believe that this is pronounced lavinia. Like, he must have no knowledge at all of the reconstructed pronunciation of classical Latin either. And thus, he assumes it must be lavinia. And since lavinia comes from what he would say is lavna, obviously it must be a v. How could it be a w in Latin? Well, 
course, in classic Latin, V is a W. <laughs> That's beyond any shadow of a doubt. Lawinia comes from Lauda. Uh, the etymology of that word isn't clear in any case. So, And it doesn't become Launa with uh, this U. I mean, it's because the precept here for him is that Alpha Upsilon has to be Av. That's the only pronunciation it could possibly have. Hence, that's why it's spelled Lavna, coming from Lavinia. And that's why it's not Launa, because they would have had to have written it Launa if it were Lawinia. Like, it's, like, he has this biased precept that it has to be, obviously, just like the modern Greek way, obviously, and that's a, the, that's why it's like this. It's so similar to flat eartherism, these these chains of uh, ill logic. What should have been the case of the sound desired was au. Just as it happens with auctoritas. Now, I looked up the Diocastius line, and in the way I've uh, seen it, the only way I've seen it is it's written alpha, upsilon, auctoritas, in the Greek, auctoritas. And not uh, <laughs> not with the Omicron Upsilon. That could absolutely have been, however, a transcription of it, especially if one were attempting to represent the Latin diphthong au in a pronunciation of Greek where au was becoming auv and eventually av. And there's test there's evidence that something like that was happening in different places in the first centuries AD, so uh, that's fine, <laughs> if that's what you mean. This is also confirmed by the name Paulina, which is transcribed as Paulina but he says Pavlina, though when the Latin sound is desired, the word becomes Paulina. It's this demonstration of, of, this, of this phenomenon of the changing pronunciation. It's transcribed Paulina, which is Pavlina, but it's not Pavlina in Latin, so why would it be Pavlina? Like, you don't know, this is telling you, Kyrie Karaguni, this is telling you right now that people who are writing Paulina and who are Greek speakers with a, that's spelled like this, they're pronouncing it Paulina, not Pavlina. Like, this is screaming in your face. Whereas those who write this Paulina, like this Paulina, seems to indicate that those people probably were saying Pav. This is the changing pronunciation of ancient Greek during the Koine period that I've talked about in many places. These examples confer the pronunciation of Paulos as Pavlos. No, it says you do the opposite. In general, however, Greek seeks to transliterate foreign names by following the historical spelling as much as possible. No more than any other language. Uh, so I just was talking about Lord Byron spelled in this way. And, uh, it's not. He's using these modern examples. Like this, these are not the same language. Uh, uh, this evidence has hopefully made it clear that the transliteration from other languages to Greek and conversely cannot lead to any safe conclusions as the pronunciation of Greek letters except in br very broad lines. You're completely, completely freaking wrong, Karaguni. This is um, very wrong. And. Man, it's it's amazing how many people read this and believed it because they didn't know any better than you. That's the real um, that's the real shame. Today in Greece, the confusion of the various representations of the iota sound, so e e e e e, -e <laughs> is not infrequent among uneducated people. Thus, for example, writing a word uh, with eta or omicron iota instead of the correct iota does not imply that these Greeks pronounce the particular word differently, but that their spelling is faulty. Well, they're just tsitsifitsiki, I suppose, right? Uh, exactly the same phenomenon took place in ancient times, and these misspellings, witnessed in inscriptions and in papyri, divulged to us the actual pronunciation of the living speech. Exactly the same phenomenon. No. Similar phenomena, certainly, of ioticism, absolutely, but not just ioticism. Uh, um, epsilonism, all kinds of interesting things were happening. Upsilonism, all kinds of things were, were happening as demonstrated in the papyri. Uh, this is, I mean, reading Gignac is effective. Yeah, why do you read Gignac? You don't mention Gignac? The above interchanges of vowels and diphthongs show clearly that the pronunciation of these letters already in the 5th century BC had begun to coincide with the so-called modern Greek pronunciation. No, it does not say that. This pronunciation may uh, not have set in everywhere at the same time, but the process that had begun in classical times or earlier was not long relatively in establishing itself everywhere. Even if in one or two cases it took many centuries to be completed into Byzantine times, that is eta. The important thing is not when this process ended, but when it started. Really? So you're saying that if it started, it means it's already the pronunciation? I don't get it. The Ptolemaic papyri, why not? The Ptolemaic papyri from Egypt confirm the above conclusions for the last three pre-Christian centuries. No, they don't. They show 
uh, some of these things, but they also show things that are totally, totally unlike modern Greek and unlike the other forms of Greek. However, the Egyptian papyri, being often written by non-Greeks, you mean Egyptians, <laughs> who in the approximation of the pronunciation of the Greeks had brought in the sounds of their native tongues, cannot methodog methodologically be relied upon as guides for the correct pronunciation of the Greek language. So why do you bring it up then? Like, or why do you why are you using that as evidence? Like this proves the thing, but we can't really rely on it. This is very poor logic. Pronunciation of the consonants. The consonants in dispute are the medii. This, again, this is an ancient term. Why don't you use the term voiced stop, voiced plosive, or voiced occlusive, all of which are correct. Beta, gamma, delta. Uh, vagada in modern Greek. Bagada in Attic. The aspirates ta, pa, ka, or thafacha in modern Greek, as well as zeta. As is to be expected in the interchange of these consonants, unlike the case of the vowels, is very limited. Hence, their sound can be determined chiefly, but not solely, by the principle of syllabication. That is, the rule that these consonants build syllables together with the following, with the vowel following them, and this determines their sound. Confusion in inscriptions is also valuable, while transcription from and to Latin is obviously also of some assistance. So you are using Latin. Use Latin where it suits your purposes, after completely dismissing the Latin. The Latin transcriptions do not evince any of this. Now, with regard to the aspirates, they took place of the earlier digraphs of this, basically th, ph, and kh sound, that is ta, pa, ka. A reminder that, as we saw before, spelling tau, eta, pi, eta, and kappa, eta, the aspirates, is not, in fact, something that was part of the old Attic alphabet. This was something of a very different alphabet, the Southern Greek alphabets, such as the ones in Thera and Crete. These three digraphs are not, in fact, quote, earlier digraphs, not for Attic. Thus, as Koine was firmly established, there was one way to write Greek in the Roman time, and that was with phi and theta and chi. As far as we know, the Romans were never exposed in any kind of influential way to the old Southern Greek digraphs, which were, by the way, just for pi, eta, and kappa, eta, and not for theta, because theta was retained even in the Southern Greek alphabets. Accordingly, Latin, th, ph, ch, like theokritus, pirosopus, carta, were used to transcribe these Greek digraphs and the historical spelling of words. When the Greeks in time came to use the monographs, they theta phi chi, in place of the digraphs, the Romans had no equivalents for these letters except for phi. Hence, line F is usually transcribed with phi. So much of this is wrong. It's, uh, it's, it's just, it's like, how can you get this wrong? I guess if you're not paying attention or reading any of the, uh, the books. So um, he is stating that Latin transcribes pilosopus with ph because that's how it was spelled in contemporary Greek. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> that old archaic spelling was not in use in that time. The Romans transcribed phi, theta, chi, pataka as ph, th, and ch, respectively, because that's what they sounded like. That's what they, in fact, sound like in that time period. But he's assuming like, oh, but then they write on these and the Romans didn't have letters for them. Like, for one, where's his evidence for this timeline? And number two, no. The, the, the timeline shows the exact opposite. Phi Theta Chi were in full-on use from the classical period forward, which is the time period that we're interested in, not the archaic spellings that you're demonstrating uh, here, interesting as those are. And Latin transcribes the P sound as a PH. The first time it's not is the uh, Phoenix Felix et tu, or rather that's the alliteration part, but seeing Daphne with an F, this is all in Pompeii, Daphne, and the uh, Las Fe, and, and you know, it's a Rufus, so those are very interesting. They demonstrate that by the first century AD, at least some, if not many speakers of Greek, at least in that area, were pronouncing P, the uh, letter phi, as an F sound, or something near to it. Super cool. Very, very cool uh, evidence. But the Romans were transcribing up to that point always with a PH, the sound of letter phi. You get it? 
you're, you're wrong. You're, what you're saying here is just factually incorrect. And it would have been very easy if just read Volk's Graika or Volk's Latina to know that. This is moreover confirmed by the fact that the phi is confused with the F sound and the diphthongs uh, here, but not with P. What? Let me just try to understand this because um, I know I have to get inside the, the nonsense of his head in order to comprehend this. So since these are av ev, he's saying that phi is confused with the F sound. Really? When, this is happening in Latin? Where? When? I realize now while editing, oh, he meant actually Greek, just in Greek, not with Latin transliteration. And in fact, he's still wrong because there are examples, you can find them in Threet and Gignac, where we see pi and phi interchanged. Were the phi sounded like pa, that is with p with aspiration, it ought to be confused with the p, which it was. And I just made this little note here, like the name um, uh, Pilemon is Latinized before the usage of the digraph PHTHCH with the simple consonant. So, uh, Pilemo, Latinized, right? Like Pluton becoming Pluto, for example. Or Apollo and becoming Apollo. Okay, that makes sense. Corinth, um, Corinto, for example, Corinthus, Calx, instead of Calx. You know, it, this, this is exactly what happened. Like, it's just so shocking. Like, these books were around in your day. I know you didn't have the internet, but you could have just read them, read the sources, learned anything about linguistics, and you would have realized how batty insane and totally wrong this is. Finally, the fact that the preposition ek does not change before kata pa, but before the aspirates, it actually often becomes uh, ek, right? So... Uh, or ik, let's use a, a classical attic. So, an ik taton, ik pules, ik kalkidos, which would be impossible to pronounce as what he's saying is ek kaldi, it's a ek kalkidos. He's saying that's impossible. Well, no, because I just did it. But I'm. it's a geminate, like bakos with two kais. That's all it stands for, bakos. It's a geminated sound. Uh, and you can write that in different ways, keeping in mind that our letters are an imperfect way to represent phonology, especially with more than one convention going on. So that's that aspirating the chi as kaha and the p as paha, which would necessitate the resumption of the original position of the tongue after the utterance of the first aspirate. Obviously, he doesn't know modern Armenian, which, as we saw earlier, already does this. Today, not only is, the, not only is it theoretically possible linguistically, easily produced in practice, as I demonstrated just now, but it's part of living languages today. But he says it's adunaton, avinaton. He says it's impossible. Well, he's wrong. <laughs> Shows that there is no question of aspiration and that these letters are pronounced monophthongly. Again, monophthongly, but that's not what monophthong means. He th considers that the aspiration of pataka is a diphthong, or rather, in the ancient sense, of two sounds. It's not, though. It's two letters, but it's only one sound. It's aspiration on top of a p. It's something that people trying to understand or master aspirates can confuse because uh, they might think it's, you know, pilos, like uh, pilos pos or pos or something. They do all kinds of words like pos, pos, like um, top, uh, topos, like they analyze it as two consonants. Well, that's wrong because it's aspiration, air being produced in an H-like sound at the same time as you're enunciating the consonant. So it's topos, topos, not topos. That's wrong. And that's what he's saying. It's not a diphthong. It's, it's, he just doesn't know anything about this. It's so irritating. And apparently he's saying theta and phi have taken these sounds of B in Boeotia already in the 5th century BC. Really? I haven't never seen that before. Could be. That's a fascinating idea. Obviously, there are some places where fricatives may be happening even that early. Could be over in the Doric. Well, the Doric for sure because of the theta. We know is already a th. Um, without an, almost any possible doubt there with, you know, Sion for Theon given in um, Aristophanes, if I'm not mistaken. So that's already a possibility. And therefore, maybe the other Africans, but not an Attic. <laughs> and in Boeotian? I haven't seen that before, but okay. The conclusion is that these letters already in Attic times were sounded as V, uh, R, <laughs> it is impossible to reproduce in English the sounds of the gamma. Well, yeah, but that's what the International Phonetic Alphabet is for. Ga and ye, respectively, right? 
And we have th, though it appears in suppositions after nasal, they could have had the sound of bagada as they do today, especially in uncultivated Greek. Well, hello, it's me again, and here's another bit of Yanadis that I just happen to have seen, and thus I recognize this part about uncultivated speech sounds, them as gada, but uncultivated speech? For example, vendra, rambros, anthra. <laughs> it's, that's uh, really amazing. Uncultivated? Uh, it's it's just so uh, so amazing. It's what's interesting, I suppose, though, is that Karagounis is taking so much out of Yanaris, who unfortunately doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to historical linguistics either. Just as the the double angelos can sound like agelos, and enklisis can sound like eglisis. Uncultivated Greek, you transliterate your name like this. In Greek, it's spelled kappa, alpha, rho, alpha, gamma, kappa. It's anka. But, of course, you write garagunis because that's what it sounds like in the uncultivated or very normal pronunciation, the slightly um, prenasaled velar voiced stop. So, uh, garagunis. Garangunis, said with the normal velocity of speech in the isochronic way that you mentioned. Garangunis, garangunis. And that nasalized sound is, is often lost. There's nothing uncultivated about that. That's just how it sounds. Really, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's, it's uncultivated. In uncultivated Greek. Wow. The kappa of the preposition ik before beta, gamma, delta, as well as before lambda mu nu, is regularly changed to gamma for euphonic reasons. Right, that's backwards voicing. This so you would see, um, would see uh, sort of written with a kappa, ek boyotias. We have, it would be written, ek boyotias. Right, but he says that's only possible if they're all fricatives, because only fricatives would do that. Complete nonsense and wrong. <laughs> This circumstance clearly supports the sound of ga rather than ga. No, it doesn't. You just don't understand enough about how languages work. You should learn more than just about what modern Greek does, my friend. Obviously, you know Swedish and English. Learn international phonology. You're 83, so I don't expect you to do that, but still. The pronunciation of beta as v, in addition to the above, borne out also the confusion of this letter with the upsilon of the diphthongs au Eu, eu, which have already been treated above. Moreover, the beta uh, replaces almost always the digamma, which is sounded as V. No, it more, replaces almost always? No, it doesn't always always. We see the first evidence for something like this in the first century AD. He's saying there's these spellings here from uh, the Septuagint with the beta for sort of uh, David, with the, um, the, the diphthong with uh, David. But I was pretty sure that was already happening in Aramaic of a V or a v sound, so that writing with the beta, even if the beta didn't have, it could have had a fricative pronunciation in the Septuagint time for some speakers, if not many. I'm willing to believe that as a possibility. If it's just a v, like if it's David, like let's assume it's David in Aramaic. Well, a b is closer to that than a, a w sound, right? So David, 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 David. Uh, you'd have to make a choice because neither is the exact same, right? So this, this does not lead you to the inevitable conclusion that the reason they're using beta is because it's a v. That can only be true if you're saying the Hebrew is wow. It's so funny because you just said before that the digamma was pronounced v from the Phoenician v of digamma wow. It's like this is all like you keep changing things that are facts in order to support your opinion about this or support what you want to be true. It's, it's unbelievable. With regards to delta, uh, we see these examples. Yes, these do occur. These are, are interesting, but they're also explained simply by the fact that these all begin with aspirates. His, hen, henos, so medhis, medhis, so representing it with a constant that shows the aspiration instead of one that doesn't, medhis, medhis, assuming that aspiration is in there. Uh, well, that's what's going on much more likely. These have been 
seen and uh, dismissed by philologists for that reason to indicate that they absolutely have to represent figures. They don't, of the delta, of course, or either, actually, because they could just represent aspiration. It's so interesting because there's two linguistic explanations of it, and if you take everything as a whole, one of them makes more sense, the aspiration one. The fact that delta does not become T shows that the sound of delta was closer to that of theta and was not sounded as the... No, did you forget that these start with a, an aspirate? with the rough breathing. Um, some interesting interchanges, del pos, uh, bel pos, uh, obelos, uh, odelos, those are interesting, but they're just as likely due to all kinds of things, including the original gua sound in Indo-European, which comes out as the or ba in Greek. Such spellings are also characteristic of, you guessed it, Boeotian and not Attic. For more, see Horix, page 32. Which again precludes the sound of uh, D. So we have, I think he's missing a letter here for the uh, hebdomos, maybe it fell out in typing, hebdomos, seventh, and uh, octomos, speak against the D sound. Why? It is physiologically easier to pronounce these as evdomos and as, uh, than uh, hebdomos. Why? And he's saying that octomos and evdomos are easier to pronounce than octomos and hebdomos. Why? Really? For you, it's so interesting how his um, powerful subjectivity, it's powerfully subjective, centered around his um, point of view, completely clouds him to other possibilities. In fact, to the truth. And we know that the various modifications in spelling, contraction, elision, crassus, avoidance, and hiatus were undertaken for the sake of achieving a smooth, easy, and well-sounding pronunciation. It's a little subjective. Now, to sound a word such as this. Now, I looked up this word. I kept trying to find this. I don't know what this is supposed to be. Uh, so, uh, if you know what this is, I tried finding it. I didn't find anything in any dictionaries or um, TLG, but if someone that finds this can, can explain this to me. It's, I mean, it could just be an inscriptional error somewhere, but I don't know what this is about. Here, what, uh, I should bear in mind that Greek, basically a polysyllabic vowel-loving language, avoids the concentration of unnecessary, difficult-to-pronounce consonants so characteristic of German, like Nietzsche. We already discussed this earlier in uh, Will Annis's article. Greek pronunciation cannot be determined what is possible or acceptable in other languages. You're wrong. <laughs> Ancient Greek pronunciation can and must be compared to other languages that are attested at the time and other languages that show similar traits. So you're wrong. That's not how linguistic science works. Finally, the letter zeta, as is frequent, as it's frequent replacing by sigma before uh, beta, gamma, delta, etc. shows post-classical Attic period and a voice sigma sound uh, like rose or zebra. Absolutely. Not the Erasmian, Erasmian Zub, but I mean, you're using different time periods to justify this. 340 BC, because if you're taught, this is this, if you're seeing Erasmian, which you, do you mean reconstructed Attic pronunciation? That's meant to, um, that's, that's different. It's just like, I've talked about, you just see my Zeta video if you haven't yet. So Zeus instead of Zeus. Um, these, however, I'm afraid, don't necessarily indicate what you're saying here. Uh, having um, bus zantioi. Um, this could also be the representation of the gemination of the initial sibilant in a zda reconstruction. So, bujstantioi, um, instead of writing it this way. And he has a few other examples of this exact phenomenon. This is strong evidence for a zda pronunciation. Uh, it could also be uh, a long z pronunciation. Then you'd have to admit that there's geminated consonants, and you haven't even talked about that. And don't at all, to my knowledge, in this article. That this tendency occurred in Athens as well may be uh, fine by the Plato. So Plato talks about, of course, the confusion with uh, what the, the zeta actually is, and it's in a comparison. We also see other spellings like this. Um, I think that the pronunciation of zeta in classical Athens was probably all three, depending on the speaker. Zda, dza, and za. I think all three of those were extant. And if not merely in Athens and certainly in Greece contemporaneously, all three of those were there in the 5th century. And then all three go on to survive in different dialects, mostly the dza, the more archaic of them, goes on to survive in Italy. Sturdivant comments on this pretty nicely, uh, giving us the pronunciation of the zeta in Italian and other languages, which is an affricate. Um, and the zda sound in the 2nd century 
my my man Willius Longus, as we saw in the Zeta video, he talks about that being a pronunciation in Aeolic. I think he said it was Aeolic. Anyway, he says it was a, a dialect. So they're all existing, all three of them in ancient Greek. In any case, accents, breathings, etc., prosody, quantity. Greek verse was based on quantity, which was indicated by the symbols long and short. Quantity is achieved by rhythmical beat. No, no, no. Uh, uh, well, if you mean accent, stress accent, then you're wrong. This had been physically represented by the putting down of the foot, thesis, or basis tubodos, which symbolized the, ex the accented and therefore longer syllable. No, it the beginning of... Do you know anything about music? Clearly you don't, because this is how music wor works. Um, and then while I'm away, I'll ride home every day. That's the ictus. That's the beat. It has nothing to do with the lengths of the syllables. And then while... I'm away, right? Um, it's, it's just like Arma virumque cano troiae qui primus saboris italian fato profugus. Now, in dactylic hexameter, the first part of the foot, that first syllable, is indeed always long, but not in other meters. <laughs> so the ictus, uh, the beat happens on different ones, not always the long one. How would you come to this mistaken conclusion? If you didn't know the ancient Greek literature, especially the poetry, very well. Which symbolized the accented and therefore longer syllable? Wrong. And the raising of the foot, the arsis uh, tu podos, which symbolized the relaxation of accent, therefore the shorter syllable? Also wrong. Uh, I mean, we, we just look, crack open Homer and see plenty of unstressed long syllables all the time. So this is wrong. It's like, how do you get this this wrong? I guess because you don't understand the phonology of the ancient language or the poetry. Hence, the basic metrical unit was called a pus. Thus, if a syllable was placed in an accented position within the foot, it was considered long by position. This is wrong. Uh, long by position is, means like word like, for example, makra, uh, the kappa. What this does, this kappa and plus r I have a video about exceptions, the exceptions to where you put the stress accent in Latin because they're dependent, of course, on syllable length. Now, this could be pronounced makra in ancient Greek. It can also be pronounced makra. That is, the kappa can, in fact, either go with the rho or it can be left separate. It can terminate the first syllable and be makra or something like pistis. There, the sigma of pis, that is part of the first syllable, and then the tau, tis, that is the second syllable. You can say you can't make the first syllable short and say pistis. Doesn't work. That syllable is long. And in the untechnical, unhelpful terminology, but still um, often used, we say that the iota in the first iota in pistis is long by position. The vowel isn't really long, is what that means. But the syllable is long because of its position within a word. That's what that means. He incorrectly uses this terminology by saying that if a syllable was placed in an accented position within a foot, it was considered long by position. No. If in an unaccented position, it was considered short. It would thus appear that the vowels as such were neither long nor short, but isochronous as in Greek. So you're wrong, Garaguni. You're wrong about all of this. This is all wrong. That's wrong. Let's just call this wrong number one instead of five, six, seven. So it's wrong number one. Long position, that's not what that means, and that's not what's going on. And you just you add up all these things that are wrong, but one thing proving another in your incorrect chain of thought, and thus you come to the notion that ancient Greek must be isochronous as in modern Greek, but only because everything else previously was wrong. The situation became complicated with the adoption of eta and omega, oh, really. The syllables containing these letters came to be considered as naturally long. Indeed, they talk about this. Fusi, makrai, long by nature. Consequently, they're talking about vowels, man. Consequently, the syllables containing any of the other uh, vowels, depending on their position in the metrical foot, were regarded either as makrai, brachiai, or dichronoi. That is, long, short, or variable. Okay, dichronoi um, is usually referring to ankeps, but like uh, the, um, let's say that makra or makra, that could be a dichronos, dichronic syllable, if you want to use that terminology, sure. Uh, that's fine. But you don't understand any of this, so we'll move on. The remarks and speculations of the Alexandrian grammarians lead to the conclusion that quantity had ceased 
to be felt by the third century BC? Nope, because over here, Colomo's uh, article, Colomo, I don't actually know how Daniela pronounces it, Colomo, Colomo, uh, she demonstrates here how people who spoke the from Athens or spoke the proper Attic standard of Koine Greek, that is, who spoke like people from Athens, they were observing all these things and they were even writing it in their private letters, even writing law marks in their private letters to help people with uh, just being able to pronounce the language the way that it is pronounced in the proper Athenian way. I mean, I don't necessarily believe in proper, but it was proper according to these these folks, which is why it's mentioned here. So, wrong. <laughs> and that's also not what they said. Uh, you're reading stuff into them that isn't there. Um, the use of it in later versifiers would seem to have been a matter of tradition, as it also was in, Byzant in the Byzantines. Now, the retention of it is very interesting. At what point do we acknowledge that people writing meter are doing it just out of tradition? We have that in Latin too, right? In the Middle Ages. Beautiful. Exameter. What it seems to convey, most importantly, is that the people writing them, if they do it well, they're definitely reciting them with the lengths, but it's maybe no longer a natural part of the language. When does that occur? Well, I've spoken about that extensively. Essentially, we see both fall out of the language is of Latin and ancient Greek, 5th century AD. Moreover, the use in Homer and the early inscriptions of Epsilon and Omicron for the uh, later versions the long sonic letters, the exogen, their treatment of long vowels and diphthongs as though they were short and conversely, as well as other phenomena, would seem to indicate that quantity, even in the archaic period, was not intrinsic to certain vowels, and that it was its, and that it owed its raison d'être to position and accent. Well, this is completely wrong, and you made this up, and this doesn't make any sense. The only reason that this could possibly make sense is if you already believe, if you first don't understand what phonemic vowel length is, which you don't, you don't understand how the meter works so you come to these conclusions which are simply wrong the soul of verse was accordingly the rhythm if you mean the interchange of long and short syllables yes and this was indicated by the rising and falling of the accent as stress wrong no it's not at all the rising being indicated by the acute and falling by the grave it's so interesting because obviously you just you have to open any poem in greek to see that the pitch accents aren't playing minimal or no part at all in the structure of the verse, which is different from Latin, which does take into account its stress accent because it's a different phenomenon in Latin from the contemporary ancient Greek. This accent as stress is integral to all speech. Its existence in Greek must be as old as the language itself. Okay, your conclusion is of course wrong, but also your premise is wrong. Since accent as stress is integral to all speech, no. All human speech, Japanese doesn't have stress accent. There are languages that aren't based on stress accent. Japanese happens to be one I know well. No stress in that language. No sudoresu. <laughs> um, but uh, no, but which means no dynamic accents, um, just pitch accent in Japanese, like ancient Greek. So stress is not integral to all speech. This notion is wrong and easily disproven if you actually went ahead and studied more than one language. See why you need to study other languages besides Greek, besides modern and ancient Greek to understand these ancient languages, to even get an idea of what's possible. <sighs> Although accent was not indicated by any marks in archaic works, inscriptions, or the earlier papyri, it was nonetheless presupposed. Thus the ancients without writing accents, okay, so right, that he establishes that they all would have had these stress accents, even though they didn't write them yet. Each syllable of Greek word is each syllable of Greek word is accented. You don't understand this terminology. You're using it wrong. No. Most words in ancient Greek only have one accent. The only time that becomes different is when there are enclitics, and whether the enclitic creates a different new accent based on the new syllabic pattern of the, the new longer word. Um or if both accents are observed, that is especially since they're pitch accents, that you can do that, like in Japanese, for example. That's something that's still a uh, matter of study. But in any case, every syllable is accented. No, you don't know what you're talking about. And you're confusing, again, writing, because you're going to talk about how the grave accents were on everything. You're confusing writing with pronunciation. Uh, okay, using the grave accent. So this is, of course, talked about by the wonderful Sidney Allen again. He talks about how, start of Antio, I think they all mention this, how all of the non-circumflex and acute 
uh, syllables were marked with a grav at the beginning, um, and that's and but eventually the grav was limited to just the um, suppression of the final acute, right? So we are know, already know that the spelling is strange. I don't know if I can't just spell it right, but okay. Anyway, we already talked about this before in the Will Annis article, and it's wrong. Um, but it had no rising and falling intonation, the circumflex, an impossibility to an actual speech. For once the contraction had taken place, there was but one position in the mouth and one dominant accent, the acute accent. Now, he just doesn't understand pitch accent languages, thus he is incapable of comprehending what's going on in ancient Greek when it comes to this aspect of the phonology, and most of it, obviously. Study Japanese. Learn how the pitch accent works in a living language compared to what ancient Greek is doing. You'll learn a lot. This is confirmed also by the fact that the rules governing accentuation, the circumflex functions exactly like the acute. As Will Annis's article demonstrated, this is, of course, nonsense. But you're getting this wrong about the accent rules? This is like page one of any ancient Greek textbook. How can you be that off about something you're supposed to be the master of, that you're saying is the evidence for something? In this paragraph, he says some things that are confusing and misleading about uh, English and German and the fact that st these are, you know, stress time languages like English and German, and they lengthen stress syllables. That's true, and that Greek kind of does that too, so he doesn't really make a point that's clear. It doesn't help his argument, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, the second point is about the uh, trisyllabotany. How oh, that word? Trisyllabotany. And that, I guess, Greek is a better language because it only puts an accent on the last three syllables. It is commonly assumed that ancient Greek accent was a musical pitch accent, not a stress accent. Although the Greeks always, as though the Greeks always sung and never used ordinary speech. But when it comes to this, Karagounis, you're an idiot. Like, this is obscenely ignorant. If you wanted to learn about this, you could have. I'm sure you could have found some teacher of the Japanese language wherever you were, if not a tourist somewhere, and actually researched this. But you didn't. You didn't understand pitch accent language. You never researched which languages in modern day are pitch accent ones. You never understood this. And it's, it's so... Gosh, I'm so embarrassed for you, man. This assumption is not free from serious difficulties, but no adequate discussion is possible within the limits of this paper. Suffice it to point out the following. One, stress is n need not include pitch. I agree. Uh, and in fact, no pitch is communicable without stress. That's wrong. Japanese is such an example with 130 million native speakers. All Indo-European languages are based on stress accent. Wrong again, as we saw before. <laughs> like you really don't understand you haven't actually studied the subject oh in rare languages did you actually open a book <laughs> about it european uh realize that it of course that pitch is the fundamental thing in the primitive language okay in swedish for example which is the most musical of the scandinavian languages stress accent is clear and important but the pitch accent is phonemic in swedish and it's only possible because of the long and short vowel quantities. If Greek were different in this respect, it would have been unique. N uh, no. <laughs> well, it's not unique because other languages did that in of the Proto-Indo-European family. And still do. Serbo-Croatian, anyone? Since music was bound up with only one, the accented syllable, and it must be denied to all the others, how could Greek then be musical? Well, he doesn't understand any of this. If the accent was essentially musical... Why was it then disregarded by meter, which chose its own syllables, often un unaccented to express the pitch? So he's wondering why the pitch accent, if it were so important, why is the structure of the meter not based on that? Well, you can base the structure of your meter on almost anything. You can even structure English, as Longfellow did with um, Evangeline, in length-based meter, more or less. Um, it's not great because English just isn't a phonemic vowel length language, so it can't do it that easily. But ones that have that feature have some more flexibility. The uh, older, uh, the old Latin meters, for example, appear to be stress-based and have things in common with the Germanic meters, like that of Old Norse and Old English, which even though they had phonemic vowel length, a well-attested feature of both languages, their meters were stress-based. You can make your meter based on anything you want. Could they have made their meter based on pitch? They could have. Uh, they made it based on syllable length, the natural length of the syllables. Was there any relation between quantity and accent? We have seen that before the period of contraction, there was no natural quantity. That's wrong. Syllables were either naturally short or long by position. 
you don't understand what this term means. The Greek meter, therefore, must have been based on rhythm, you mean by stress accent, which is wrong, which consists of the uh, thesis, the ictus, and the arsis fall, represented by the acute and the grave. This is wrong. Uh, the only prosodiae known in early times. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, and seven, the principle of trisyllabotony Im implies an expiratory stress accent. No. It's indicative of pitch accent, actually, more than anything. Since Greek accent lacked the intensity of, for example, English and German accent, it lent itself relatively to the treatment uh, necessitated by meter. Nonsense. It's a nonsense statement. You don't know what you're talking about. However, irrespective of the situation in archaic and classical times, it is readily conceded by Erasmians that quantity and musical accent had in post-classical times given place to stress accent. Yeah, of course. How could we not? <laughs> Modern Greek demonstrates this. The singing had apparently ceased. Man. Like I said, it's like the town fool laughing at people for, I don't know, buying bread, whatever's logical and reasonable to do. <laughs> the singing, the, sing, the singing had apparently ceased. <laughs> it's that kind of arrogant nonsense. It's so off. He's so confident of his opinion which is wrong as if it were fact that he he brings up again and points the arrows at himself and shows what a fool he is and other people too who 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 laugh in derision it's like flat earthers laughing at people <laughs> look at people looking at those new images from the james webb telescope Pfft, don't they know they're all made in photoshop you know those kinds of things and, such people exist. Here they are. The question here is not so much that in the first Christian century accent was stress, which is conceded by almost everyone. No, I don't. Um, nor does Alan, by the way. Where is it? And by the way, whom are you citing? Conceded by everyone. Really? Who? But how far back in pre-Christian times does stress accent go? Indeed, because the further we can push back a modern Greek-like pronunciation, the more we legitimize modern Greek as a pronunciation system, I guess. It is a truism that, it is, that the disappearance of quantity and the emphasis on stress accent go hand in hand. Uh, pitch accent is only possible with phonemic vowel length, as demonstrated by me elsewhere. From the remarks of the Alexandrian grammarians, we understand that quantity was a matter of the past. No, no, they show the opposite, and they tell the opposite, and we have the evidence for that. But how long passed? So your, print, your precept is wrong, and then you're investigating something that's based on false information. Let's see where this goes. Oh gosh, this is embarrassing. Eta and Omega adopted expressed long vowels before left unexpressed. On the contrary, it supports the thesis above that they were adopted as compensatory marks to indicate technical length, and that they were not used for pre-existent values hitherto unexpressed. And he's like a lawyer, but a bad one, I write here. No unexpressed sound can have objective existence in a language. Okay, so his precept is that. Phonemic vowel length is not a character, which he doesn't understand, but it's not a, certainly not a characteristic of Attic Greek. Okay. But they were brought into it with those letters, because he's thinks that the letters represent are the identity of sound, that there are only five vowels, and they added two vowel letters as if they were adding vowels to the language, when it's the opposite. The vowels were, there were more vowels there. There was E and A, the long version. There was U and A, and thus they used or created more letters to describe sounds. Gosh, and so that's wrong, but he thus believes that Eta and Omega aren't describing any sounds that aren't already a part of the modern five vowels of, uh, of modern Greek, and thus no unexpressed sound can have objective existence in a language. Exclamation the point. It's unbelievable. At any rate, the process for the reduction of quantity was a protracted one, but it was practically complete by the time of Jesus. So... That's why I say he's like a lawyer, but a bad one. He's like um, an early episode of Better Call Saul where Jimmy McGill, he loses a case because he just can't get these uh, the <laughs> these kids off for doing a terrible uh, thing where they defiled a corpse, if you remember that one. 
Ah, uh, what a great, what a great um, episode that was. In any case, maybe he's a bad lawyer, or maybe the case is so impossible to prove. Like he's saying that there was quantity wasn't part of classical Attic, and therefore it was never part of ancient Greek, at least from classical times forward, is what he's saying. But at any rate, the process for the reduction of quantity was done, but completed by the time of Jesus. So, which was it? Was quantity in Attic, or versions of Greek thereafter, or not? Hence, a bad one. He needs to have a coherent argument, which he does not. The stress accent, therefore, had come into prominence long before that time. Wrong again. (laughs) Now, since accent is that which gives every word its individuality and integrity, wrong, holding the sounds of the various syllables into a harmonic relation to one another, thus to constitute a whole, a unique whole, the like of which cannot be found to pronounce Greek words in the undifferentiated manner of the Erasmians, as a string of unrelated sounds is to destroy the living pulse of the language, that which makes it a living entity, speaking, addressing the reader or listener, challenging him to understand and respond. Gosh, this feels Orwellian. Accent, stress accent. He has these precepts, all of which are wrong, but form a chain of wrongness, leading us to his wrong conclusions. First, the stress accent is essential for all language. Well, that's wrong. Therefore, obviously the essential building block of the ancient Greek language. Also wrong. To holding the sounds of various syllables into a harmonic relation and thus to um, to constitute a whole unique, a unique whole, a unique whole, the like of which cannot be found to pronounce Greek words in the undifferentiated manner of the Erasmians as a string of unrelated sounds is to destroy the living pulse of the language. This flowery rhetoric is just so nauseating because it's based on the absence of facts or twisted facts. I don't think he's really mendacious, but he's just incapable of seeing evidence. Many, uh, just like many flat earthers, truly believe the nonsense that they believe. Uh, You know, what an ugly thing to imagine our universe as this shockingly open vacuous space, cold and dark, with just tiny little specks, if we call planets and stars among them, that our planet is merely this little uh, rotating thing and this, this sphere. What an ugly thing. But whereas the real universe, if we're really just this on this flat, beautiful disk, and then the, the sun and the moon, and these lights up in the sky, there's, that's a beautiful system. Or the heliocentric, the heliocentric model, where the the Earth is the center, and that's that's beautiful. Look at this beautiful music of the spheres and the circles within circles. How beautiful! A living entity speaking, addressing the reader or listener, challenging him to understand and respond. Listen, you didn't understand, and your response is insane. This stress accent, which is supposed to have come into being around the beginning of our era, meaning um, the Common Era, A.D has ever since held its iron grip upon the language. Its rules and principles are still unchanged in modern Greek. If accent had been a freak of the times, an incidence in language development, would it have stayed unchanged for, say, 2,000 years? Languages go through cycles. At least that's one hypothesis, a well-founded linguistic hypothesis. It takes so many thousands of years, though, for most of them to go through these patterns that we really don't see the full cycle of, for example, an analytical language into an agglutinative language, into a synthetic language, and then back into analytical again. We don't get to see this very often. Egyptian, in its massive history of going from one language stage to another, we get to actually see those kinds of transformations. And another one is, of course, length, phonemic vowel length existing and then not existing. Uh, Part of the language, and then not again, and this keeps happening too. Italian, fundamentally, is not a language with phonemic vowel length. Latin was. However, it does occur in a few phonemic places in Italian, like cooperare, cooperate, cooperare. Uh, In the Roman dialect, it does too. Uh, Like, um, uh, like, uh, what's the other Da macchina, instead of da macchina. Uh, if I remember how to pronounce that right. But anyway, the idea, the article just lengthens uh, the vowel in those situations for some situations. So neither of these languages really have phonemic vowel length, in them, except in a few places where they are actually phonemic. English, too, doesn't really have phonemic vowel length, except in a few places. It's not inconceivable that descendants of the modern languages today in thousands of years 
could have all these features again. In fact, that's what we see. That's what the evidence shows us, that these things can develop in all kinds of different directions. French doesn't have stress accent, lexically. Other Romance languages do. Why is French different? You know, it's just you have to be so ignorant of how language works, so uh, uncurious, so offended by knowledge to make these kinds of statements, as I believe Katagounis is. This tenacity of the Greek accent finds a satisfactory explanation only in its being an integral part of the language from the beginning, not merely for the first century AD. It has held the language together. It has given it meaning and rhythm. What nonsense. And by the way, you're wrong. So the Alexandrians put the aspirations on there, right? The sound of huh. But in earlier times, uh, of course, the letter that we would call H is used. But it's used for an H sound in Old Attic. But dialects like Ionic were psilotic, so it was Aeolic. They were psilotic, and the Ionic alphabet was popular. It was useful to have something different to represent the long e eh sound, and Ionic was doing that. Hence the Old Attic alphabet, you know, it's very ambivalent, very ambivalent, because there was this confusion of the two spellings. You said yourself the confusion was a big deal. It's that it's at, absent, and then it's there, then it's not. This sounds like a spelling system in transition. The frequent occurrence of the uh, mark of aspiration with the row, for example, and these other letters, uh, for aspiration is impossible, indicates the sense of of aspiration have been lost. No. Especially with Roe, like you have to really be um, not paying attention. Roe, right? It's a voiceless And this sound has the appearance, apparently to the ancient Greeks as well as to the ancient Romans, of ra, ra plus ha, ra, ra, ra. Effectively, it does help to do that, but making it's not ha, it's ha. And uh, is voiceless, and because uh, is voiceless, if you maintain the uh, sound, you're able to produce something like a r uh, without the vocal cords. So instead of r, uh, uh, so what this is indicating is, of course, voiceless r. Uh, also, apparently, happened in uh, at least certain dialects with the lambda. So you get uh, instead of la, uh, beautiful sound. Uh, and gamma, I don't know about that one. Um, I'll. I have to look at that example. Well, hello there. It's Future Luke again from the editing bay. Did you miss me? So I wanted to look at Threet. Threet covers all of the Attic inscriptions. And of course, these include the Rho, Eta, Mu, Eta, and Lambda, Eta. So uh, these are, of course, found, and it's an interesting phenomenon. The Rho, Eta is easily understood. This, is, of course, follows Latin transcriptions of RH, which is, say, Hrenus, um, which is a well-known word to us who have studied Latin from Familia Romana. Again, I talked about that in detail in the Rho video. But what about this Mu, Eta, and Lambda, Eta? So Mu, Eta is rare, evidently, but we do have Mu, Eta fairly frequently. So what's this about? Well, if we go into the etymology, as is discussed here, there are, in fact, a number of examples where Mu is actually derived from an S Mu. And one of them might be, for example, mi cross that has an alternative form which is jmi cross and that is of course analogous to our english word small but most of those became an h sound in proto-hellenic mi cross or something like that and the aspiration could have been lit or could simply have made the initial mu voiceless so mi cross uh, creating sort of a sound of of air coming through your nose as you say it mi cross that's more or less how a voiceless m would sound the l like like that, so the leon, chlaves, for this one. But there are sufficient cases where it doesn't make sense etymologically. So why would there be aspiration on leon? Why would that be a voiceless lambda if it doesn't work etymologically? And the reason is that it could have merged together into the voiceless version for some number of people. It even may have been very common up until the beginning of the classical Attic period, at least for an initial voiceless M in all positions for all the letters, which is a very interesting idea. And thus, this is the explanation. It's a very interesting kind of accent or pronunciation that may have existed in some voices in the classical period. I don't think it was dominant based on the evidence, but I believe having seen the information here in Threet page, in Threet page 26, that it was definitely a possibility for some people to have that, and also for the lambda. Now, what about the gamma? Well, in inscriptions, 
Gamma and lambda can look real similar, depending on the alphabet and what century it was made. So I'm assuming that if it wasn't Karagunis himself who misinterpreted an inscription where there was a lambda with the eta as a gamma, that it was one of his sources. And with digamma, this is how Etruscan writes it. Since the digamma was w, but they wanted to represent f, Etruscan represented it with the digamma, which looks like an F, plus what looks like an H. This combination was meant to represent F, and this was also used in Old Latin spelling as well, the archaic Latin spellings. You see like uh, Fefeket, I think that's the spelling, and it has that seemingly superfluous H because the F, as we call it, was actually the digamma, meaning W, so they, it was a digraph to represent a sound that otherwise wasn't there. Really cool thing. Sounds like the same thing. Or it was because it was something more like hua, the voiceless hua sound, as in what, in uh, more old-fashioned modern English. And I have brought that into my accent artificially, and I like it. This, together with the evidence cited above respecting the extremely erratic use of Ada, shows conclusively that the aspiration had ceased in Athens already before the end of the classical period. If that's the case, then why is it transcribed into the Latin, which also had hua? <laughs> uh, there's no explanation for this um, and also the phonotactics you know you put the aspiration in front of um, oh, what's a good example of this oh yeah ep so like epi so epi hu epi hu so it becomes epu with the letter phi epu right to exaggerate epu there's no explanation for that except aspiration so you're wrong. Um, when observed in scripts, it was as an old relic, not as a living item in, of the language, just as it has been to our own day. Exclamation point. Man. So he is placing all of these changes in the 5th century and to say that the modern Greek pronunciation already become the pronunciation of Greek in the 5th century, thus justifying a modern Greek pronunciation for ancient Greek education. We already talked about why people like to do that. The U was thinned down, nonsense term, perhaps like the French U. Quantity, which evidently had never been integral to the vowels, but was a mere technicality, was now vanishing. What does that mean? Gosh, what a... The stress accent, which must always have existed, comes clearly into prominence. But you said it was always there. So I don't, that just doesn't make any sense. You're trying to have it both ways in order to have the kind of pronunciation you want to legitimize your pronunciation that you like which is fine as something historical in short all those elements that are characteristic of uh, the modern greek pronunciation begin to make their appearance at this time even though we may not be altogether sure of the exact quality of sound for each letter we have considered above we have sufficient evidence to know that the present greek pronunciation was in all essentials establishing itself already in the fifth and fourth centuries bc God, how nauseating. It's like saying, and then we have thus established that the earth is clearly flat based on the evidence available. This process was in some cases completed rather soon, while in other cases it was protracted. This means that the so-called modern Greek pronunciation of Greek is not modern at all. Hence, it is not correct to speak of the modern Greek and of the scientific, that is, Erasmian pronunciation of Greek. The correct procedure, rather, is to speak of the Greek, or still better, the historical Greek pronunciation of Greek. Oh, gosh. It still hurts. It's so ugly. It's so <laughs> anti-logic, anti-science, anti-archaeology, anti-linguistics. And of the un-Greek or artificial Erasmian or etacistic, etacistic pronunciation of Greek. <whistles> Laughable. Um, I was using this color because it, I just kind of liked the laughy color for whatever reason. These colors mean subtle things to me. Mostly they're there for the variety. Just to highlight different things that are uh, points to talk with. But this this is my color for laughing. But now when I read it this time, man, un-Greek, artificial, Erasmian, atacistic. This is what many, including educated Greeks today, think about this subject. And it deprives them of the real sound of the ancient language, if that interests them. They don't have to be interested in ancient Greek. But if they are, man, this doesn't make me laugh the way it did the other time. 
when I highlighted it. Oh, the historical Greek pronunciation. Wow. I'd call that Orwellian. That's mini truth right there. Today, the error of Erasmus has been perceived and lies at the basis of the awareness of the Erasmian pronunciation does not represent the ancient Greek pronunciation. This has led to the change of argument from scientific fidelity to practicality. Pronouncing Greek in the Erasmian way is supposed to save the student of Greek from the trouble of distinguishing between spellings and the different E sounds. And this facilitarian argument has become the main argument for persisting in a variety of pronunciations which are unnatural for Greek. Like I said before, this is definitely worth improving a lot. I've had a lot of um, harsh things to say about this. So I um, empathize with this. However, this argument is not entirely correct. <laughs> in my 23 years of experience in teaching New Testament uh, to Swedish students, also British, Belgian, and Dutch, and others, pronouncing it in the Erasmian way, really? You made that, that uh, stretch for them? That's big of you? That's pretty cool. I have found that if my students have been able to distinguish Eta from Iota, they have confused it with Epsilon. Oh yeah, their confusions abound. I agree, that's a huge, huge, huge problem with Erasmian speakers of uh, Greek today, that they get so nauseatingly wrong, specifically by pronouncing, I don't know, Pilemon as Philemon, when they could say Philemon, or Philemon, or Philemon, or something, right? What's the difference? If it's that wrong, that which it is. Most of these um, native speakers of English, uh, in particular, we're talking about, but also it goes for Italians and so forth. They merge other things. They merge long vowels with short ones. They create diphthongs where they never existed. It's awful. I agree. I agree, Karagounis. This is uh, it is shameful. But you're the teacher. You're teaching the language. You got to help them get past this, even if you're using this what you're calling Erasmian pronunciation. They also tend to confuse uh, chi with kappa and theta with tau. Yeah, especially the, the, the Dutch ones, um, uh, Belgian, and Swedish. Moreover, the disregard of stress, the accented syllable by Erasmians not only produces an un-Greek sound, but it also confuses different words spelled identically, whose difference in meaning is indicated by there being an accent. Oh, yeah, so I've heard about this. I guess I've noticed it. Sometimes people reciting ancient Greek, they don't even follow the accents. They don't even use at least the stress accents. They get that totally wrong. Man, that I, I agree. That's unforgivable. <laughs> um, in other words, it is not quite true that this un-Greek pronunciation helps us spell Greek correctly. Hmm. I can get behind this. I have gotten behind this. This is cogent. You just come to the totally wrong conclusion, and then you justify your conclusion of using the modern Greek pronunciation based in awful linguistic... Uh, study in science. In view of the results of the above investigation, was there an investigation? <laughs> I saw uh, a haranguing of some opinions based on non-facts. There seems to be but one course to take to abandon the Erasmian pronunciations and return to the Greek pronunciation. This is a scientific demand and a practical desideratum, to use a phrase coined by a great New Testament scholar in another connection, and that for the following reasons. One, the Erasmian claim to pronounce Greek in a scientific way, that is, in the ancient Greek fashion, is beset by insuperable difficulties. First, it is common knowledge that no one can learn to pronounce a foreign language by merely reading books in that language or consulting dictionaries, even such as are provided with phonetic helps. I mean, you're the example of this man. You, Kyria Karaguni have not learned nearly enough about modern living languages to even see what's possible. So you haven't done your homework before making these claims, first of all. However, again, the problem is that ancient Greek and modern Greek have the same name. Thus, you are a native Greek speaker, which means you are claiming authority as being a native speaker by extension of ancient Greek. One must expose oneself constantly to the sounds of that language by listening to and trying to imitate native speakers. I guess that's you, as a Greek. What bollocks. And even then, it will be extremely difficult to learn to pronounce the language as the natives do if the learner is older than eight years of age. I learned pretty much every foreign language. In fact, not only I've learned and studied, yeah, every foreign language I know 
well after that age, from high school forward, mostly from college forward. You just have to train it. I'm sure you did to learn Swedish well, to learn English this well. Maybe you have a Greek accent. I'm sure it's beautiful. Love Greek accents, and certainly in English and probably all languages. They sound the Greek accent sounds great. But what are you talking about? You have to learn to pronounce as the natives do, if the learner is older than eight. In the case of ancient Greek, we no longer have the possibility to hear Socrates or Plato, let alone the ability as grown-up students of Greek to imitate its correct pronunciation. Well, that's wrong because we can figure out what the, just like you said, you said this already. There's a theoretical pronunciation, either of the Erasmian, whatever that is, and of the actual reconstructed classical Attic pronunciation of, say, Allen or my reconstruction, which is based on Theodorson, which is slightly different, and um, mostly just in the, the uh, Omicron and uh, Epsilon pronunciation, just make them closed. That's really the only difference. There is a theoretical thing, and there's, that has a theoretical precise sound. How is it precise? Using the International Phonetic Alphabet, something you should have learned to do long before you penned this article. So, yeah, we can do this. And one with, you know... A bit of training, learning the basics of the International Phonetic Alphabet, learning a little bit about modern languages, yeah, you can extrapolate pretty much everything you need to know. Certainly to get these basic phonemes, there are other elements that are different, that are variable, and also a lot harder to figure out. Intonational patterns, insofar as they differ from you know, the pitch accent, which is already written in there, which is great, which gives us a lot of clues, but doesn't tell us everything. Those are other characteristics. But that's not what we're talking about, right? You're not claiming, I guess you would probably claim that the modern Greek intonation patterns are identical to ancient Greek, so we'll move on. Second, it becomes immediately incumbent upon the Erasmians that they apply to the text of each particular period the pronunciation that was current at the time. I agree. Thus, Homer should be pronounced with the pronunciation that was used in his time. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe I'll crack that one one day, because that's not super clear. Um, be not because we can't reconstruct the pronunciation, which we can, but because you have to get the text to reflect that. You have to replace all the diagrams and do some other things. Hey, you can do that. It's not that hard, but it's not something that I, I want to do right now. I'll do it in the future. Plato and Aristotle with the 5th to 4th century Athenian pronunciation, which was undergoing important changes. Not exactly. There was a sub-dialect that was transforming. The New Testament with a pronunciation that was practically identical to the modern Greek pronunciation, Where's your evidence? Oh, yeah, you don't have any. You think you do. So you're wrong. Uh, but there, yeah, we have pronunciation changes in evidence. Now the church fathers and the modern way. Yeah. Wow. Third, four and one half centuries of trying to establish the scientific nature of the Erasmian pronunciation has led to results that are demonstrably false. No, they're demonstrably right. <laughs> and your claims are demonstrably false. Or that have failed to convince the theorists themselves. How laughable. How wrong. To illustrate this, I will quote a few passages from one of the more recent defenses of Erasmian, Allen's Volkskreika. There you go. Practical difficulties in distinguishing the voiceless, unaspirated plosives from the aspirated, both in speaking and hearing, lead Allen to bypass the Erasmian pronunciation of these points and to counsel pronouncing the aspirated plosives in the Byzantine manner, that is, in the modern Greek manner. Yeah, my, one of my early videos about Greek pronunciation, I was so irritated by this. Um, because it's like, we know, I insisted, that the aspirates ought to be pataka. So why is, so why are people using an ancient Greek pronunciation, which is clearly an attempt to reconstruct it? Why are they using these fricatives? Obviously, they're part of the, they're, obviously, they've been part of Western European convention for a while. You know, they're just like, of course, the modern Greek for those three letters. Well, if they could pronounce them, th, Italians and Germans can't do that, ch, English speakers can't do that, etc. But let's just assume the fricatives are the Erasmian ones. And that's what Alan is saying. Yeah, I have a problem with that as being an acceptable part of it, but I also know from experience, because I made that recommendation, and man, nobody could do it. They just ended up making it so much worse. Um, I remember there are very few people I've heard successfully do the aspirates. I know one guy's outstanding. Um... And of course, Stratakis does pretty well uh, with them. This takes training. It takes a lot of serious training to do these uh, aspirated pro plosives correctly. I don't feel like I'm there yet to do it really well. And I also don't, I kind of abandoned practicing it um, for the most part. Yeah, I could still do it. 
But I abandoned it and went with, uh, for example, my preferred one at this moment, which is the Pompeian variant of Lucian pronunciation, because it's pretty close to this Erasmian kind of thing. It also happens to be historically valid based on the evidence that I have found for this reason. But if we're talking about classical Attic, no, nah, those got to be aspirated. They really have to be. And uh, I, I understand uh, Alan's recommendation because Alan is doing two things in his books. He's discussing the actual evidence and therefore comes to the conclusion of the actual pronunciations of both these languages and then makes practical recommendations that are based on that for British school children. So that's where Alan goes astray. That's often where I end up criticizing some of his recommendations too. Not necessarily his conclusions on phonology. Well, a couple with Latin, but even with the Zeta. But anyway, also Alan doesn't understand the ancient meters either of hexameter and so forth. But anyway, there's some things that Alan, for being who is vastly superior as a philologist compared to you, Mr. Karagounis, still doesn't get everything right. Again, I have the benefit of the internet. I can hear so much more than either of these fellows could decades ago. Uncertain pronunciation is recommended not on scientific grounds, but on practical grounds. Now, why is that an exclamation point? You know, I, I get it, too. If, for example, there were no evidence in the ancient Greek language ever of fricatives, which is what I used to believe because I hadn't done enough research, you know, then believing that that chayre was a completely illegitimate pronunciation for that word. I have the video demonstrating my my ire at this because I had <laughs> taken uh, Wolfskaraika quite literally, and I hadn't done enough of my own study of the epigraphy and so forth. So then I found, oh no no, there's maybe there's some evidence here. It's really it's you know it's hard to tell. It becomes exists as a possibility because it has it is practical, and so many people wanting to recite ancient Greek and and to learn it and to work with it. They want to approach something historical, but, you know, when we learn a foreign language, we should absolutely try to aim for some kind of theoretical pronunciation, but also accept certain practical limitations, too, that will be uh, inevitable. Uh, and that's okay. Um, but it's important to distinguish those, and Alan distinguishes them. You, however, are, taking, are making a practical choice of using the modern Greek pronunciation and creating a scientific rationale for it. Alan doesn't do that. He says this is the if you will, the scientific thing. And here's the practical thing I'm recommending because the scientific thing is probably too hard for most people. And as much as most of this is worth it, that just isn't. I can see how, I can see myself once agreeing completely with with um, the opposite of that and also ag agree to what Alan ends up recommending there as well. I do, of course, as you know, draw the line at phonemic vowel length. And also pitch accent. Pitch accent isn't that hard. When on page 73, he cannot make up his mind. He recommends a certain course because if we are wrong, at least we shall be doing nothing worse than, say, pronouncing Aeschylus as Demosthenes might have done. Whereas if we adopt the other alternative, we may be giving an author a pronunciation which he had never received in antiquity. Exclamation point added by Karagounis. This passage, which I know very well, is talking about the pronunciation of Omicron Upsilon, which he's saying... It was in classical Attic either O or U, and Alan isn't sure which it is. It's hard to determine from the evidence, and thus he concludes, well, it's probably safe to go with U because that's what it's going to get by the 4th century for absolute certain. And Alan says, we might as well go with U instead of O because we should probably err on the side of the things that come slightly after rather than things that might be too archaic. Yeah, that's a reasonable way to think of it because there is an arrow in, con in the continuity of things that's the justification for pronouncing ancient greek with the modern greek pronunciation it's sort of just tradition right you're pronouncing it as we do today as you might say um whereas pronouncing modern greek with the an ancient greek reconstruction is not only laughable it's completely wrong especially because so many of the spellings and so forth are based on the phonology these things are mostly insensitive to the time's arrow, but the point that Alan is making, well, you, you might as well go a little bit later. Now, he says in response, this revealing admission is most telling, but one also wonders why in the light of this, Erasmus still persists in pronouncing, for example, the New Testament, even from their point of view, which he believes is wrong, in an anachronistic way. I get it. I've railed against it. Was that the anachronistic pronunciations of Greek that I, I talked about? Um, that one was for using, you know, the mixing these things up 
as Rasmian does. And I have found some justification for even some of that mixing that isn't anachronistic that I've incorporated into the various variants of Lucian pronunciation uh, this year. So I get that, but what this really comes down to, especially is the grammar and morphology, as well as the literature and the poetry. Well, thankfully for one, characteristics including phonemic vowel length and pitch accent are quite persistent in the, in the standard Attic dialect, at least to the second century, from what I'm reading here in Colomo, Colomo. And given that, despite the changes that are going on, you can use a more conservative pronunciation that is still extant in this period. For example, something like the Romaic Lucian pronunciation would be innovative in the 4th or 3rd century BC, but would be conservative by the 2nd century AD. There are all kinds of examples of things like this. The Scottish pronunciation of English, for example, has things like a trilled R, R. That's an archaic feature. Um, there are archaic features in standard British English and American English, as well as innovative ones. In any case, the idea that using conservative features, especially when they're attested, which they are, well, well, that that's great. That means there actually is a way to use a pronunciation which has been demonstrated to actually exist in these time periods. So the way that the ancient Romans pronounced ancient Greek, that's what I call Romaic uh, Lucian pronunciation. It's pretty well established. It's pretty clear. It happens to match identically what reconstructions of the pronunciation are, say from Theodor Song, among others, <laughs> in Attica for the time of the ancient Romans of that classical period, those three centuries. And it's also virtually the same as the less conservative of the two variants of the conservative subsystem during the classical Attic century. It's close. It's real close. And yeah, there might be some small differences, super noticeable to native speakers at the time, but from our outside perspective, there are rather small differences. The difference between making epsilon e instead of e, omicron u instead of o. Given all the other things, especially phonemic vowel length and pitch accent, which are much, 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 much more important to the morphology. Those are small details. All these things are important, of course, but, you know, there's latitude and we have evidence for different things going on at the same time. Thus, we have, in fact, the possibility of using just one pronunciation. The classical Attic one, hmm, yeah, that doesn't hold as much weight by the uh, classical Roman period for the most part. Some things are very different. Well, a few things are different than like the long diphthongs. Those are definitely gone, I would say. But um, most other aspects are there. So which is less wrong? Is using the Greek pronunciation for first century BC, less wrong? No, it's much more wrong. Too much ioticism. Is using the modern Greek pronunciation for Attic less wrong than using the actual reconstructed Attic pronunciation? No, it's ridiculously wrong. It's completely off. It doesn't even have, it doesn't even correspond to the innovative subdialect. So this is not a preposterous thing. If this is too complicated for you, Kiria Karaguni, because you lack, as it is evident, the linguistic knowledge and the training to produce these different phonological systems, hey, this ain't for everybody. I love it. It's clearly my thing. You're under no obligation to have to use these reconstructed systems. But to say that they are wrong a priori because of all this nonsense, that's a problem. He quotes Alan, the simplest solution seems to be one which is in fact quite widely adopted, namely to anticipate developments by, three or, by two or three centuries. Yeah, I, that, that's... That's a long period of time, too, to say, well, we're just going to jump ahead by a few centuries. The difference, though, is that it's still grammatically uh, the ancient Greek language. This is something that's not, again, easily accepted. The fact by Greeks, the fact that ancient Greek is so different grammatically and also, of course, in vocabulary. Because modern Greeks use a lot of the same words that have been borrowed directly from ancient Greek that did not develop naturally. It's okay. This happens in, say, Italian. It has a lot of words directly from Latin that are not taken through the informal Latin and proto-romance stages. So, totally fine. Nothing wrong about that. Uh, but the grammar is so shockingly different. It, like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't work like the same language. They don't work like dialects of the same language. They work like two languages separated by thousands of years. And that's the idea. That's the point that, um, that they don't... And, that the, and the biggest thing that separates them, the thing that drives so many of the morphological changes, is the dramatic change in pronunciation. If ioticism 
even of the epsilon, had really caught on, the grammar of ancient Greek would have utterly changed. Assuming the most innovative version of the innovative uh, subsystem that Theodor Son talks about, if that had actually become the established one, there would, you know, you, all that, all the things that make ancient Greek as this grammatical unified entity through Koine, none of that would be. It would be, yeah, it would have been way more similar to modern Greek today in many respects. And probably also modern Greek would have been way, way, way different too and be way more innovative and not so conservative either. But obviously some interesting things happened as Theodor Son points out to us. We may therefore ask, why not substitute the entire concoction by what we know to have been the pronunciation two or three centuries later, i.e. practically modern Greek. Well, you assume that, which is wrong. Why not use modern Greek pronunciation for ancient Greek? Well, you can, but why do I think it's not a good solution pedagogically? The reason is because you obscure everything that's going on in the morphology. Like, legoi, legi, legai, in Attic, right? So the, so, uh, legi, he says. Uh, legai, he should say. Legoi, may he say, you know. Um, the indicative, subjunctive, and optative of the present. They'd just be legi, 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 identical. That can't have existed, you know. It's the things that are so blatantly obvious like that, which make me think, like, why are you pr proposing this? And the reason is, oh, it's because it justifies doing the traditional thing. With regard to the notorious musical accent, which this guy doesn't understand, well, Alan uh, also doesn't have a strong sense of it. He understands a lot of the mechanics, but he doesn't, he never studied Japanese. So when Alan talks about these things, he also comes off as a little dull, a little, um, a little not, not too bright. Because he says, the author has listened to a number of recordings, recent and less recent, of attempted tonal, that is musical recitation of ancient Greek. And while some are less objectionable or ridiculous than others, uh, has found none of them convincing. But you should probably have learned how to do this yourself. Learning... Japanese phonology and applying it. But he didn't maybe have access to that. I still find that bizarre. You know, he's an accomplished philologist. Why not get some more experience? After such a confession, which is tantamount to a total failure by Erasmians to tell us how the so-called ancient Greek musical accent sounded. I haven't. I've, of course, demonstrated this and continue to do on a nearly daily basis. One would have expected the author to recommend the so-called Hellenistic stress accent, which still lives in modern Greek. But nothing of the kind, the author goes on. The carefully considered advice is therefore given, albeit reluctantly, not to strive for the tonal rendering, but rather to concentrate one's efforts on fluency and accuracy of other aspects of the language. This is what he said. He said, he, Alan is saying, I guess a little uh, indirectly. Yeah, he recommends stress accent because using pitch accent is too dicey. That's what he said. And he said, but he doesn't do that. No, he did that. Like you quoted him. He can understand English well enough. I think he's being ungenuine, Katagounis. And... The light of the above admissions, the inevitable question arises, just what is the point of persisting in pronunciations in which even their supporters and theorists have lost confidence? Well, we haven't, so you have simply misapprehended what's going on. If it is so clear, then, that the pronunciation in the strict sense, not only of the value of the various letters, but also of the sound quality of Homer and of classical antiquity is, in the absence of magnetic tape recordings... Oh, I'm laughing at you, Karaguni, because this is absurd. This is like assuming that Alexander the Great never accomplished any of his conquests because all we have are written records. We don't have any video footage of it. There's more than a way to record things. For ever lost to us and beyond the possibility of recovery or reconstruction, man. Like dinosaurs, we could never reconstruct what dinosaurs looked like or how they moved. It is not, in that case, historically and scientifically more honest and correct to pronounce the language according to its own natural and historical development, meaning not development, but the, its modern point in time, rather than to impose upon it foreign sounds imported from other sister or rather niece, niece languages, increasing the distance. It's this propagandistic way of speaking within the Indo-European family. If only one pronunciation is to be used in pronouncing all these types of writing, I get it. I understand. And I have expressed my opinion, the uh, weaker version of this uh, proposal, during which period the pronunciation, in fact, evolved absolutely. Then surely the Greek pronunciation, whose roots go back to the 5th and 4th centuries BC, the Greek pronunciation, I mean, the mono-Greek pronunciation, you were saying, goes back to the 5th and 4th centuries BC is the only legitimate candidate. 
not the artificial construct of Erasmus. Pronouncing ancient Greek as modern Greek is the artificial thing, man. You've found pieces of evidence, some of which point to certain conclusions, certain ioticisms, but your conclusion that it's you know, already like modern Greek is wrong as demonstrated in many other videos. The Greek pronunciation of Greek is a sine qua non for textual criticism. Now, this is interesting. Of course, the Greek pronunciation of Greek is such a... It's like the English pronunciation of English, meaning Old English. It's such a shame that we can't call these languages by different names. The manuscript tradition is full of errors that were often the inevitable consequence of the double tradition. The living language and historical orthography, exactly the same type of errors that we find in the Attic inscriptions of classical times. No, not the exact types. No, as demonstrated by me and others. Where's Horix? There he is. <laughs> no, not the same. You know, and, and but I do understand the motive, and I like it that, yeah, if we get, if we really nail the pronunciation of a certain region and time period, we get real close to it. That can tell us a lot, especially in the literature of the poetry, really. We have a sense of what they actually sounded like. And that's really cool. That's archaeology. That's uh, rebuilding, reconstructing a villa, an ancient Roman villa, or a Greek one, too. Reconstructing the Parthenon in Tennessee. That's a really cool thing, too, right? That replica. That's super cool. But you're saying that that replica looks exactly like, I don't know, some random building in Athens. I don't know. End of metaphor. Uh, the Greek pronunciation is the key. The modern Greek pronunciation is the key to many variants and must be made the basis for correct evaluation of their origin as well as their solution to understand the, the New Testament. Now, this is a, a big deal, um, this part of the exegesis, and I agree, Booth, developing his Boothian pronunciation very much um, feels this way as well. I do too. I get it. Um, I just think that some of these conclusions, certainly most of them of Karagounis, are so far off. There is also the pragmatic issue. Pronouncing Greek in the Greek way, let me say that, pronouncing ancient Greek in the modern Greek way will facilitate scholarly contact with Greece. That is, because Greeks are so, he's, he's saying, and I don't necessarily mean this, this is a gross generalization, but he's saying modern Greeks are so pig-headed, so arrogantly incapable of understanding linguistics, of understanding that the language has changed in many respects, and pronunciation being chief among them, that they regard reconstructions done by foreigners as offensive. Now, I get that, because hearing most English speakers, for example, or Italians pronounce ancient Greek is nauseating for me, because I know about these details so much, uh, and they get so many things wrong. Their practice is so far from the theory of even the Erasmian thing, as wrong as that is, that it's irritating as heck. Um, there is, oh, where is it? This lovely um, recitation of the beginning of John, I think. It's on YouTube. So here is uh, this person. What is she called? Maria? Reading, reading the Bible in Greek with Maria, I think it's called. And uh, she's Greek. And so here it is in the modern Greek pronunciation. Look how she calls it the modern Greek pronunciation and not the historical pronunciation or Orwellian things of that like. Matthew 6. Προσέχετε δε την δικαιοσύνη ημών μη ποιήν έμπροσθεν των ανθρώπων προς το θεαθήνε αυτής. Η δε μη γε μισθόν ουκ έχετε παρά το πατρί ημών το εν της ουρανής. Beautiful. The pronunciation of modern Greek is absolutely gorgeous and I think it sounds really cool in ancient Greek as well. Now here is the same Greek lady doing this passage of Matthew 6 in theoretical Erasmian pronunciation. Προσέχετε δε τεν δικαιοσύνεν χουμών με ποιείν έμπροσθεν των ανθρώπων προς το θεαθένάι αυτοίς. Είδε με και μισθόν ουκ έχετε παρά το πατρί χουμών το εν τοις ουρανόις. Sounds great. Sounds great. She can't do the ου. She does ου instead. That's the best she can do. Heck, I'll, I'll take it. If Erasmian users, true, like maybe an Erasmian, not reconstructed pronunciation, even maybe, if they were doing something that sounded like this, which is so much closer to the theoretical pronunciation, that would truly sound great. And in fact, we have the great Ioannis Stardakis on his Podium Arts channel, which does stuff like this all the time in reconstructed classical attic. So that is what we should go to. So I empathize with uh, the problem of non Greek people 
doing all kinds of ridiculous things that are often nauseating. And uh, she doesn't do, of course, the phonemic uh, vowel but at least, you know, it still sounds so much better. And we can learn a lot from that. And I agree. If we try to make our ancient Greek sound like modern Greek and certain super segmental things that are not delineated a different way by actual ancient Greek phonology, I think that's cool. I've tried to do that. In fact, that's why I knew about her, because I listened to her to try to imitate um, her intonational patterns a little bit and some uh, oral posture things, as well as other Greeks, uh, some fellows reciting um, the New Testament, for example, when I did my Gospel of John. Now, I, I don't necessarily have the combination of perfect um, theory combined with sounding just like uh, a Greek doing the perfect theory that I was establishing with Lucian pronunciation. Uh, I would never make that claim. But I was aiming towards that, and I liked the result. It's better than not doing it. To illustrate what I mean, I want to show you two examples of native Romance language speakers who use the classical pronunciation, and they follow the theory extremely closely. And the first is Rodrigo Portela, and he is a native Spanish speaker, and this is what he sounds like. Saluete, intercapetines latina sauditis, acroamata previa, quipos licea tinotio latinitat en colere. Rodericus valisoletano sum, et hodie in intercapedine rerum benemane domia kendarum, hoc acroama septimum facio, ut previter scolas referam quas docere soleo. Quae quiden non sunt quod monus vocetur, monus enim minum cest, I was to be an incredibly fluent speaker of Latin and does the classical pronunciation of Latin according to the theory perfectly. This essence of romance flair, as I'm calling it, is the reason why I asked Irene La Preziosa to join me on the new recordings of Familia Romana. Always in campo herbaetunt, et aquam bibunt erivo, qui inter campo et silva est. Canis herbam non est, neque pastor herba est. Being a native speaker of Italian, just like Rodrigo, who is a native Spanish speaker, she brings a Romance flair into her classical Latin pronunciation. And what do I mean by this flair? I mean oral posture, intonation, phrasing, many characteristics that are not in the theory and probably will remain unknowable. While this is one of the least important characteristics of reconstructing an ancient language, it is aesthetically one of the most obvious. While it isn't necessary that classical Latin 2,000 years ago must have had the exact intonational pattern of modern Spanish or modern Italian, it is much more likely that an intonational pattern similar to either language was extant back then than the intonational pattern of a native modern English speaker or German or Finnish etc. And thus, this is something I recommend. Imitating these characteristics in native speakers of, say, Italian or Spanish or other Romance languages. Probably not French, though, just because the intonational pattern is so radically different from the other Romance languages. And this is why Ioannis Stratakis sounds so cool, using his reconstructed Attic pronunciation. <laughs> Ioannis Tartakis is Greek. He does certain things as a native Greek speaker in intonation and also oral posture. And characteristics like the retracted S he does flawlessly because it's part of his native language. And some of those characteristics probably were and of a right ought to be in the pronunciation of ancient Greek. And that's what makes these examples, unfortunately few, some of the best there are for the imitation of these two ancient languages. However, the notion here is that pronouncing Greek in the Greek way will facilitate scholarly contact with Greece because Greeks are so offended by the reconstructions. You just have to be armed, I would say. Or you could placate them by using the modern Greek pronunciation. Sure. I think it's good to learn more than one pronunciation. I think it's very useful to be able to recite ancient Greek and the modern pronunciation, just as it's useful to recite Latin and ecclesiastical pronunciation to help connect with Italians. There's, there's value in this. This isn't wrong. I do this all the time with Italians, using ecclesiastical if they're, they're not really familiar with the restored classical pronunciation. I can communicate in it adequately. But Greeks insisting that Karagounis' ideas are right 
and therefore the foreigners are wrong. That's the problem. And unfortunately, Karagounis, since 1995, when he wrote this, has only increased the problem. Um, and that's that's a shame. He hasn't, as opposed to people like Ioannis Stratakis, who have wonderfully helped Greeks to understand, oh, the ancient language sounded really cool and really different. Moreover, it will open an avenue with the starting point of a little knowledge of New Testament Greek, or even Classical Greek, to enter the wealth of Byzantine and modern Greek, which are the descent, direct descendants of the Hellenistic New Testament Greek. Pronounce, pronunciation doesn't matter, man. <laughs> you can pronounce these any way you want, and you still enter into the literature with all of its wealth. In this way, New Testament Greek will cease to be treated as an island with its attendant misconstructions. What a nonsensical phrase. It will be seen as part of a greater living unity, the Greek language, the Greek thought, the Greek literature as a whole. As much as Italian and Latin are a part of a whole, as much as Old English and Modern English are part of a whole, this will not fail to enrich the scientific study of the New Testament, which for too long has been deprived of inestimable insights by its persistent adhesion to the era of Erasmus. What nonsense, man. I would like to see evidence of this. This is a question. What are those insights? Not noted here. What are we lacking? Do we need to imagine the voice of apostles, Greek-speaking apostles, as they pronounce things in order to receive their word? It's an interesting idea. I'm not against it. But given that you're recommending the wrong pronunciation for them, if that is so important, then that would obscure that possibility. Uh, there's a sumario in Spanish because this was published, uh, where is it? It's in the uh, Filologia Neotestamentaria. Yeah, that's that's a shame, you know. It's great that something like this is published so that we can dissect it, but it's so embarrassing. This is so, so many things are incorrect. I made a few highlights in some of these notes. We can no longer trace the pinpoint the stages of this process of ioticism to a particular date in history. That's wrong. We can pinpoint it in several different places pretty well. I've, I don't know, I've been doing that for years and so have others. So he's, he can't, therefore he thinks it's impossible. The mute evidence of the inscriptions and papyri can only tell us that these letters are confused, not whether in particular they, uh, case they were sounded completely identically or only similarly with Iota. Oh, he makes that admission, which is great that they might be similar or different. Sturdivant, for example, hypothesis on evidence he draws from other Indo-European languages and largely disregards the evidence of the inscriptions and makes a number of unproved assumptions. Oh, look. Oh, look, I've put some tabs in here. Shall we go to... Uh, Kai Thirafai? Yes, we, we shall. Does he have anything interesting to say about the letter Phi? Well, he does. On page 181, he talks about the inscriptions in Pompeii, Latin ones like Fileto, for um, the uh, imperative of the third person singular, uh, of um, Philo, Phileo, and Physica, spelled with an F, so Fileto spelled with an F, Rufus spelled with a PH, Daphne spelled with an F, uh, he talks a lot about inscriptions. Larger disregards the evidence of inscriptions. No, he uses it to prove the point of when the sound change was definitively occurring and makes a number of unproved assumptions. Nope. So we have words like shumptiro or erkten, right? He says these are impossible, physiologically impossible in normal, especially fast speech, not only for Greek, but for any language. No. Welcome to Armenian. He talks about the an anecdote that some people can't pronounce uh, letters, like they can't pronounce the ch if they're English speakers, and they would use a sh sound. So shadis for charis or karis. Yeah, that's pretty obscene. Uh, I agree, that's ridiculous. The complaint that modern Greek has too many e sounds is totally unfounded. I mean, it's a complaint equal to your complaints, Karagounis, saying that these other things can't be pronounced like ewa oyoi. Such a complaint is equal to basically all of your complaints. It's just that you don't realize how much subjective bias is polluting your logic. And that, my friends, is the error of Karagounis, <laughs> uh, according to, well, me, to Will Annis, and, of course, according to Karagounis himself in his essay, The Error of Erasmus. I hope this was useful. If there's anyone out there who has actually watched all this, which is great, uh, definitely let me know if you watched all of it, because uh, I'd be excited to know that since... I put a lot of time into just 
recording this and talking about it. It's not easy to talk this long, you can imagine. But I also want to know, has this changed your mind about certain things? If you've seen a lot of my other videos, then that's what I'm drawing from, especially because I reference a lot of the other things in there. I haven't brought up the references to show why Karagunis is wrong here, because I've already done that uh, on pretty much every single one of these counts. Or you could simply read the books that I've got behind me here. Has this changed your mind? Do you need more information to change your mind? Are you open to considering that the modern Greek pronunciation is not how ancient Greek was pronounced? I'm interested uh, to know that. And those of you out there who already knew some of these things intuitively, who already knew that a notion like the modern Greek pronunciation represents ancient Greek pronunciation, if you already knew that was wrong, has this video helped to arm you against future potential arguments, say with Greeks, um, who insist upon the incorrect notion? I'd be interested to know that too. And if I got anything wrong, and you have facts to back it up, <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm thinking of that um, the typical Greek commenter uh, in on the videos will just you know won't watch the whole video and they'll just say you know you're wrong about this that or the other thing. That's why I'm saying like bring your facts and evidence and have a coherent argument. It'd be it'd be, it'd be interesting, especially if there's something some detail I've missed. I've learned a lot from very smart people in the comments over the years who, including my uh, friend uh, Rafael Turigiano, whom that's how uh, he and I first made contact because he was correcting me on something and he did the right thing by doing so. Um, and not only he, but plenty of other uh, people. Uh, so uh, I'm really grateful for that. So that's how we move towards an archaeological goal of knowledge. An historical one is to learn. So obviously I have my opinions based on the facts that I know. There are other facts to consider. There are other opinions to hear. Thank you for listening. Caritas humi inejo. Hygienite.